There's oversight hearing of the committee. Hmm. Today marks the committee's final budget oversight hearing for fiscal year 2022 budget season. As I've said uh, in our previous hearings, this is the second time the council uh, is considering a budget under pandemic circumstances. Thankfully, uh, while the effects of COVID-19 continue to be felt throughout the district, we are in a much better place this year as we consider uh, the fiscal year 2022 budget, uh, particularly than we found ourselves in the beginning uh, of last year as we considered uh, the FY21 budget. An unprecedented level of federal dollars along with improved local revenue projections uh, will help us navigate our way through recovery toward a better, more equitable DC. But only if we are intentional about making transformational investments in communities that were underserved prior to the pandemic. The budget that we approve has to recognize that low wage workers and people living in communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Systemic racism and economic insecurity, which predate this pandemic, put black and brown residents, especially those individuals and families with less resources, at greater risk of exposure to both the health, mental health, and economic consequences of COVID-19. As a result, they've faced higher rates of infection, hospitalization, and death, as well as higher rates of unemployment and lack of access to necessities like food, shelter, and healthcare. The fiscal year 2022 budget is $17.5 billion, which is a 3.9 increase over the current budget. The local portion of the budget is $9.1 billion, an increase of 4.9% over the current levels, with most of that growth coming from federal funds that have to be spent over the next four years. Uh, as I have been doing, I'll continue to use these budget oversight hearings with agency leadership to tease out the details of where and how these recovery funds will be dispersed to ensure that we make smart, targeted investments uh, that, you know, as we recover from this devastating pandemic, we make sure that we're doing everything humanly possible to chip away at the district's stark racial wealth gap, make our residents healthier, our community stronger, and ensure that the future economic growth of our city is more inclusive. For today's budget oversight hearing, we will hear testimony from government witnesses representing Events DC, the Destination DC, as well as the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Uh, as a reminder, this hearing uh, is reserved for government witnesses only, and they're gonna have seven minutes for opening statements. Council members are gonna have three minutes for opening statements, and we're gonna do seven minute rounds of questions of our government, of our witnesses. Uh, just ask all participants to, to mute their microphones when they aren't speaking. And at this time, I'm going to acknowledge that we have been joined by War II Council Member and member of this committee, Brooke Pinto. And I'm going to turn to you, Council Member Pinto, to see if you have an opening statement. Hey, thank you so much, Chairman McDuffie, um, and for hosting this budget oversight hearing today on Events DC, Destination DC, and DEMPAD. And thank you very much to Greg O'Dell, Elliot Ferguson, and Deputy Mayor John Falchicchio for joining us today and for all of your extremely hard work over the last 18 months to help our businesses stay afloat during this extraordinarily challenging period and help invite people and businesses back to our city. I am grateful for the many investments Mayor Bowser has proposed in her FY 2020 budget proposal, including bid grants to support the establishment of an innovation district in the Golden Triangle bid, funding to promote tourism in DC and grants for arts venues. But I am still concerned for our existing local businesses and filling the gaps in funding that they now have to ensure that they can stay in operation. DC has lost over 300 brick and mortar businesses during the pandemic and the majority of those businesses were here in Ward 2. A top priority in this budget is to ensure that we do not lose another small business in our city because of the effects of the pandemic. I'm looking forward to discussing today how we can work together to create an off-ramp for small businesses when the eviction moratorium is lifted, particularly in assisting in the back payment of their rent that will become owed. Our hospitality industry is still suffering. Our hotels, nightlife, and restaurants are starting to recover, but many of them will not be able to overcome the significant debts they've incurred throughout the pandemic. 
I also want to discuss today how we can best serve our minority and women-owned businesses and make more significant investments in the Great Streets program, which helps our small businesses compete against big box stores that change the culture of our neighborhoods. I'm also concerned that we are not providing enough support to our excluded workers in the district. They have fought to support their families over the last 18 months without unemployment insurance or federal relief programs. Some of our excluded workers have only received $1,000 for the entire year in relief. And that is of course not sufficient. As we focus on creating an equitable budget that reflects the values of our city, relief and more relief for our excluded workers must be at the top of that list. And I thank Events DC for their efforts in dispersing those funds throughout the year. So thank you again, Chairman McDuffie and our government witnesses today. Thank you very much, Council Member Pinto. Uh, we're gonna begin with the Events DC, uh, which is the official convention and sports authority for Washington DC in addition to managing and operating the Walter E. Washington Convention Center and the historic Carnegie Library at Mount Vernon Square. Events DC creates and promotes the district's premier cultural events and activities with the goal of driving revenue and generating economic and community benefits for the district. Events DC also fuels the district's hospitality and tourism industry by attracting thousands of attendees to the city by virtue of events like the district's Cherry Blossom Festival. Um, and those were in the pre-pandemic days. I'm sure uh, we're gonna hear uh, delve into to how things are going today uh, and, in, and how things are looking for the future. I'm gonna turn now to uh, Greg O'Dell for your statement and good morning again to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Chairman McDuffie. Uh, good morning, Council Member Pinto and staff of the Committee on the Business on Economic Development. I'm Greg O'Dell, President and Chief Executive Officer of Washington Convention and Sports Authority, also known as Events DC. Joining me today here virtually are Henley Mosley, our CFO, and Nicole Jackson, our General Counsel. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on behalf of our board and staff about the authority's fiscal year 2022 budget. My testimony today will provide a snapshot of some of our activities and accomplishments over the past year and a preview of our plans for FY22. As a quick overview, the authority is an independent authority organized into three core lines of business, the Conventions and Meetings Division, Sports Entertainment Division, and our Creative Services Division. The authority owns and operates us and serves as a landlord for some of the largest convention and sports entertainment venues in the city. Regarding fiscal year 21, consistent across the globe, the hospitality industry has arguably been impacted by the pandemic the most. Continued adherence to public health guidelines, limited mass gatherings, significant limited travel, and therefore drastically reducing hotel stays and restaurant patronage in FY21. As a result, and as anticipated, the authority saw a significant reduction in both operational and non-operational revenues. However, during fiscal year 21, we continued to develop and create alternatives to traditional events, executing on digital or hybrid event programming, as well as hosting social distance events at our indoor and outdoor venues. Additionally, the authority continued its sales and booking efforts. We proactively rescheduled previously canceled events and continue to secure future and convention meetings as we plan to return to business. Further, staff continue to pursue major citywide, uh, citywide events as well, like the FY, excuse me, the FIFA World Cup 2026, conducting various meetings with FIFA leadership and our business and community stakeholders during FY21. We anticipate a decision by FIFA on the selection of the host cities this fall and are excited about the potential economic impact for this event for our city. This event is projected to have a $400 million net economic benefit and create 3,500 jobs for the district. From an expense perspective in FY21, we continue to manage our resources appropriately, proactively reducing expenses and judiciously leveraging our reserves to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. Given our reserves coupled with strong financial stewardship, the authority is resilient. We are positioned to ramp up operations and we've properly maintained our facilities to resume event activities safely as we begin welcoming our full staff and visitors back to our venues. From a public health response to COVID perspective, with respect to the district's response to COVID-19, the authority continue to play a critical role with our ability to provide aid and support. Building upon the COVID-19 relief programs we implemented in FY20, 
In FY21, we provided much needed financial assistance to DC hotels and excluded workers, as well as aiding in the city's efforts to support the go-go music industry. In November 2020, Mayor Bowser launched the Bridge Fund, a $100 million investment in businesses and workers grappling with the COVID-19 public health emergency in the hospitality, entertainment, and retail sectors. In light of the success of the Authority's previous hotel relief program, the Executive Office of the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development partnered with the Authority to administer the hotel relief portion of the Bridge Fund, consisting of $20 million in federal CARES Act funding. The funds were designed to supplement the payroll for hotel employees and certain operating expenses. Between November and December of 2020, we successfully dispersed over $19.9 million in relief funds to 93 eligible hotels. In addition to the hotel sector, other sectors of our community continue to be greatly impacted by the pandemic, inclusive of undocumented residents, returning citizens, and other cash economy workers in the district, many of whom work in service industries and include construction, restaurants, transportation, and hospitality. Considering the success of the DC CARES program and because of the ongoing financial need of constituents in our community, the authority again partnered with the district government to administer the next phase of the DC CARES program, leveraging the $8.1 million investment that the city made. The authority has engaged, in the, engaged the Greater Washington Community Foundation, DC Jobs for Justice, and a series of other local based organizations to help administer the program. To date, approximately 70% of the funds have been distributed and we are on track to close out the program by the end of the year. COVID-19 has also dealt a major blow to the regional entertainment industry, including the district's official music, GoGo. Led by your office, Chairman McDuffie, the council and the mayor are investing in the GoGo industry as a whole to support the broader ecosystem of artists, performers, media and production related businesses that support GoGo. In FY21, NCC established a GoGo Industry Relief Fund designed to support GoGo related programming, branding, tourism, and marketing. The program, which rolled out during the spring, is comprised of three components one, direct grant payments to GoGo artists and bands, two, grants to production studios for recording in studio performances by GoGo artists, and three, grants for producing concerts and festivals showcase showcasing local GoGo bands. NCC has partnered with the Washington Area Community Investment Fund to assist with the implementation of the program. To date, we've approved nearly 50 applications and begun processing grant, grant payments and recording studio performances. Additionally, on June 20th, this past Sunday, Unity Fest powered by Mochella was held at Gateway, one of the three showcase music events sponsored by the Authority through the Relief Fund. Finally, last week, we launched the FY22 application process for our community grant program. The Advanced CC Community Grant Program provides financial support to qualifying nonprofit organizations dedicated to supporting youth, sports, culture, or performing arts in the district. The authority distributed $500,000 in FY21 and will distribute another $500,000 in FY22 for this annual program. We believe this program is absolutely critical as we are able to provide vital support to nonprofit organizations across all eight wards for the district, particularly at a time when the need needed resources and guidance to help fulfill their mission and sustain their financial health during this pandemic. For FY 2022, on January 14, 2021, the board's, uh, the authority's board of directors approved a five-year financial plan for the period FY 21 through FY 25. The approved FY 22 budget was reflected in that five-year financial plan and was subsequently approved by the board on March 11, 2021. The board, directed, the board of directors approved the total budget of 156.7 million including 30 million from reserves for fiscal year 2022. The approved FY22 budget was included in the mayor's FY22 budget submission to the council. The capital and operational needs of the authority for FY22 are wholly supported by our approved budget. At this time, I'd like to provide some of the highlights of that budget. For operating expenses, the operating revenue, excuse me, for operating revenue, the totals 19.4 million, an increase of 12.8 million from the FY21 budget as a full slate of events is projected for FY22. By contrast, in FY21, 19 citywides, as well as a major, excuse me, a majority of the sports entertainment events were canceled as a result of COVID-19. For FY22, we have 18 citywides who were originally planned to date, and only two have canceled. While we anticipate robust programming for FY22, the projected revenues will reflect 75% of normal projections based on reduced attendance, given the fact that the, there will be a lack of international travel anticipated during the year. Regarding our operating expenses, 
for FY22 budget, the, the operating expenses total 71.9 million, which is an increase of 9.9 .9 million to account for cost increases associated with the ramp up of operations to support event programming. A large portion of the cost increase are attributed to security, cleaning, utilities, facility maintenance, and facility maintenance. It, additionally, as part of the cost saving measures during the pandemic, the authority froze several positions. In FY22, we planned 50% of those positions that were previously frozen will actually be hired during the year. For non-operating revenues, as it relates to tourism and travel, we are forecasting FY22 to be a transition year, assuming most domestic travel and very limited international travel. Non-operating revenue, which consists mostly of dedicated taxes, uh, totals $106 million for FY22, which is an increase of $38 million over the FY2021 uh, totals. I'll quickly just jump to summarize a couple other buckets for you, Mr. Chair, as I realize the time is running out. Uh, our non-operating expenses uh, also is $52.9 million, which is an increase of $4.2 million. Our capital expenditures is $28.8 million, which is an increase of $12.4 million still conservative and less than our previous uh, totals during uh, prior to COVID. And then lastly, also, uh, we'll be opening some of our stores uh, in retail for as part of that capital program as we reopen uh, naming a few as Ben's Chili Bowl and also shops made in DC. And we're excited about that. And certainly hope uh, that you and the council members will join us and the mayor at that time. So I'll conclude there, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I know some of the testimony I reflected was written and certainly can answer questions to that end. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Adele. We're, we're gonna dive into some of the other areas perhaps that you didn't touch on orally, but yeah. as you noted, are, are including your written testimony, which are, are gonna be a part of the record. Right. I wanna start off with a, a question on uh, racial equity as I've done for every agency that's come before the committee, uh, both during performance and, and budget this year. Uh, in your proposed FY22 budget, um, are there programs or allocations that are specifically designed to address uh, racial or economic inequities faced by district residents? And if so, in detail, uh, describe how these efforts address those inequities. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I think we spent a lot of time, uh, particularly on our, our uh, HR and recruiting efforts to make sure that we're addressing uh, all portions of the city, all wards uh, when we can. You know, one of the great examples that I like to, to note is that, you know, when we built the Entertainment Sports Arena, over 50% of our staff came from, from east of the river, from Ward 7 and Ward 8. So we make sure when we're doing recruiting that we have uh, many of our outreach and, and recruiting efforts. We actually have those uh, in specifically uh, across the city in different wards. And so we make sure we do that east of the river. The other thing is uh, through our uh, internship program, which has been a great talent acquisition strategy for us, uh, we make sure that we actually are, are targeting and focusing on people of color as well. Uh, I think it's really bode well for us. You know, I will say that um, just as an example, uh, our current workforce, uh, we're 74% African-American. Uh, we also are focused on our succession planning as well and our upper management ranks also reflect, reflect very high percentages in, in that regard. And so we're continuing to do that, but we think it permeates and really is part of all of our HR recruiting strategies as well. Uh, similarly, I think, as you know, from a CBE perspective, uh, we also make sure that we are meeting our goals, uh, which we've done every year, and we will uh, certainly consider to do that again this year um, once we report our final numbers. And so we think it's always been part of our DNA. We appreciate your leadership on this for the city. We're happy to continue and even build on the success we've had and build more programs uh, into uh, the events DC strategy on this. Thank you for that. Um, just uh, also sort of externally and, and, and as you all uh, interact with, with uh, various residents around the city, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, if you've given thought to how better you might uh, engage various constituencies to make sure that uh, their input uh, to the extent it is, it is something that, that um, could be incorporated into some of the things that you all are doing, that, that, that you're reflecting uh, some of the input of the diverse uh, residents that make up the District of Columbia. That's a great, great point. So I, I think one of the things that we do, and we, we've tried to resume this practice even during COVID, is that we have um, you know, community uh, outreach uh, meetings, um, particularly in the areas where we serve. And so around 
the St. Elizabeth's campus around the RFK campus and as well as the convention center campus, we have community meetings. And so we try to engage those residents and those businesses, not only to share what we're doing, but also get feedback and how we can be helpful. I think one of the best programs that we've done to implement this is also the grants management program or the grants program we have, our community grants program. We've increased this over the history of, of events DC and even the, the legacy agency of Sports Entertainment Commission. We went from 100,000 to 250,000 to now 500,000. And so that's specifically targeted for these nonprofit uh, organizations that are in the community. And the thing that we've, we've also done is we've actually had these outreach um, efforts where we actually not only talk about the program, but we also assist people in their application process. We realize that these are non nonprofits that don't have a lot of resources. They're trying to fulfill their mission. So the last thing we want is for them to be disqualified because they didn't have time or the resources to actually do the application process. And so we conduct a lot of the outreach programs. So we walk through what the application looks like. And then we make sure that uh, even when they're awarded, we stay close to them. Uh, we provide uh, updates and check-ins with them so that we're helping them build capacity as well. And then we also have a celebration luncheon, which we will resume this year, this summer. And so those are just some of the many things, but we try to, to really um, spend a lot of time in the community, not just about our program, but understanding what's happening in the community and how we can be helpful and be, mm -hmm. be better neighbors. All right. Um, during February's performance oversight hearing, we, we spoke uh, at length about the, the impact of COVID-19, uh, it, how it impacted uh, the district's hospitality, tourism industry, you talked about it uh, in, your, in your opening uh, testimony, uh, restaurants included. Uh, for instance, uh, Events DC was forced to freeze vacant positions. And you talked a little bit about those, some of those frozen positions in your testimony as well. You all had to dip into reserves and, and reprioritize spending to provide much needed assistance while sacrificing revenue. Um, talk a little bit, two things. First of all, talk about how things are going at the uh, at events DC in terms of your workforce morale. Um, uh, hopefully, things are are, are doing uh, are a bit different in a positive sense this year than where you were last year. Uh, but then also talk about um, uh, just overall as we we have gotten through June 11th and, and the city's opening back up. Um, what kinds of things you're hearing, generally speaking? Uh, from those industries, uh, restaurants, uh, hotels, uh, and the like. I appreciate uh, and thank you for asking about our, our staff and our team. Uh, it means a lot to them. I, I want to say, and I should give a, a lot of credit and support to our board, uh, led by our chair, Max Brown. They, they really have been uh, very uh, intentional about um, supporting the needs of our staff. And so that's also reflected in our management team. And so I, I feel that our staff couldn't be in a better place. They've appreciated kind of the active engagement we've had, uh, even virtually. But, you know, the, the good news is, I will say, and we've been proud of it, is that we've been part of the public health response. And so a lot of our staff have been engaged in a lot of event programming. So whether it was standing up at a hospital, having the vaccination sites, but also doing a lot of event programming, even virtually, they've been engaged. And so we had, we just uh, last week had uh, what we call our staff of Palooza or one of our virtual town hall meetings. And so we talked about how now that we have robust events coming, that we also are going to have all of our staff uh, in a phased approach coming back to the building. Mm -hmm. So I think they're very excited. We feel like there's a lot of pent up demand, uh, obviously, from just from people wanting to come back to events. Uh, I can't thank the mayor enough uh, or too many times about, uh, you know, just the approach of being conservative. But now, you know, we feel like it's the right approach. And so we feel positioned and poised very well. Uh, we're actually going to have events starting uh, in August. We'll have uh, we'll have one more virtual event in June, but we're going to have a major event, Otakon, which is a Japanese anime event. We're going to have AwesomeCon both in August. So even as early as this summer, we're going to have two major events with thousands of people coming. And then also we'll start our robust event programming uh, that will happen uh, in the fall. So that was the first question, uh, Mr. Chair. The second question so we, we certainly all feel like this recovery is going to be a, a long haul. Um, you know, it's, it's encouraging that we're going to see event programming, but we know that part of that's also just going to be around domestic travel to support those events. And so we don't think we're going to see international travel for at least another year. You know, some argue, you know, maybe fiscal 23 or maybe fiscal 24 before we return to normal. 
So we see, you know, all of us see downtown as, as council member Pinto referenced, we see that stores still are opening, restaurants still are opening right now. And so we've got to get foot traffic back downtown to really help support these businesses um, so that they can come back to life. Our hotels are also suffering obviously tremendously from an occupancy perspective. So we know event programming will do part of that. But the other, other thing we're doing is that we're partnering obviously with our good friends at, at Destination DC to help with the marketing campaign and thanks again to the mayor and the deputy mayor uh, we will actually um, unveil that campaign tomorrow that really will focus on driving people back to Washington. We know it's probably going to focus on, again, the leisure and domestic uh, traveler first and particularly in a drive radius. But we've got to get people back into the city uh, to help these uh, support these businesses. All right. I, I um, uh, obviously just just are scratching the surface with that first question. Uh, obviously, when we get into the details of that, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll also I'm sure, uh, speak with Mr. Ferguson and Deputy Mayor Franciccio uh, uh, further about the, the marketing uh, aspects uh, that you referenced and uh, you're gonna be doing in partnership with Destination DC, but also uh, DEMPED's role in making sure that, that those things are funded uh, and, and you all have the resources you need. Uh, I know that the Deputy Mayor has a, a seat on you all's board, so. Uh, my time has expired. I'm going to turn to Councilman Pinto, who I'm sure will have some questions around, around uh, this important issue as well. Councilman Pinto. Thank you very much, Chairman McDuffie. Um, nice to see you, Mr. O'Dell. Good morning. Thank you for your testimony. You. Um, so can you start with a update on where we are with the vaccinations going on at the convention center and what you've noticed lately around foot traffic as well as um, how you're continuing your efforts throughout the summer. Great, thank you for the question. And I'll note, thank you for coming by and actually touring uh, the site. We appreciate it. I know you're, that's something you're very interested in. So we, you know, we have two vaccination sites, the convention center and also the St. Elizabeth's campus. We've moved the St. Elizabeth's campus from the entertainment sports arena to um, the uh, Arise demonstration center. So we'll be actually wrapping up our vaccination sites um, at the end of this month for both locations. Um, obviously, the city, I think, uh, feels like there's ample capacity in the other venues to do that. It also allows us to ramp up for our event activity. But I'm proud of the fact that, you know, between the two venues, we'll have vaccinated or at least administered vaccinations for about 110,000 at the, those locations, which is, you know, arguably one sixth of the population of, of the city. Unbelievable. Well, thank you for your partnership with the city in that effort. And what, when is that date you'll be wrapping up? Those two uh, June, I'm sorry, June 30th. 30th. Okay, thank you. And, and as it relates to the foot traffic, part of your question, we have seen a diminished or reduced number of foot traffic from what we saw initially. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to give you a moment to talk about some of the protocols in place now at the convention center that are going to be remaining intact as additional events um, come about that will keep residents and visitors safe. Thank you for that. You know, we've uh, we spent a lot of time and early on in this process really looking at technology and tools and protocol. And so one of the things that we'll, we'll have is everyone who comes to our venue will go through a series of protocols, first of which we'll have a temperature scan we also have technology that even manages or monitors the density of our population inside of our venue so that if we need to make sure people are socially distanced, uh, we'll do so. Uh, we've also, I should have mentioned, we've been certified uh, GVAC, which is the Global Bio Risk uh, At-Risk Certification. We were probably the first convention center in the Northeast to do so. We have all of our other venues have also gotten that certification. It's an extensive uh, number of protocols, safety protocols that we have to make sure we adhere to to get that certification. Uh, also our food and beverage um, preparation and how we actually deliver that food and beverage will also follow safety protocols as well. Uh, and then even our air filtration, uh, all the other measures to make sure we're, we're following every aspect of safety and health uh, to make sure right now, even our employees will all still be masked even though we'll have some flexibility to allow our guests, uh, if they're vaccinated, uh, not to be masked. But we're going to do this for the foreseeable future. We think it's the right prudent thing to do. And we're just excited to have people back. But we want everyone to feel safe and comfortable, including our employees, as well as our guests. Well, thank you very much for that. I encourage everybody to, to go back. The technology is uh, pretty state of the art. Thank you. 
So I see that the mayor has allocated $5 million to Events DC and Destination DC to support attraction and promote DC as a destination to live, work, and play. Do you know what proportion of that $5 million will be going to Events DC? So we, we haven't uh, sat down with the details, but our expectation is that similar to the $3 million investment that we're making now, that it will all go to support marketing. So we, we have collaborated with Destination DC now. We anticipate that it would be the same. So it wouldn't necessarily go to us. It'd all be, be going to, towards marketing, but we'd help partner and collaborate with that. Okay. And then I guess in that case, how do you anticipate to make up the funding gap to address the loss in revenue from the hospitality tax um, and other losses in, in revenue about the hospitality industry if that funding isn't going directly to you all? Good question. Uh, so the, the, what we've done, um, and I made reference earlier, we, we developed a five-year financial plan. And in that financial plan, uh, we were able to forecast what we thought the, the deficit or the revenue loss would be. And so as a result of that, we were able to, to judiciously you know, use our uh, reserves to provide that offset each year. And so we provided, even through 2025, we have a forecast. We anticipate that uh, even next year, we'll still have some deficit or loss from operations. But then we think in 2024 and beyond, we'll go back to actually projecting um, actually a surplus from our operations. Okay. So do you then feel that Event CC has the resources you need uh, from this budget and through your own reserves to support a full return of sports and entertainment events in DC this year? We do, uh, council member. We think um, for us specifically, we think we, we have really planned uh, how we will leverage our reserves in a very responsible way. I think there's some related investment from the city that would be great to support just the hospitality industry that obviously we're a part of. Some of that's around uh, the marketing dollars that obviously is, is in the budget as you reference. The other thing I would say, and, and I've talked to the deputy mayor about this, is that we will provide the funding and the programming for the large scale events. And so FIFA is a great example. The one thing that I think would be great as we all attract events, not just event CC to the city, is having some dollars available to support um, the city services. And so as an example, when we hosted Major League, all -Star, um, Major League Baseball All-Star Game, you know, the city spent a million dollars on all the city services to supply it. It was well worth it. We actually had, I think, $60 million in, in direct spend for the city, huge economic impact. But it's those types of events that we really need to create some funding um, around those. And again, not limited to NCC, all the different programming I think that the city does. If we have a bucket like that, it really help in our event attraction to really drive more hospitality for the city. Okay, thank you very much. I won't try to sneak in another question in the last 20 seconds, but I will see you next round. All right, thank you, Mr. Odell. Thank you, thank you, Chairman McDuffie. Thank you, Councilmember Pinto. Uh, under table ES03, and this is uh, page H. Councilmember McDuffie, I don't know if you saw me. I'm not on your committee, but hello. Oh, I didn't see you. And, and I don't have my screen. I see a little blue arrow. I guess I need to press that. I did not see you. Thank you for alerting me uh, that you're there, Councilmember Henderson. Uh, let me turn to Councilmember Henderson sure. and note for the record that we have been joined uh, by at large Councilmember Christina Henderson. I'm going to turn you now for a round. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Duffy. Sorry about that. I'm not on this committee for those who are watching, but I, I do have some questions. Um, good evening, uh, or good evening. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, uh, Director Odell and to your staff. Um, I actually just have like a real uh, quick line of questioning um, specifically for you around the excluded worker payments um, and, you know, how that had, how where we are with those funds um, that have been expensed or excuse me, dispensed by events DC thus far. Um, and then also sort of going forward in terms of the mayor's budget proposal. And, um, you know, let me know if you aren't the right person to ask the second part of my question or if I should ask that to the deputy mayor. Okay. Um, so my understanding is that um, events DC had about 14 million um, in this fiscal year to provide payments to excluded workers. 
um, approximately how much of that money have you um, already given out? Uh, yes, thank, and good morning. Thank you, council member. So the, the, uh, the really two phases of the DC CARES program. Um, the first was $5 million that we um, fully expended uh, with the great work of the partners um, early on, uh, which I actually think was technically FY20. For FY21, the number was $9 million. Um, so the 14 million is a combination of those two fiscal years. On the $9 million, 10% uh, of that were went to administrative fee for all those partners that are doing great work and it is money well spent. They are working very hard. And so that leaves $8.1 million um, specifically for the, for the grants. Um, right now, to date, about 70% of those grants have been, uh, those dollars have been allocated. So about $5.7 million has been allocated. And the group anticipates that um, by year's end, uh, those dollars will be fully expended. Okay. And how many people did that reach? So it, it's a $1,000 grant. So it's roughly, it'll be 8,100 uh, families um, that will get the $1,000. And so right now, 5,700 families have gotten the $1,000. And the other thing I, I would note also is that the, the program and the, the team, the, the organizations, the community organizations that really helped us really spent a lot of time building the infrastructure to expand this program. And so part of the challenge is that they got a lot of duplications. And so this round, they were giving new grants to people who hadn't received grants before. And so they had to go through a lot of the duplicates to do that. And so these are, these are all 5,700 new uh, grantees from the previous phase. Okay. And just for clarification in terms of how individuals in the DC CARES program were identified, can you just state that for the record? Yeah, there's a pretty extensive outreach program from the local based community. So, so they are in the community. They spent a lot of time. And the thing that we did this go around as uh, thanks to you all, is they expanded really to returning citizens, but also to the kind of cash economy um, constituents as well. And so we had outreach from various community partners in the community in those different uh, constituencies, if you will, doing the outreach. And then they'll go through a process of, of making sure they vetted and verified uh, you know, the requirements as needed. Okay, so let's talk about going forward. Um, the mayor has proposed um, a $15 million cash assistance for workers who are otherwise ineligible for federal unemployment insurance programs. Yes. Um, this appears to be a continuation of the CARES DC program. Um, however, the 15 million doesn't appear to be in your operating budget at this point. Yes, and I, I'm probably not the right one to ask in terms of logistics. I assume um, that after the dust settles that someone will, will ask us to administer that program again. Okay. And those dollars will be transferred to us. Okay, so we have to do a inter-district transfer, if you will. Yes. Okay. Um, New York recently announced a very large excluded workers fund, um, about $2.1 billion. Um, but I noticed they also have a fairly robust um, identity verification program, as well as income limits for their particular program. Um, in the conversations that you all have had with the mayor's office, um, for this additional 15 million, is there an anticipation of changing the way that the program is administered or going forward with how DC CARES has happened thus far? Uh, two things I would say, Councilmember. One is we, we haven't had any detailed conversations. Uh, and two, I wanna be careful um, probably about our lane. Like I'm, we are proud to administer this program, but admittedly, this is not what Events DC does from a policy perspective. Okay. So I would say I feel that the, the, the organizations have spent a lot of time, and I think there's a very good um, process in place to identify and verify those applicants. But I, I'm not the one who would who make that policy call as to whether it needs to be changed. But I, thought, I think it, the program works very well, uh, and I would say there's a lot of integrity of the program, but I, I couldn't speak to whether it should be changed or not. Okay, okay. I'm at, I met with a group recently who is asking for us to invest $200 million into this particular sure. fund, um, which, you know, obviously with more money comes, I don't call them more problems, but you know what I'm more saying. More scrutiny. <laughs> it becomes a more uh, administrative situation um, for, for all of you. Um, and in that, um, they wanted some changes in that it, it not just be a one-time cash assistance, but that it be a monthly payment that goes out to families over the course of a year. 
Um, <clears throat> just for um, clarification now, because I know, you know, I recently had a conversation with one of our banks in terms of unbanked populations. Um, for the money that is going out the door that you guys have in your current um, system, is is it a debit card? Is it uh, like what what is the administration? Obviously, we're not giving out a thousand dollars in cash in our envelope. Yes, it's a debit card. Okay, and so a debit card that can be used at any location, et cetera. Correct. Is there a particular administrative fee that's associated with um, that? There, there is. I don't. Uh... I apologize, I can get that information for you. We negotiated, or I should say through our partners, they negotiated a very low fee for that. So, um, but I can get you that the specific fee for that. Okay, it would be helpful just to know sort of um, if there are related transaction fees, whereas that $1,000 is not really going, it, it really isn't full thousand, right? If I gotta take out um, X percentage of transaction fees anytime that I incur a particular cost. Um, but I, you know, I heard uh, your conversation with the council member, uh, excuse me, with the chair earlier, and then also council member Pinto, but I was just popping in to ask you about that. So I appreciate it. It's good to see you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you, council member Henderson. <clears throat> Ms. O'Dell, I'm, I'm going to direct your attention to your schedule A uh, and ask how many vacancies you all currently have. Okay. Um, I believe right now, sorry, Mr. Duffer, let me just get this in front of me. No worries. Uh, um, I see we have actually, we have 21 or 29 frozen positions. Let me verify the number of total vacancies right now. Okay, okay. I, I think my, my team, the committee counted 21, but we also noted the 29 frozen vacancies. So yeah, which is actually, probably, probably right. It needs to be updated, but that's probably right. We probably have 21 vacancies and 29 frozen. And are those, just unclear, are those, is it of the 29 uh, frozen positions, the 21 vacancies, or are those two different things? 29 um, vacancies, I'm sorry, 29 frozen positions plus 21 vacancies. Good question. Uh, so it's actually, I believe it's two separate numbers right now. And the reason why, and I should, I can get this, it's been, uh, we just updated because we've actually hired, we just went through and hired several of the vacant but unfrozen positions. So I will clarify the total number for you. Um, okay. And then also, if you can get someone, uh, perhaps your AFO or somebody else to, to let me know uh, what the current vacancy savings are, as well as uh, the, the, the amount of projected FY22 vacancy savings. Uh, happy to do that. And we'll, the other thing I noted um, is that we actually are going to hire 50% of those frozen positions uh, in 2022 as we ramp up operations. Okay, okay. And, and, so, and so are you unfreezing 50% of right. the, the frozen positions only? Yes, yes sir. Okay, and are, are the other, so the other um, approximately 14 or 15, well, let me just ask it differently to make sure. Are there still 29 frozen positions? Uh, yeah, and I just, I apologize, I have an update. So 31, okay. 31 uh, total positions uh, vacant and 21 of those are now frozen based on the, the higher. So we have 10 vacancies uh, right now, um, but 31 total. Okay, and, and how many recent hires just so I, my numbers are uh, now. well. We we actually started at, and this is why the numbers in flux. We actually had um, forty. We had as many as forty nine, and some of those were just vacant positions in total. And so okay. uh, we've kept, we've rehired all of the vacant positions that were unfrozen. Mm -hmm. So now, just as a the total number is 30, 31, with twenty of them, twenty one of them being frozen. Got it. Okay. Um, and of those 21 that are frozen, you had mentioned earlier that you, uh, um, you're gonna hire 50% of the frozen positions. Right. 50% of the 21? Correct. Are they frozen? Yep. Okay. And the other ones we will have hired as a matter of course. Okay. Uh, and, and, and if someone could uh, on your team speak to the, the vacancy savings? Uh, yes, we can total the, we'll get the vacancy totals okay. for you based on uh, those numbers. Um. Under table ES03, uh, this is page 884, volume four of the budget books. 
The proposed budget for regular pay continuing full time increased by $1.79 million. Uh, and fringe benefits increased by $1.14 million. Uh, the budget chapter indicates the increase is to align personal services and fringe benefits with projected costs and to restore 50% of the frozen position where well, you just mentioned that. Yep. Um, I would like you, if you could, to sort of walk me through which positions you're unfreezing. Do they fall into a certain division that perhaps, just, just sort of walk me through your thinking on, on, on where you are with these positions. I know you mentioned just a moment ago that, that you, you already made some, some hires. Yep. Uh, give me a sense as, as we sort of move in again, uh, reopen, recovery, um, where you all are in terms of your staff and, and hiring. Yeah, the, the simple answer is they, they actually represent across all events DC. Okay. When we when we went to a budget, we actually reduced, we asked everyone to take a haircut and reduce some of their numbers. So even our administrative functions were um, were reduced as well. Mm -hmm. But but arguably they did come from events programs. So just looking at the list, I can tell you we have, you know, just offhand, three of them are from our convention management, which is our events group. We have several that were even part of our uh, finance group. Uh, and then also even our facilities, our technology department, uh, and even some of our sports entertainment divisions. So they, they were across the board, uh, we froze positions to reflect um, less activity. What, what about, um, you, you had mentioned in, in, in February on performance that uh, you had uh, paused your employee salary increases and bonuses. Uh, what's the, how are you doing with, with increases in bonuses, what's the plan for FY? So FY, I'm sorry, sir. So for FY22, um, right now in our budget, our financial plan, uh, we did not have a cost of living adjustment or any uh, bonuses in that budget. Um, what we did ask the board, and they were very amenable, is that if we um, performed well in FY21 and had some uh, savings above what we projected for that budget, so that we could revisit looking at our um, cost of living adjustments. A big concern that I have is the uh, we lost some staff despite COVID. It's been a very um, competitive market. And so we've lost several staff. And as uh, I'm sure you're aware, particularly in the hospitality industry, we're seeing a lot of people who are not going back to those prospective jobs. And so we want to make sure if we have an opportunity to, to retain our staff that we'll do that. So that's something that we typically look at our budget at the beginning of the fiscal year. So in September, uh, we'll review the budget and get a uh, formal sign off with the board. And that's something that we'd like to consider. Got it. So you know, we talked a little bit about revenue. Well, actually, I think it was you and Councilmember Pinto talked a bit about revenue earlier. Uh, and, and in your statement, you discussed uh, that of SDC lost 22.5% of revenue due to the pandemic. Um, just, just take a moment and talk uh, about uh, how things are going currently in terms of revenue uh, and what, what are the sources uh, of the revenue that, that you may be seeing now uh, as compared mm -hmm. to last year. And so in FY, and just to give you a uh, kind of round numbers perspective, so post or pre-COVID in FY19, our operating revenue was $28 million. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we saw almost half of that um, you know, cut in half during 2020 because the fiscal year, really the COVID-19 impact was really about a six month impact from March to September. Because of the full brunt of, of COVID in 2021, you know, our revenue projections went down to about $6.5 million just for events um, production uh, effort. Um, fortunately for FY22, we'll go back up to about $19 million, which is what I uh, have reflected in the testimony. And so, you know, we're seeing, we won't get back to normal probably until 2023 from a revenue perspective, um, but we're at least uh, seeing increased revenue over what we saw last year. Similarly, the, the non-operating revenue, which is really the dedicated taxes that we receive, are on the same trajectory. And so we, we saw very high numbers uh, in FY19 uh, pre-COVID. Uh, those numbers dipped down uh, about half of the year uh, in 2020. In 2020. 2021, because it was the full year impact, uh, those numbers really uh, went down significantly. And we're starting to rise up, but we won't probably see the, the dedicated taxes, which is the hotel and restaurant taxes, uh, get back to full capacity probably until 2024. Right. Well, what are you projecting for the for the dedicated taxes in 2022? 
2022, we are uh, projecting $106 million, which is up from $68 million uh, this year. Okay, and this just just for contrast, um, what was the what was the in FY19 dedicated? Uh, it was a uh, 156 million dollars in FY19. Got it. So 50 million dollars less uh, for 2022 as a projection. Correct. Okay, I'm gonna probably stay on this line of question when I come back. Uh, my time is expired for this round. I'm gonna turn to Councilmember Pinto. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Chairman McDuffie. So I just wanna clarify something, Mr. Odell, we were talking about the um, utilization of your reserves, yep. but in the FY22 proposed budget, there's a line of inclusion to support the restoration of 50% of positions that were frozen during FY 2021 due to the pandemic. Yes, ma'am. So it is, of those positions that were frozen, are you going to be bringing back half of them or how will that work? Correct. So we assume for the full year of FY22 that we'll still have 50% um, will be unfrozen, but we'll still have uh, unfrozen position or excuse me, frozen positions for the remainder of the six months. And so uh, we won't ramp up until full capacity until 2023. Okay. Okay, um, so by 2023, you're anticipating that 100% of the positions that were frozen will be ramped back up. Will those be offered to those um, to those same employees? Correct. In most cases, we were fortunate because we were able to freeze uh, you know, positions that had become vacant, and so we didn't really have a scenario where we had to let go people. Um, so we'll be able to obviously retain the people that we have. Uh, but fortunately, we don't have people who are who are out of work or had to leave or, or been laid off or furloughed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if things move more quickly than currently projected um, and, and more and more people come back to DC and, and to these spaces, is it possible that more, fr more positions could be unfrozen before 2023? Uh, absolutely the case. And we, um, the board has been... Uh, amenable, adherent, proactive, and they want us to, to pursue, um, you know, obviously event programming. And if that supports that, then yes, we'll, we'll actually do that as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Um, so the convention center hosted 151 events in fiscal year 19 and only 57 events in fiscal year 20. Um, what are the current projections for the return of sports entertainment and convention activities for fiscal year 2022? Yeah, so we'll, um, on the convention center side, uh, we'll probably host anywhere between 100 to 150 events um, for uh, probably for FY21, or excuse me, for FY22. FY21 will we'll host significantly less um, events. Um, we'll probably host anywhere from 20 to 40 events this year that will be much smaller uh, in nature and virtual programming. Um, but what, what I don't want to, I guess, just to clarify, what's important is not necessarily just the number, but the size of the events. And so um, to the extent that we're hosting 18 or, or now 16 citywides is actually a good thing for us because that will generate uh, the most revenue and the most economic impact for the city. And so we typically focus, uh, you know, on those as the highest priority. And so even though we may host between 100 and 150 events in FY22, the fact that we have at least 16 citywide really will bode well for us. Great, okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and I heard you earlier and understand the position that it's of course a policy judgment to determine how much additional funding is needed for our excluded workers. Um, but from an administrability standpoint, do you all have, do the events DC have the staffing necessary to ensure that additional funds could be dispersed to the individuals and families that really need uh, more direct relief? I, I thank you for the question because it allows me to clarify, like I, we're honored to, to administer this program, but the heavy lifting really is the, the community-based organizations. They are doing, you know, all the significant outreach, all the processing, managing the database, and then also the awarding and, and follow-up. So, 
the really the question remains um, or really should be focused around their resources and their ability to administer the program. I think now that, that we have a process in place for coordinating with them, that will be fine to support that effort. But I really would um, and appreciate your question. We want to make sure they have the resources to expand the program. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I hope we all share that um, mission to make sure that they have the resources they need. Um, I said in my opening, and it just continues to be so stark. The uh, level of funding that so many families received was $1,000 throughout the entire year. And while that's an important step, um, that of course is not sufficient funding to, to support a family. And so I think we need to do more in this budget to find additional funding for those programs. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for everything that you're doing. I'll say it again. I encourage everybody uh, to get vaccinated and get back to in-person activity, whether that's at the convention center or supporting our local restaurants and businesses and hotels, because we can't see their recovery without all of us being part of that recovery. So I hope we can all uh, be in this together. So thank you, Mr. Odell, and thank you, Chairman McDuffie. Thank you for all your support of, of our industry. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman Pinto. In uh, February, Mr. Odell, you mentioned uh, the the 435 bed, I think it was, alternative care site at the convention center. Uh, it's costing $37 million. Was that, was that cost uh, reimbursed by the federal government? Or, or? That, that was, and that might be a, a question better for uh, the deputy mayor, but uh, essentially, uh, as I understand it, the, the, um, the coordinated with their, uh, with, we work with Department of General Services actually to help facilitate that construction there are reimbursable rates from FEMA that the city's worked out that it's not limited just to that facility, but across all the spend. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that rate, as I also understand, uh, at a certain level of spending goes from 75% to 90%. And so I think it's somewhere in that calculus that the district got reimbursed uh, for, we did not expend the funds uh, for that hospital, the district. Ah, okay, got it. <clears throat> in table, uh... ES03, which is uh, page H85, volume four uh, of the budget. There is a $12.3 million reduction in the budget under debt services. It's a CSG 880. Can you walk me through that reduction? I can. Uh, so, and I'll, I'll start and I'll ask our uh, chief financial officer to um, either correct me or add where I shall fall short. So we were very fortunate um, in the past as, as he and, and our um, the office of the chief financial officer have helped manage uh, you know, our finances and particularly our, our debt service. Um, we went through a, a refunding or refinancing um, several years ago and it was quite fortuitous that um, the way we structured uh, the debt savings from that refinancing is that it actually got applied uh, in this in the fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, and so we see a reduction in our um, debt service payments as a result of that refinancing. Um, I would also note, Mr. Chair, and thanks to, to you in helping uh, get the legislation passed, we just went through another refunding uh, where we're also allowed or uh, allowed us to reduce our debt service yet again um, for this year and next year as well. And so, uh, again, great financial stewardship on, on our CFO's part. Um, thank the board for their um, support in getting this done. And so that has really allowed us to reduce our debt service. Um, it was quite fortuitous that it happened during the pandemic. Okay. Uh, in that same table, the, the budget allocated for energy, communications, and building rentals, uh, which is CSG 30, mm -hmm. for FY22 is $5.8 million, which is approximately $1.8 one seven five less uh, than fiscal year 21's um, seven million dollars or so. Uh, talk about why that's the case. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually pass to our uh, chief financial officer. He can provide the variance report. Okay, thanks. And if you could just mention your name for the record. Um, I'm Henry Mosley, chief financial officer for Events DC. 
I'd like to do two things, if I may, Mr. Chairman. One is comment on uh, Mr. Gill's um, breakdown of 12 million that you referred to early on debt service. Um, the first part of it is, is we have two two bonds types. One is a convention center bonds and the other is hotel bonds, very marquee hotel bonds. Uh, the presentation for the budget this fiscal year, we pulled out the $12 million of debt service for the hotel bonds to do separately. So we knew we were doing the refunding. And so what it represents is truly the, the, the debt service for the hotel coming out and strictly at the convention center. That's the 12 million. And okay. as he referenced also is we did do a refunding on those bonds and we were able, there will be in 22 and 21, there are some, some uh, difference of debt into outer years based on the refunding process. Okay. So uh, regarding uh, oh, the utilities piece, uh, it has specifically reflecting of utilities and some of it is reduction of activity going on at RFK Stadium in preparation. So we aren't spending at those levels mm -hmm. as we have Okay. And, and this is the same table, actually. Uh, the, the FY22 budget allocation for land and buildings, CSG 70, is $1.8 million more for FY21. That has to do with our capital budget um, and increasing capital, anticipated capital budget expenditures over the previous fiscal year. Okay. One of the things we're doing, Mr. Chair, is um, from a technology perspective, we are um, implementing a new ERP system um, for our finance, HR, and procurement system. So part of that's reflected in that number. I got it. And uh, stand on capital. Uh, when we last uh, spoke during February's performance oversight, uh, most of the capital projects were put on hold until the third and fourth quarter of FY21. Um, um, talk about uh, the, the status of, of some of these capital projects. I think you, you may have referenced something in your, in your earlier testimony, but I want to give you an opportunity to just expand on that. Uh, and, and, and if there are certain ones that are being prioritized, uh, talk about uh, those projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, uh, yes, we still have um, reduced but prioritized our capital. And the way our capital program works again, thanks to the, uh, you know, our board's leadership, is that we prioritize first all the maintenance of, of our assets first. And so we want to make sure that our buildings are being maintained uh, properly. And we're fortunate that that's been the, the case historically. And then separately, um, once we've fulfilled that priority, and then we focus on the strategic initiatives that really are arguably, you know, the growth of our organization. And so the, the projects that we've focused on, particularly on the um, strategic initiative side, we prioritize the streetscape project, which is the exterior around the convention center. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, have new retail kiosks going in, which is really important when we have people coming back to our city so that they can experience local DC. Um, we also have a rooftop terrace that will eventually be built um, on the north end of the building. That again, will be a great amenity, not only for um, visitors, but also for residents to enjoy. And then the second priority has been uh, we, we built these beautiful fields, these multi-purpose fields uh, at RFK. Uh, it's such a huge site that one of the things that we noticed is that we need to enhance that, that experience by adding more restrooms. And so we're under construction right now uh, to add more restrooms at that site. Thank you for the thumbs up. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a long walk. Um, so we want to make sure we, we put some restaurants in close proximity. Yeah, I've had occasion to, to be over there for soccer practice. <laughs> Um, so, so, um, and we spoke earlier in the year around performance. Also, you indicated that RFK Stadium's demolition uh, was going to be delayed until FY twenty three. Is that the time frame you're still targeting? That is correct, sir. Uh, not only, obviously, from a capital perspective, but we also have to go through an extensive regulatory um, process as well. Okay, and and has there been any contracts awarded with respect to that demolition? We have not, and we have an active uh, solicitation right now uh, as part of that process. Okay, okay. It's open right now? It is, yes, sir. Okay, when is it closed? Uh, we anticipate by the end of this fiscal year, we'll be able to make a award. Got it. Okay. And which, which quarter are you targeting for, for demolition in 23? Uh, right now, it really probably depends on the, on the uh, regulatory process, but it could be early in the first um, or second uh, quarter of the program right now. Uh, of the fiscal year for 23. Okay, and what kinds of interest are you getting from, uh, if any, from CBEs? What's, what's the, so you all have any goals around that? 
We've yeah. had, and I, I'm sure my general counsel will kick me, and I should say that it's an active solicitation, but actually closed in terms of the bid process, just sure. to clarify. Um, and I think probably the most I can say is I believe we have, uh, we did have um, CBE interest. Um, you know, right now we're, we're going to start evaluating uh, the bids. I think we had as many as, as 11 bids. Don't know if they are um, actually um, all qualified bids or not, but I think there's 50% uh, CB uh, participation uh, in that process. Great. Um, my, my time has expired. I'm not sure if we, we still have uh, any other council members, Pinto or Henderson for a round. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Um, under attachment one, CSG 41, it looks like uh, you either have awarded or intend to award $27 million plus uh, in contracts. Okay. And this is, however, your, your FY22 budget allocation for contractual services is is actually more than that that other amount. So th th just to be exact, the numbers we have uh, in CSG 41 on the attachment one, is $27,033,811. And um, I'm seeing FY22 budget allocation for contractual services is $27,832,000. It's about $800,000 difference, give or take. Okay, you. we can clarify that. And I, I should have said a non and I referenced we don't use the financial system of the district. And so we actually crosswalk our, our budget and our financials into the district book. Okay. And so that's why Henry had referenced some of it were grouping categories together, but okay. we'll clarify if there's a specific difference. Um, unless Henry, you can speak to it right now. We'll make sure we reconcile that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We can follow up. Okay. Got it. And just, just more broadly speaking about contractual services and, 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 and CBE participation, um, just to give you an opportunity to talk about that. I know we, we, we've gone over in past uh, hearings and, and obviously it's a priority for me and the committee and other members of the committee. Uh, talk about CBE participation uh, this year, how it's going and, and, and whether you have any goals for next year. We do. So I, I'm, I'm proud to say not only because it's an uh, interest to you, but it's an interest to us and, and particularly our, our board that we've hit our CB goals or exceeded them every year. Um, as you know, the process better than others. You know, we have a, an adjusted budget. I think our adjusted budget this year is, I think, $25 million for the CB goal. And so uh, we anticipate that we will surpass that number. Uh, what typically happens in the third quarter through the office of DSLBD, there's a reconciliation process. And so particularly in this year, if there's less spend, that budget may get adjusted. But we anticipate meeting our goals as, as we've always had. And it's something that's very important to us. And what about the, the goal for 22? Do you have it yet? Uh, I don't. It'll be what typically happens, even though we have a contractual spend that's in our budget. Um, they'll go through and make adjustments um, to that for what qualifies as the, the DSLBD budget. So I'll, I don't believe we have that as of yet, Mr. Chairman, but we're happy to share it with your office as soon as we get it. Do you know how you all are doing? You have numbers of, of, of what your spend looks like to date uh, in terms of meeting that $25 million goal for this year? Um, I don't have it right now because I think it will get, that goal will likely get adjusted down because the overall spend got adjusted down. But I will, uh, we can provide, um, and it's being reconciled right now with DSLBD, but mm -hmm. we can provide um, that number to you. So we'll follow up and make sure we share what the spend is. And if you could, in providing that number, point out um, so the, what you attribute the, uh, to what you attribute the downward. Um, oh, I, yes, I can clarify that now. That, that's just a, our budget was approved at a higher number. And then based on the, the, the um, lesser spend as a result of COVID and less event activity, this is what's okay. driving our overall budget now. Okay. All right.
In table, and again, I, I don't know how, how this is reflected in, in the information you all have, but we, sure. we have this ES03, page H85 in volume four, and this is under CSG 50, subsidies and transfers. There, there's an increase of $1,320,000 from FY21. And according to the uh, ESO budget chapter, the increase is to support the destination DC payment to DGS for, I don't know if that's supposed to be destination DC to or- the events, DC, DC. the events DC's events DC, To yeah. DGS for maintenance of RK Stadium and the non-military portion of the DC Armory possessory interest tax for entertainment and sports arena increase. Correct. Yes, sir. So we we have uh, DGS right now uh, maintains our facilities at the campus. We have since and will continue to transition and reduce some of their um, since since we have now closed operations at RFK. They'll still support the campus and they'll still support Armory, but we'll continue to reduce that and supplement that with other contractors uh, who will better support the operations, such as the field. And so that reflects, um, you know, what the, the typical maintenance um, contract is with DGS. Okay. Um, the other part, when the reference to destination DC is a transfer of the dedicated tax that they receive from the government. That's also part of that. So, Okay, so, so let me, that's what, because I was, I was getting a little confused. So, so if you could break that down for me, because I, I understand that the, 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 like the, the, the mayor had indicated $5 million uh, to events DC, destination DC to support, show attraction and promote DC as a destination to live, work and play. Um, is that reflected in events DC's budget? It is not. Uh, the, what's reflected in, your, in our budget is the percentage of the dedicated tax that Destination DC receives. Like we receive, the convention center receives a dedicated tax. Destination DC also receives a portion of the dedicated tax. And it's all lumped to us. So part of that is the, 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 uh, what you're seeing as expenditure is our transfer of the Destination DC portion to them. So that's why it, it went up. And it goes up based on the revenue estimate and the anticipated dedicated tax situation. Right, and so how much is that? Is that transfer that uh, for Destination DC specifically? Uh, uh, close to about three point eight million dollars normally on a year, and it just depends on if the dedicated taxes go up. Okay. And it's three point eight. Is is that what you said? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, but that, and that, just to be clear, Mr. Chair, that's there's two different buckets um, of funding for Destination DC that come through us. The first is formulaic through the dedicated taxes that they receive a percentage of the marketing fund. And the second is the additional incremental um, dollars that they receive as that Henry just re um, recited that is the 3.8 million. Okay, so what's the first part of the dedicated? First part is, so they, per our statute, they receive a portion of the dedicated tax. It's rough on a pre-COVID basis. It's anywhere from, you know, 11 to, to 12, $13 million as a percentage of the dedicated tax. So Henry, we can quickly get you the number, but of that $156 million that I spoke to in 2019, their number would have roughly been about that amount. That is just formulaic that they get as percentage of the marketing fund. So, um, so I have some context. Um, what, how much went to Destination DC and FY21, both through the dedicated and, and the incremental? Sure. Uh, Henry, do you have that offhand or do we need to provide or just calculate that? It would, I, have, been, it would have been severely reduced because the dedicated right. taxes were reduced. Right. And then even the, the other portion that was the incremental, which normally would have been $3 million, was also um, right. significantly reduced as well. Okay. Henry, do you have it offhand, or do we need to provide that to the council? I'd like to provide it if possible, because it, 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 as you indicate, it's a percentage of the hotel tax that the bill goes to the marketing fund, and the percentage of that. And we can give you the actual numbers. Uh, okay, okay because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask now about the FY21 number. I'm sorry, 22 numbers. Could, could you, you all should have the 22 numbers on hand, right? Yeah, so we, we have, and the, the reason why we don't have it broken out, it's part of our, our non-operating expense, so it's rolled up into that number, but we can provide a breakdown for you, but okay. we, we carry it as part of the overall non-operating expense number that you see in the budget. Okay, okay. 
it still will be, you know, because the dedicated tax numbers are still significantly less than pre-COVID, it'll still be a reduced number. Okay. I, I was trying to get a sense of whether it's going to be larger than, than what, what they received this year. Um, it will be. Uh, so yeah. just based on the fact that the dedicated tax revenue uh, previously was uh, the overall non-revenue expense was, I'm sorry, Henry, go ahead. Uh, we have them receiving $3.8 million of the, of the $104 million that you're showing and, what, were you, what, were you, what were your new reference? I'm sorry, just to make sure. I'm I'm, in, in FY22 and yeah. the ESO of the charge reflecting, the total, uh, or excuse me, it's actually um, easy zero where they show the transfers from the district <laughs> to the convention center. The total amount, for example, is $104 million that we're supposed to receive. But of that $100 million, the 104 that we receive in that, it's three point eight million dollars for destination DC that the district transfers. So they get three point eight. Then of the dedicated taxes that we receive, the portion of the hotel tax um, is a uh, percentage goes to a marketing fund, and of the, the marketing fund dollars, they get eighty six percent of that. So we have to calculate that. What we're showing so far in our twenty two budget for destination DC is the three point eight million dollars, and also as part of our marketing fund expense, they'll receive approximately. Uh, uh, another $8 million. Another because they receive a portion of the market fund dollars. Got it. So, so if you talk Chair, about your question, it's close to $12 million. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, we'll, we'll provide a chart view that shows um, yeah. show 19, 20, and 21 for what their, what their uh, revenue sources are. Okay. Both. That'd be great. Yep. Okay, no problem. Just give you an opportunity. You, you touched on this a bit um, uh, on your earlier statement, but wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the, the Go Industry Relief Fund. Uh, we've been working with, with you all relief initially uh, earlier last year. I know that funds have started to go out. Uh, just talk a little bit about where you all are with that. Yes, sir. With, uh, you know, it's been a, a great learning process for us, but I, I will say it's been, a, you know, an honor for us to work with the, the GoGo community, um, not only for obviously the, the incredible music, but just the passion they have of, about, you know, not only the music, but the industry and the culture and the life. And so we started this process, we, we had to work through what we thought was the best way to, to touch as many artists uh, and performers as we could. And so now we have a, a good process in place where we are providing grants to bands uh, and artists, um, either as, as they qualify um, as district businesses, or um, we're able to actually record videos and capture videos to have great content that we can share across multiple platforms for these amazing artists and bands. Uh, and then secondly, we've also have, have leveraged some great studios to produce these videos. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, we're also gonna be showcasing uh, some events the first of which was, um, you know, the Unity Fest that Mochella put on this past Sunday, which was great. And so we anticipate doing at least two more uh, of those type of events. And so it's just been a great way for us to, to showcase GoGo. Um, you know, we think right now we have 50 applications approved. So uh, we'll get through that. I think part of the, the first tranche of the million dollars right now, we probably anticipate some savings of that, Mr. Chairman, but we will, we will reinvest back in GoGo to exhaust uh, the full million dollars. Um, so we'll have some other programming or all opportunities to work with some other artists um, to make sure that we uh, we expend those funds. Got it. Um, and just just to, I think both Councilmember Henderson uh, and Pinto already touched on this. But I don't need to spend too much more time. Uh, I had intended to ask uh, some of the questions around uh, the was was in the mayor's proposed budget uh, as a job and economic opportunity. Um, she had a lot of 15 million to support workers with cash assistance who do not qualify for federal unemployment assistance is the language that they use. Um, um, this is like what we, what we know as the DC CARES program. Mm -hmm. You all though don't have that 15 million in your budget uh, to date. 
Uh, it's obviously for FY22, but you, you have had some conversations, I assume, or have you not yet had conversations with respect to uh, transfers of that to you all to administer? We haven't had any conversations yet about the specific transfer. We certainly had conversations about being supportive and helping to continue to coordinate and administer that program. So we're happy to, to do so, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And, and, and to your knowledge, any conversations about additional funds that might be available beyond what was initially proposed by the mayor, 15 million. I know uh, Councilman Henderson talked about, and I know there's uh, my office has interacted with advocates uh, who, who are uh, requesting and really urging the council to do more uh, to explore, uh, to support excluded workers. We haven't been involved in any any discussions about additional funding or even the right amount of funding. We're, we're supportive of the program and obviously make sure that that, um, you know, those in, in that community and those constituents make sure they're supported. But, you know, I, from a policy perspective, it's just not my bailiwick to know what the right amount is, but we're happy to support and coordinate that program and, and help get them the relief that they deserve. Okay. And, and I'm, I heard you correct about, it. I just wanna make sure the record is clear. With respect to any additional resources that the council identifies additional funding for that program, those resources will, will likely need to go to the grantee who is administering it? Yes, sir. And I, I hopefully my staff will yell at me, but I, I think we have a good infrastructure in place to administer um, from our perspective, but really the heavy lift, you know, is truly with the, the community-based organizations that are doing all the outreach, all the processing and awarding and, and really um, working with the, the families and so I think any resources as part of that program should be allocated to support them to make sure they, they do what they can for this program. Okay, okay. And uh, again, something mentioned earlier in your, in your testimony, but I wanna take an opportunity to, to dig into this a bit. Um, you all got uh, approximately $20 million or so from CARES Act funding uh, for, I think you refer to it as a tourism and hospitality relief fund. It's part of the bridge, Fine. Correct. Yes. yes, sir. So the yes, sir. So the deputy, uh, excuse me, the mayor and the deputy mayor had had set up this bridge fund um, for $100 million, 20 million of which was allocated to hotels. And, and since, as you know, we had had a $5 million hotel program that we funded and administered. And so um, the mayor and deputy mayor came calling and we were happy to, to serve as the administrator of their funds. And so it wasn't, uh, you know, our funds, it was the city's funds. And so, but we served uh, and used the same infrastructure and program that we had built um, to administer those funds. And it was a quick turnaround because those dollars expired by the end of, of the calendar year 2020. Mm -hmm. So essentially our team in, in you know, partnership with FEMPED got those funds out the door in, in you know, less than 60 days. Okay. And so just, just so I'm clear, because some of the funds, uh, you, you had the tourism, the hospitality relief, you had the, um, some of a portion of which I think and I might be just, I don't want to conflate the different pots, the buckets that you all had, because you had, you all are hard at work uh, with, with getting these funds out, but you had funds that were um, for hospitality relief, a portion of which earlier on went to undocumented workers. And then you had uh, funds that specifically went to hotels, right? And those were sort of different funds. Um, and those total approximately how much? So in 2020, Events DC uh, funded uh, $15 million um, approximately for restaurants, $5 million, hotels, $5 million, and undocumented workers, $5 million. Yeah. Uh, and that was, in addition, we also did the cultural institutional grants that were $10 million. So uh, the funding that you and I were just discussing was the additional funds of $9 million from the undocumented, undocumented workers that came from the district. So we didn't provide it, but we administered. And then the $20 million that you just referred was part of the $100 million bridge fund also came from the district where we administered. And so those last two pots of money came from the district. Okay, okay. But, but, the, but the, just again, the original 26.1 that you mentioned were, were events DC funds. Yes, sir. And then the, the 9 million the council put in the budget for excluded workers that you all administered. Yes, and sir. Then the 20 million uh, was a part of the, the $100 million uh, business grants, emergency that the council passed, the mayor uh, uh, did through the bridge fund, 
and that was 20 million, but that was CARES Act funding specifically that had to go out. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. got it. And we only participated in the hotel portion of that, that right. process. Yeah. Right, okay. Got it. W were there different guidelines or the same guidelines when, when you all got the 20 million from uh, the mayor through the bridge fund, was it the same sort of administration and, and guidelines as was in place when you all did the five million for hotels? Earlier? They were they were generally the same guidelines, uh, which is why I think it was attractive to the deputy mayor um, to to do so in working with us. I think there may have been some other guidelines that that were added, um, particularly around. Um, the opening and closing of those hotels to ensure that hotels will be open, um, okay. given the, the significant increase in the in the amount of grants that were received. But by and large, they were the same. Okay. Um, are there, in terms of FY twenty one, you mentioned GoGo. -Go. What what other grants? Are you currently administering or plan to administer? In FY21? Yeah. Uh, in FY21, we'll finish the, the um, DC CARES uh, grants money um, that we're currently doing. We'll also finish um, the uh, GoGo -Go, uh, grants that we spoke about. Uh, and then we'll, we're right now um, also administering our community grants program, which is 500,000 for this year. Right. So those are really the, the grants that we're focused on for this fiscal year. And what about next fiscal year? What, what grants do you plan to um, administer? You have a sense of, I think, uh, I mean, I see some stuff, but I want to give you an opportunity to talk about. Sure. Yeah. Similarly, I, I think we will, uh, we will certainly uh, focus on our community grants program, uh, which is 500,000 for next year. Um, we will, you know, also um, administer, as we were discussing the DC CARES program, whatever that may look like and whatever the right dollar amount is. Um, I, if the city, you know, is asking us to administer some, some other programs, I'm sure we will continue to, to focus on go-go uh, community as well uh, in 2022 as well. Um, but, you know, we're, we're prepared to administer some other grants programs, but also we want to, you know, we recognize we're going to be getting back to business. Um, so we, we want to do our part, but we also need to, to do what we do best and fulfill our mission. So we'll, we'll be ramping up our team to focus on that again. And, and speaking of getting back to business, um, do, do you feel like you all uh, have the resources you, you need, you know, given the obvious constraints, but, but do you have the resources you need to, to uh, continue working to getting back to business, um, particularly as it relates to uh, those industries that you all support that were uh, devastated uh, really early in the pandemic and, and perhaps most significantly uh, around tourism, hospitality, restaurants, hotels? Yes, I, you know, I think as you've, you know, stated before, I think for Events DC, you know, we have um, judiciously leveraged the reserves, I think in a very responsible way to support our business and it will position us coming out to ramp up operations. I think the supporting uh, industries still are gonna need support to get back um, as quickly as possible. And so whatever we all can do to drive traffic to those businesses, um, and some of that comes in the form of marketing, some of that comes in the form of, you know, activations around the city um, and other programs that I know the, the mayor and the deputy mayor are focused on. So those types of things I think would be helpful for us, as I mentioned, what would be helpful and to the extent that we can create some funding around event activity in these large scale citywide, you know, that will really help drive um, people back to hotels and restaurants when we can actually attract these large scale events. And so that I think would be, if we had an ask, that would be the ask just to make sure that there are opportunities to support those activities because they really, really will drive a lot of foot traffic and a lot of uh, uh, hospitality activities. Okay. All right, I appreciate it. I don't have any additional questions at the moment. I know there's some follow-up that you all are gonna get to us. Uh, we look forward to receiving that. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add to the record before we move on to Destination DC? That's it, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all your support of us and, and the industry. So thanks so much. All right, thank you. Next, uh, we're gonna hear from Destination DC, uh, which is a private nonprofit corporation that serves 
as a lead organization to market Washington, D.C. locally and abroad as a premier global destination for conventions, tourism, and special events. Uh, a contracting arm of Events DC, the organization receives 0.97% uh, uh, of the 14.95% hotel tax, which generally accounts for 80% of its budget. Uh, Destination DC relies uh, on membership dues and co cooperative marketing fees to round out its budget. And we talked a little bit about that uh, uh, with Events DC, and we'll, we'll obviously speak more about that uh, with Mr. Ferguson. So. Uh, good morning to you again, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you, sir, and good morning. Uh, as referenced, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Elliot Ferguson, President and CEO of Destination DC. We're the Destination Management Organization for the great city of Washington. And today I'm joined virtually by my esteemed senior staff, as well as the chairman of our board, Stacy Smith, who's also the general manager of a great hotel here in Southwest Washington, DC. As a destination marketing organization, we create jobs throughout the district and boost the local economy through tourism and visitor spending. And today I'll focus on our budget, the recovery of tourism industry and how we're moving forward. Uh, as we look at budget, you ask specific questions as to the insight as to our fiscal year 2022 budget and will it adequately fulfill our mission of bringing visitors and conventions back to Washington. Now, the perception of D.C. is that everyone will automatically come to our city because we're a top destination, but it actually takes a lot of work to attract visitors and meetings to our city. As an economic development organization, we target those who spend more, and it takes a larger budget to adequately compete with elaborate um, organs to compete, and I will elaborate a bit more about that in my testimony. Now, as referenced, Destination D.C. is a private nonprofit organization, mostly funded through the hotel occupancy tax, which makes up about 82% of our budget. We do not receive a portion of any other tax in our funding. The hotel occupancy tax is paid by visitors who are physically checking into hotels, so the impact of limited travel has severely diminished our budget. The remainder of our budget, or 18%, is funded by membership dues with over 1,000 members, as well as partnership services in which we provide all which have been depleted because of the pandemic. Through fiscal year 2021, our budget approved by the board was $17.25 million based on our current hotel tax collection trend. Our working budget is about 13.5 million, which is down 21.7%. In fiscal year 2022, we anticipate a budget of $17.49 million. Looking back at fiscal year 2020, like so many companies, we had to implement a furlough implement furlough salary reductions and renegotiate our office lease to reduce our expenses by almost $3 million. Some of these measures continue in fiscal year 2021 with 20% of positions remaining on freeze or furloughed. And we sadly permanently eliminated five positions. External funding sources have been a lifeline for us. As a 501c6, Destination DC was not included in the first iteration of CARES Act passed by Congress in 2020. But fortunately, by the end of, fiscal, of annual year 2020, we did receive a round of PPP and small business loans. The $3 million funding from Events DC for advertising this year is crucial, which I'll discuss more in a moment. And we're grateful for the $5 million in the fiscal year 2022 budget, uh, in which Mayor um, Bowser has put as proposed as a fair shot, but as part of the fair shot budget. The recovery of tourism is extremely important because of the, its economic impact. And as a reminder, 2019 marked 10 years of record visitation with, uh, with jobs and spending. 24.6 million visitors were in Washington, D.C., spending over $8.2 billion and generating over $896 million in district tax revenue. And of course, supporting near, nearly 79,000 jobs. Our members, rely solely on us to market our destination. And the reality is we need to be more aggressive to get back to where we were uh, in past years and get our fair share of the market, not just for the leisure market, but also for conventions. There are a lot of destinations that are vying for the same business. To that end, after 16 months without advertising, the recovery advertising campaign funded by Events DC launches tomorrow. And we're launching the campaign at an event with Mayor Bowser Deputy Mayor Falcecchio, and of course, Events DC. And I hope you'll be able to join us. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be there, but our board chair will be there rep um, representing Destination DC and the industry. The campaign idea challenges the perception of Washington DC. 
And through our marketing and content, we are always fe uh, featuring local Washingtonians. And this campaign is quite frankly, no different. It's a natural extension of what we've done with DDC Cool or DC Cool and continues with the Discover Real DC campaign. I'm extremely proud of the campaign and the fact that we've used a lot of local talent in terms of promoting our, our city, diverse neighborhoods, thriving arts and cultural scene, local experiences, great food, outdoor activities, world-class sports, shopping, theater, and our music scene, which of course includes go-go and jazz. We're targeting three geographic regions, uh, the local region, which plays a, an important role of the recovery of our economy, consumers within a four hour drive of Washington, DC, and of course, a national audience. And the campaign connects to our award-winning website, washington.org, which was recently revamped. I think the key thing for us is to continue to focus on ways in which we can promote all things that Washington has to offer as a destination. And social media, public relations, and email marketing have also helped DC and the news and keeping DC the top of the mind of those that might potentially come here. That's especially important during a time where we did not have the dollars to promote DC. Of course, tourism plays a huge role in what we do. And according to tourism economics, an international study shows that before, we won't get to 2019 levels of visitation um, for quite a while. And international visitation might take until 2024 before we realize the numbers that we had in 2019 and even longer to recover to those specific uh, numbers of visitors. And there's always a the question, why do we talk about international visitors? And as I've referenced several times, we love all visitors, but the international visitors as an economic development organization stays longer and spends more. And that's important to us. They represent about 9% of visitation, but 27% of the visitors spend. So in that regard, we work closely with organizations such as Brand USA and US Travel Association to focus on not only marketing this, the city, but also key things specific to advocacy. We also work closely with the Washington Airports Authority and an organization called Capital Region USA, which is comprised of the states of Maryland, Virginia, and the Airports Authority to market our cities um, throughout the, the region, uh, throughout the nation and internationally. We have representation in China, the UK, India, and Australia, and we'll continue to focus on them um, as they're looking at the recovery of the international market. Um, as we look at key things happening in the city, I won't go into them because Greg O'Dell referenced some of the unique things in which we're working on with them, including the recovery of the convention market, which has been hampered significantly. And I know Greg talked about the numbers, what has happened over the last few years and what we're doing in uh, this particular year. I'm very happy with the relationship we have with the Hospitality Alliance comprised of Kathy Hellinger with the Restaurant Association, Solomon Keene, with the Hotel Association and of course, Greg O'Dell as we focus on ways to bring visitors and, and recovery of our market and our community as a whole. On an average, it takes about five years or more to book a major citywide convention and to that regard, we've been doing rather well with booking meetings in the future. The American Experience Foundation is one area in which I'm extremely proud of in terms of giving back to the community with scholarships, with internships and a program in which we did last year with the DC public school system that they said was probably one of the best well run um, programs in the city that focuses solely on getting um, kids interested in our, in our marketing and hospitality industry as a whole. And in closing, Councilmember McDuffie, I want to recognize your efforts and your insight into how important hospitality is and our marketing efforts are. So between you and what you do, and of course the mayor and all the other mem members of city council, it's important to remember that for every dollar we spend on marketing, there's a $3.03 return on investment, which is extremely important to us. As the, at the end of the day, it's all about ROI. And I'll end by saying that as we're promoting DC and getting back on track, cities like New York City, which is arguably one of the most visited cities in the world, uh, the mayor is giving them $30 million to spend on marketing. And I bring that to your attention simply because people say, well, why do we have to market DC? Because everybody has, everybody wants to come here. And it's not about who wants to come here. It's about who we want to come and who will spend more money. And a city like New York, where it's arguably people go because it's New York City, is spending significantly more. And in our efforts, we need to follow suit and be more proactive in getting visitors back to the city. So with that stated, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you uh, and anyone else may have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Ferguson. I do have uh, some questions for you uh, and I'm gonna begin it as I have all of uh, my uh, both performance and oversight hearings with a question around racial equity. 
uh, to ask you specifically whether there are any initiatives or, or allocations in your proposed FY22 budget that are designed to address uh, racial or economic inequities faced by district residents. Uh, to a certain extent, they are. I mean, in, as you look at um, what our what our interest is, is of course it would be tied to people physically coming to Washington, and to that extent, um, we have a special section on our website which we we uh, in, uh, created not long ago that focuses on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and all the things that are tied to coming to Washington and experiencing the diversity of our community. I think the key thing to recognize is that you know, there is this, this sense that the African American Museum the, and other attractions that are specific to the black experience are for black people, and that's not the reality. So what we try to do is we try to different, differentiate um, and, and promote not only DC as a whole, but also things like Black Lives Matter and the fact that, um, that protest tourism is now a thing and, and a reason for folks to come to the city. As an organization, we have a DEI team within our organization um, that focuses on um, our accountability. What should we be doing differently? How should we uh, be more thoughtful in terms of how I manage the organization? And of course, um, interface with the board of directors, and, which is something we talk about on a regular basis with them. And as a community, uh, clearly we, we focus on not only the attractions that are specific to the diverse experience that Washington has to offer, Black American experience, as well as other experiences in, in the US, in Washington, DC, but ways in which we can interface a lot more with the local community as we work to promote DC. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh, I also wanna you know, touch on the, the organization and, and just, uh, I mean, obviously what you do in, in, in MS DC and others directly impacted by COVID-19 and most significantly, I think, uh, those, those industries like hospitality and tourism, um, like a lot of you know, restaurants, hotels, and folks had shut down uh, temporarily, some of them permanently, unfortunately, you all have had to make some sacrifices as, as well in terms of furloughs and, and, and cuts to staff. Uh, I think you mentioned that you had to permanently cut uh, five uh, of your staff. Uh, how's morale? With, with the organization, generally speaking, and, and, and how are things looking uh, in the immediate future for you all uh, this year? It, it's been a tough year. I mean, I think that, you know, it would be difficult to say that we did not um, go through two, 2020 without bumps and bruises in terms of morale within the organization, things in which we could control. We tried to in terms of being extremely transparent and communicating with the team as to where we are, what we're doing. So whether it be um, pay cuts, which we all took um, and or furloughs and, and which we all took, um, we, I feel as if we are in a better place simply because um, as we looked at all the things in which we place on our team, we communicated the entire time. It wasn't just them um, dealing with, with pay cuts and, and, and everything else. It was the entire organization as a whole, including senior staff. So I think we're in a better place. And, um, you know, we, in addition to the DEI team that we have internally, we also have another team that is not made up of any members of senior staff, um, the employee action committee that focuses on checks and balances. So when I think I'm doing a good job, they're either validating or saying that these are some of the things we should do differently, simply because morale is extremely important as to, as to us, our ability to be able to move forward and do what we have to do. And might I add, one of the reasons why we were you know, we have 90 employees. There are um, convention bureaus like the San Francisco Convention Bureau that cut 80% of their staff and others, New York cut about 50%. You know, we just in the last month um, um, uh, reduced our staff by just five positions. And we tried to hold on as long as we possibly could because we realized that when we are back at a point where we can be more aggressive out in the market, it takes about three months to find the right person and another three months or so to get them trained to do what we need to do. So we were working with our board and making sure that we keep our team intact. Yeah, and just uh, staying along those lines, uh, you, you talked about doing performance oversight, the, uh, the, the impact that the pandemic had on your membership uh, as well. I think, uh, for instance, you mentioned, I think 93 of your member organizations canceled their membership and, and 37 of those businesses closed permanently. Um, right. 
we reopened on June 11. Uh, what does reopening look like for your organization and its members? Since I mean, it's, it's only been a couple of weeks, but uh, what's what's the sense you're getting uh, from from your membership? You know, I think a lot of them are very optimistic. Um, you know, I think that as we look at our due structure, several of them have not paid dues in over a year, and those dues have been forgiven. We did uh, reinstitute uh, dues by hotels um, simply because there was momentum there. And, um, you know, quite frankly, we need those dollars to work to promote our destination. So we, we work, we, we spend a lot of time on membership and partnerships, making sure that their needs are met, understanding what's going on within their organizations and offering as much flexibility as we can right now. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, there are a lot of new members that are coming on board um, as there have been some restaurants that have opened in the last few months. And um, we've already reinstituted, we've had our first in-person member event, which we do them regularly, uh, which was well received. And, and um, our connectivity to our members is extremely important as we move forward. I did wanna add one thing that I forget, forgot to mention. Uh, with, within the industry, as we talk about DEI, I now chair an organization called Tourism Diversity Matters, which is a national organization comprised of leadership throughout the US, specific to our hospitality industry to, to focus on all things tied to diversity and inclusion, as well as the Black Lives Matter movement. So as, we're, as I talk about the things in which we're doing internally and within Washington, DC, there has been a lot more that we've been doing um, and I've been doing as chair of this organization from a national perspective as we tackle racism and, and, and inequities within hospitality. Okay, thanks for that. Um, what's your understanding of, of the $5 million that the mayor referenced in her proposed budget with respect to uh, marketing uh, in those industries that, that you all represent. Uh, how much of that five million do you expect to get? Have you had any conversations with, with uh, any sort of degree of certainty around what, what you expect to receive on that? Yeah, we've had conversations with Deputy Mayor Falcecchio. Um, there's a meeting with the mayor tomorrow. I won't be there, but our chairman will be there. Uh, and of course, as Greg referenced earlier, Greg Odell, uh, the expectation is that um, there's a formula that, um, that, that we follow through our contract with Events DC, whereas we'll be able to spend those $5 million in tandem with the 3 million that we receive from Events DC to bolster our current marketing plan, specific to the three areas I referenced, the national audience, the local audience, and those, the 50 million people that live within four hours of Washington. So very optimistic. And you know, as I reference what other cities are spending, I just referenced one, but others are spending significantly more because it puts us in a better position than when we were with, with just the three million dollars. And might I add, because of the pandemic and our funding, which is 82% of the hotel tax, those dollars weren't coming in. So we have been significantly crippled as it pertains to our ability to go out and do the advertising. One thing we've never been able to do, uh, or at least in a limited amount, it would be television advertising, uh, simply because it costs so much. And you know, if we were to spend our budget on television ads, like you see in so many other destinations, um, our budget will be spent within the first three um, weeks of a month. So we're optimistic as we look at opportunities to do more of that as we move forward. The $5 million is a step in the right direction, but I would implore you and other members of city council and of course the mayor to recognize the need to spend more to promote our destination out of necessity. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you had a magic wand, when you say spend more, how much more would you, would you uh, recommend we spend and that you have the capacity to actually spend? Well, you should ask that question. Yeah, absolutely. We, there was a study done a few years ago um, that referenced that solely on marketing, we should be spending about $20 million solely on marketing and advertising. And um, that was done about five years ago. If we were to um, brush that, that, that data off, it probably would be about 25 to $27 million solely on marketing to be um, effective in the marketplace. And as you look at our budget for 2019, it was about 25 million with less than 5 million specific to advertising and marketing. It does not mean that we were not doing our due diligence with, with social media and our website, which, which gets a lot of, 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 of activity, but it, it, it really speaks to what we're not able to do with those international markets in which I referenced, as well as opportunities to, to do more television advertising. Okay, and I, I'm actually over my time. I see Councilmember Pinto has rejoined us, so uh, I'm gonna turn for, to, to Councilmember Pinto for a round. All right, good morning. 
Hi, good morning, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I actually had some similar questions, Chairman McDuffie, so that was instructive to hear. Um, so the $20 million number um, would be kind of the ideal, but in terms of this budget, do you have the resources you need uh, to adequately support uh, additional recovery and ensure that tourism and, and people are visiting our city? You know, Council Member Pinto, I would, I would say two things. One, um, the dollars that the mayor has put in the budget um, is extremely helpful um, and moves us in a direction that, um, that is far better than we were with just the three million, which was more than I had before we had the three million. But I would be remiss in saying yes to that and answering that question simply because um, I feel like we should be doing more. I mean, the data that the studies that are done in tandem with the CFO's office recognizes the fact that if we spend a dollar on advertising or promoting DC, there's a $3 return on investment. And as you look at investment models, that's a significant return. And I, I think that the one thing about our, our end of economic development um, is that a strong campaign will render visitation within uh, three to six weeks, which whereas other areas of economic development can take years after you have to build and create jobs and what have you. So there's a better opportunity as we look at Washington as a city recovering some of the dollars lost because of the pandemic by promoting our destination, by of course the attractions being open, uh, theater being reopened, the restaurant scene being back in place. We, we feel and the data tells us that there would be a stronger return on investment. So I'd like to think that we would be spending at least $20 million solely on marketing and promoting our destination. So, you know, we're not there yet. Thank you. And how do the proposed funding levels for Destination DC compare to pre-pandemic levels? Well, the, the, we are probably still about 40%. As we're looking at our budget for 2022, you know, one thing my CFO, who's, who's amazing, you know, they're looking at historic data and, and you know, this is what we should be spending. This is where we should be. As we're talking, uh, preparing our budget for fiscal year 2022 with our, with our, with our board of directors, it's, it's one of those things where we anticipate and or hope that these things will happen. You know, right now we're still not realizing the business traveler, which is extremely important to our hotel community during the week. We're not realizing conventions of any sizes. Um, you know, we're, we're in that, that, that drought, if you will, simply because we're happy that we're open, but um, any wedding, any event that could have possibly taken place in DC over the next three months are now taking place in Maryland and Virginia. So we're talking September or so before we start realizing perhaps some recovery in regards to special events and activities. And with Congress still not taking in-person meetings, that's also affecting us. So all those things affect my budget, um, as well as the fact that if, if we're not, if these folks aren't coming into the city, our members clearly aren't making the revenue and therefore that, that hampers their ability to pay us or to, to, um, to pay their dues, as well as partnerships that we have. So we're, we're basing our budget on what the CFO's office is forecasting not knowing exactly where we will be. We're anticipating clearly being better than we were in 2021, which was better than last year, um, as well, you know, as we look at the citywide business that's coming in uh, and the potential of us getting back on track. But as Greg O'Dell referenced, the international market, which is extremely coveted, uh, won't return um, probably until 2023, 2024 or beyond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the um, the five million dollars that the mayor proposed for events DC and destination DC, what portion of that will go to destination DC, or is it all shared uh, in a, a marketing effort? Well, we anticipate the you know as Greg referenced, there's a formula in which we follow Greg and Henry, his CFO, whereas we get a portion of the hotel tax. And, at, um, and there's a formula that, that we follow where 17.4 goes into marketing fund and we get 0.86% uh, uh, of that. We anticipate, um, and I, you know, I, 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 I'm anticipating this to be the case, that we will get all $5 million 
to promote DC as a destination, which all tides rise when we have those dollars. Events DC benefits, the restaurants benefit, the industry benefits as a whole. Okay. Um, so I see the $4.5 million um, in special purpose tax revenue to support destination DC. Um, is that level of funding distinct from the $5 million marketing effort? And how does that, if, if so, how does that compare to pre-pandemic levels? Uh, well, that the, the dollars in which you're referring to, I believe are the dollars, the, the um, additional formula that was added um, about four years ago that comes directly to us for additional marketing. Because I've been saying this for a long time that we should be spending more to make more. So in addition to the formula that goes through Events DC, there's a separate amount, uh, a percentage that comes through us through Events DC as well that helps supplement our marketing. Um, and with those dollars, a few years ago, we were spending you know, more than what we were spending four years ago, which was about $2 million on advertising. So that number will increase based on additional visitation and people physically staying in hotels in Washington, DC. Okay, and in addition to the added dollars for marketing efforts, how can we all support a faster recovery for our hospitality sector? Are there other lessons learned from other cities that they're employing that have been effective? How could we support you in this effort? In addition, no, I think to the key thing is looking, no, absolutely. I, I think, the, you know, and again, the funding, you know, for those that are listening, I, I you know, as a non-government organization, and, and a non-agency, but a Washingtonian, I appreciate the dollars that are spent that go through source through, for resources and sources that I benefit from as a Washingtonian. What we continue to say is that by marketing, we can increase those dollars, um, you know, even significantly higher simply because more people will come to the city. So there's that. So the marketing dollars are extremely important. The assistance with hotels and restaurants to get back on track because what people are looking at is that, oh yeah, the city's busy again. It's all relative. You know, the average daily room rate for, for hotels is still low. Um, we're still not realizing the, the weekday visitation simply because the business travelers I referenced and international is not coming here. So we're happy that we are where we are, but the realization is that our hotels and restaurant industry and others still are hurting and suffering. Um, clearly there's a job, um, there's a deficit in terms of um, positions or people actually wanting to return to the industry. That's a whole nother story in terms of how that's being dealt with. But I know that Kathy Hollinger and, and, and Solomon uh, with the Hotel Association and Restaurant Association are dealing with those things. So it's important that city council understands that we're not remotely where we need to be and there's still assistance needed to get us back to where we should be. Okay, well, thank you very much for everything you're doing in that effort. Um, Chairman McDuffie, I'm not sure if you're back I'm here. Just wanted to give yeah. you, I ran a little bit over, that's all. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, thank you Councilman Pinto. So, Mr. Ferguson, I want to sort of talk a little bit about the, the, the various industries that, that you all uh, represent and make up your membership. Um, and, and, and I want to get you to talk about how you approach your work during this pandemic with the limited resources that you have. Obviously, all these industries pardon me, have been hard hit, right? Restaurants, devastated. Hotels, devastated. Just tourism, generally devastated. You talked about sort of international tourism and, and, and the multiplier effect there, um, but but we know that travel is there's still some constraints. How, how, with the resources that you have in this budget, how do you approach you know, your task of, of marketing the city? And, and how do you allocate your resources in the various industries? Talk, talk about like how you and your board approach those types of things because everybody's been hit, right? I mean, some folks have gotten more perhaps federal uh, aid than others, uh, but ultimately we need them all to come back to really uh, give our local economy a shot in the arm that it, that it sorely needs. So talk about how you approach that, that work and, and, and how you sort of have these competing interests in the various industries, but I know you all work collaboratively. And so I'm, I'm interested to, to make sure the record reflects your thinking on this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, you know, the, the bottom line for us is that there are two, um, two, two tracks in which we work within. One, conventions, the large congresses that meet in the convention center, as well as the smaller meetings that meet in individual hotels and or places like the Ronald Reagan building, but still use sleeping rooms. And then of course the leisure market, which would be domestic and international. So our members are members of Destination DC solely because their expectation is that we're working diligently to bring those, those two tracks to Washington DC to attract more addition, additional people. International market for retailers is huge. As you look at city center, the high end retail, um, you know, that's tied to the, the domestic audience, the local audience, but especially the international audience. Um, you know, I've seen lines wrapped around stores like Gucci in, 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 in Hong Kong, which, you know, I, I, I look at that and, and say, you know, these people are going in and spending $20,000 each. That's what we want us. That's what they're expecting from us to attract those visitors that are going to come to the city of all types, even the eighth graders, because we love those students, but looking at all those factions and, and the key thing for them that they're expecting from us is just that heads and beds, butts and seats, people shopping and, and doing things and, and going, of course, going to theater. So, you know, our goal right now, let's, let's assume we were only focusing on the $3 million that we received from destination from events DC. Our marketing efforts with the local agency in which we're using is to, to focus on that, that 50 million people that live within four hours of DC. Um, the question usually asked, well, would you not have done that before 2019? More than likely we would have, but again, it's all about economic impact. Right now it's about who do we think is more likely to physically come to Washington? And that's the market. Those who are still um, not necessarily comfortable in physically getting on a plane or, or getting on a train, but will be willing to drive to a destination that has a lot of free attractions. So our members are looking at that and saying, if these people are coming, we know they're gonna eat in restaurants. Hopefully they're gonna shop. Um, they're definitely gonna to go to theater if it's open. They're gonna to go to sporting events, concerts, and all those other things that are happening in addition to the local community. So that's what they're banking on. Um, so we're using our website, we're using social media, um, and that's what we would have been using without the resources, with the resources, we'll continue down that, that track, but we'll also do more in terms of advertising and marketing, which is important. And, you know, the thing is, is that DC still has an image problem, you know, and I think that, um, you know, locally, we don't see that, but if, when we do what we do internationally or domestically, people still look at us as a government town, which we are, but that also um, look, they, they, they perceive us as not as appealing as other destinations. So they don't know about the two rivers and the things in which you can do, all the other things in which we talk about that attracts people to DC and the value added of coming to a city like Washington, because you're not, you know, if you go to certain museums in the daytime, you're not having to pay. And then you have more, your dollars can stretch more for shopping, for eating out and doing other things in our destination. So that's, that's what we're doing. Um, that's what we'll continue to do through social media, which resonates a lot more in, in some cases than other mediums. Um, but of course, as we see commercials for Virginia Beach and, and other destinations nationally, we wanna be able to do that as well to showcase DC beyond the federal experience. Okay. Um, and, and, and while the district has opened up, um, you know, the Smithsonian is, is, is open back up. Uh, a lot of the, the, the attractions downtown are available, but there are still some, some limited sort of restrictions on, on group sizes and things like that. Are, are, is that on your radar or, or, or any of the existing restrictions on the federal side still hampering our ability to attract people or, or is it just generally an existing reluctance given the reputation issues, which frankly, I think predate the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it definitely is on our radar. Um, you know, I, um, the Jalissa Marenko, who's a, the number two at the Smithsonian, is a treasurer of our board. We talk regularly about well before the um, before they they came up with a plan to reopen all their venues about the importance of reopening because unfortunately the national community thinks that the Smithsonian's are closed, DC is closed. Again, image problem. Um, but now we're talking about the capacities because that is a big deal. You still have to get a timed ticket, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. Um, I'd rather get a ticket to go into a museum at a specific time than to stand outside for two hours in the heat and maybe rain um, 
with my family. So I like the time t- ticket scenario, mm-hmm. but what they're now looking at is increasing the number of people that can physically go into the venues, which is as the demand gets higher, as we do a better job of attracting people to the city, um, we need to ha- increase, they need to increase the number of people that can physically go into the Smithsonian's. And I know that they're working on that. We've been talking about it as well. And, and there's sort of, there, there are these uh, ripple effects to, to some of these decisions as well. I know uh, transportation, of groups is extraordinarily important to, to our local tourism industry, right? Being able to get people on these large buses and, and get them back and forth uh, to and from their destinations, to the hotels, the restaurants and so forth. Um, you know, what are you seeing from, from some of your members or, 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 or just generally speaking, uh, how transportation companies have been impacted by the pandemic and whether the, the, the recent reopenings in the region are contributing to their ability to, to bring folks into the city? Well, uh, the key thing is as demand rises, the expectation from those transportation companies, we work closely with the American Bus Association, is that they're gonna gain access to group tickets, which is still being worked out. Now, the, the good thing is, is that, you know, there are amazing attractions beyond the Smithsonian's, you know, other museums, you know, Holocaust, National Gallery of Art, Spy Museum, I should never start naming them because I'm going to forget one, Museum of the Bible, the list goes on and on. But, you know, we've always, you know, when I first took over the role, I've been with, with Destination DC for 20 years, but 11 years ago when I became CEO, we probably would have gotten a D minus in terms of how buses felt about coming into Washington. We're not a large city. It's not very easy. People don't want buses idling on their, on their streets. Mm-hmm. Um, we've gotten better um, at that, but there's still some issues in terms of those buses being in to being able to ingress and egress throughout the city, as well as staging. Um, but we're working closely with them and with the attractions to make sure that they know that they're able to take care of their needs well before they physically come into the city. Um, no one should come into a city on a bus without actually having accommodations and tickets to attractions in advance. And so I have a part of my team that solely focuses and works with them to make sure that they're taken care of. The negatives that we're hearing, of course, is that we can't get enough tickets right now. You know, everyone's still um, ramping up and and getting back to business as usual. And of course, not all the Smithsonian's are physically open right now. So communicating which ones are open um, and what will open between now and August, which by then all of them will be open and making sure that the bus companies know what to expect. This is also a good opportunity for us to to showcase, to share with them other things in which they can do while they're in the city. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what we're also focusing on. If this is not available, then let's let's look at something else that perhaps was not on your radar that um, your visitor, the folks that are on that bus can enjoy while they're here. And let me turn to uh, Councilmember Pinto to see if she wants to have another round. Thank you, Chairman. I have no more questions for this okay. round. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, so, Mr. Ferguson, you, you talked about the challenge, uh, generally speaking, of, of the entire pandemic, and, and, and I think you said, was it 23 or 24 when you expect things to get back to, to pre-pandemic levels for you all? Yeah, specific to the international market. It'll be, according to the experts, it will be 2024, 2025. Now, keep in mind that the international borders are not open to come to Washington, to the United States right now. And I'm working with the US Travel Association as they're working with the Biden administration on that. But even with all that, with the borders reopening, there is a demand. So we feel like people will come immediately, but that ties into who's doing the most marketing, who's the most accessible. Um, and you know that's where we wanna be more, um, more proactive. You know, We're the eighth most visited city in the US by the international market, which shocks Washingtonians until I remind them as to where, where do you wanna go when you're not in Washington? And that would be one through seven. Well, we've got to compete with them plus other destinations. Everyone's going after the same piece of the pie. And, and everyone's also going after the, the convention uh, market. Uh, and you talked about in your testimony, the significant uh, economic uh, losses that we've experienced uh, through the pandemic. I think the, the number you mentioned was $373 million in 2020. Uh, this year, you said uh, 27 events in 2021 have uh, canceled, costing $258 million in economic impact. Um, it is, is now, now that we're, we're, we're open, and I know that there are other jurisdictions, obviously, that, that are 
competitive that opened before we did. Um, do you see any, what's that market look like um, for this year? You talked about in terms of losses, uh, is there anything on the radar on the horizon that is positive that you might be able to report since the June 11th opening about conventions and, and securing any? And I know how, how early on those things get planned and settled on like years in advance, but, but talk a little bit about that specifically. Yeah, the best opportunities that we have are not necessarily tied to the larger congresses that would meet in the convention center. We did incidentally have one group that's headquartered in Virginia that was pulling out of one city that wanted to meet in Washington um, in August. Uh, and unfortunately, because we did not have a plan for reopening, they opted to go to Las Vegas, uh, which was painful. But those are far and few in between to have those larger congresses. The best opportunity for us um, would be the smaller meetings. Small could be a thousand rooms, 2000 people um, in a hotel. But what's happening is that you're now, we're now seeing an increase in inquiries for smaller meetings um, as early as the fall, now that we're reopened. Um, those that would have come, but opted not to come um, or opted to go to Maryland and Virginia, not cancel their meetings. Um, now, as we're looking at 2022 or any other short-term opportunity that comes up, um, there we're seeing more inquiries in, in regards to those opportunities. So may not necessarily affect uh, the, the Walter E. Washington Convention Center unless we're fortunate uh, and someone calls and says, hey, we've outgrown a city or for whatever reason, we're looking at other options. Um, but we will see some, we'll realize some short-term bookings. Now, as we're looking at the larger Congresses, you know, we booked a major Congress, two of them this, this week for the year 2026, which sounds great, unless you're a restaurant or a florist or someone who wants short-term business, because that's quite a ways away. So we're seeing an increase in definite um, bookings for future years for the larger Congresses. And, and the way that you would approach the, 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 the funding that you have for 22, and frankly, let's talk about 21 a little bit more, because I, I appreciate the point you made you know, it's great to get something in 2026. And, and obviously we want to do more in terms of securing those larger conventions. Um, but the short term ability to, to market and get folks back, um, let, let's stay with 2022. Uh, but but like, is there is there something that you could share with, with, with uh, folks uh, in the city who are watching this that, that might uh, be more positive that might inspire folks to say, okay, things are starting to turn the corner um, so that when we get to uh, FY 2022 in October, um, yeah, I know there've been challenges with, with even hiring uh, with some of the, the, the members that you have, I'm sure in restaurants and things like that. Um, um, I'm trying to sort of wrap up your, your hearing on a positive note. I know that's been extraordinarily challenging. Right. Uh, for your for the industries that, that, that you work with, but I, I'd love to, to, to maybe um, give you an opportunity to talk about whether or not there's a silver lining. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, one, I'm always optimistic, um, but I'm a realist as well. And I think that the silver lining is this. One, uh, we are hopefully looking at this pandemic in our rearview mirror, because there's always that concern as the city of Melbourne and Australia just went through yet another lockdown. Um, which always makes me nervous when I hear about those things happening in other parts of the world and how they could possibly affect us. Because when we started this pandemic, you know, we looked at it and said, oh, that could never happen in the U.S. And it did. Um, as we're looking at the positives, one, there is a lot of momentum and, and interest in coming back to Washington. Um, our marketing strategy has changed out of necessity. You know, you, you, people, you know, organizations go through a five year strategic plan. Um, and anyone who started that in 2019 had to shelve that as we now have to look at what we're dealing with. So what we're dealing with now is an increased number of domestic visitors potentially coming to Washington, which is good news. Um, uh, the city reopening, um, people getting the vaccine, which the mayor has asked us to make it a priority to make sure that we are um, promoting people getting the vaccine, even visitors. And so that's on our website. That's good news. Uh, the, the opportunity to book small term, short term um, meetings is back and we are realizing leads. So we could see smaller meetings taking place in September, October and beyond of 2021, which is good news. 
Um, the reality is, as we look at all the good news, is that it's all relative to where we were. And that is something that we want, we want to make sure that everybody understands, is that even as you're looking at the increased visitation to the city, if Stacy Smith, my chairman, was talking to you right now, the average daily room rate in hotels is still low, which means the hotel tax is not going to be as, as, as realized as high, highly as it was before. And those hotels won't see the same revenue, re revenue streams coming in at, versus those that would spend more and stay longer and pay a higher rate. So these are things in which we have to deal with, but the optimism is tied to recovery, which thanks to the mayor, city council, um, we are, we're seeing that and we're realizing great opportunity as we look at what's happening today versus a year ago. Okay, no, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I don't have any additional questions right now uh, for you, Mr. Ferguson. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the record before we transition to Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development? No, I, the only thing I have to say is, um, you know, I, I appreciate this opportunity to share with you and, and with the listeners and audience and other members of the council as to the importance of what we do. I appreciate the questions you're asking about spending or dollars because that is extremely important. It's not coming to Destination DC just for, uh, for, for salaries, which clearly that's a small part of it, but it's really dollars to come in that offer us the better opportunity to promote our destination. And therefore the economic impact is, is the tide is, is higher for everyone, uh, especially for those residents like myself that live in the city that rely on services that you and your constituents kind of, kind of manage on a regular basis. And the, the last thing uh, for the local community is that Washington.org is our website. Um, I appreciate the fact that locals continue to use that. And I hear it on a regular basis when they have folks coming in town. Um, but I encourage you also not to wait until you have people come in town. You know, check into a hotel if you're in Washington, do a staycation and check out the website because it'll give you a lot of um, opportunities to learn exactly what you can see and do while you're in the city. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I say thank you so much for your time and, and for the audience for listening. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ferguson. Appreciate it. Next, uh, we're gonna hear from the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. And that office assists the mayor in the coordination, planning, supervision, and execution of the district's economic development efforts, particularly as it pertains to creating and preserving affordable housing, creating jobs and increasing tax revenue. Uh, DEMPED, as it's well known, uh, pursues policies and programs to create strong neighborhoods, expand and diversify the local economy and provide residents with pathways uh, to the middle class. DEMPED's proposed FY22 operating budget is $115.8 million, uh, which is a 250.1% increase over the approved FY21 operating budget of $33.1 million. The proposed uh, operating budget supports 91 FTEs, which is a 1% increase over the approved FY21 operating budget. The capital budget for FY22 is $146.7 million, which is a 91.7% increase from the fiscal year 21 approved capital budget of $76.5 million. Uh, with that, I'm gonna call on Deputy Mayor John Falciccio, who is with us and anybody else who's gonna be testifying with your team and say uh, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Chairman. You can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman McDuffie and members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. I'm John Falcicchio, Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, and I'm pleased to provide testimony on Mayor Bowser's Fair Shot budget um, for DEMPED. Last month, Mayor Bowser presented her Fair Shot budget to the council that makes significant investments in relief, recovery, and growth for residents and businesses across all eight wards. Over the past 15 plus months, the district has faced tremendous challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as the mayor said, the sacrifices of our residents and businesses have saved lives and gotten us to where we are today on the cusp of crushing the virus. This budget focuses on the pillars of an equitable recovery from the pandemic by making big investments in our residents and businesses that have been hit hardest. At our performance oversight hearing earlier this year, I shared with the committee many of DEMPED's accomplishments over the past year, including development of a historic $155 million of business relief through programs like the COVID-19 microgrants, the bridge fund, child care grants, and more. I'd like to thank you, Chairman McDuffie, for your continued leadership and assistance 
in helping us further our goals. I'd like to highlight a few of our additional milestones that DEMPED has achieved in 2021, um, starting with uh, the district towns at St. Elizabeth's. In March, we broke ground on 88 new townhomes at the St. Elizabeth's East Campus, including uh, 27 affordable uh, townhomes, which will bring exciting new homeownership opportunities to Ward 8. On Great Streets, uh, in March, we awarded $2.2 million uh, in Great Streets small business grants to 50 uh, local small businesses. Awardees include a wide range of businesses, including child care centers, hair salons, yoga studios, bookstores, bakeries, uh, just to name a few. On Skyland, uh, we uh, had an announcement during March Madness uh, where we talked about the significant progress at Thailand, uh, excuse me, Skyland Town Center uh, in Ward 7, including the beginning of residential leasing uh, and five new food service leases. Uh, and just yesterday, uh, we were there again with you, Chairman, uh, to celebrate uh, groundbreaking on phase two of that project. Um, in April, we broke ground on a mixed-use progress that will bring 79 new homes and over 3,000 square feet of ground floor retail space to 8th and O Streets Northwest. This includes 24 affordable homes and 55 market rate units. We also launched a new program, DC LEAP. Uh, we awarded uh, $5.2 million in grants to 13 businesses through the DC Local Equity Access and Preservation Funds. Uh, or DC LEAP, uh, which includes Neighborhood Prosperity Fund, Nourish DC Fund, and the Locally Made Manufacturing Grant Program. This investment continues Mayor Bowser's uh, commitment to improving food access, creating new employment opportunities, and stimulating economic development in the district. In May, DEMP had announced in collaboration with the Washington DC Economic Partnership and Johnson & Johnson Innovation, which will soon open J Labs at the Walter Reed campus, the launch of a health equity challenge focused on addressing uh, healthcare inequities in the district. The challenge aims to uh, attract innovators from around the world to submit science and technology solutions aimed towards addressing racial and socioeconomic disparities that help, uh, or excuse me, that have impacted health outcomes in communities of color. Looking forward to FY22. The mayor's budget for DEMPED includes funding for key priorities and will ensure our ability to continue to promote and defend DC values to further inclusive prosperity as we work uh, toward a more equitable district. The 2019 housing equity report and recent analysis of the district's demographics demonstrate how the district's uh, predominantly black communities face housing inequities like greater housing cost burden and lower home ownership rate. Our investments in this budget uh, in affordable housing will continue dismantling legacy of racially discriminatory housing policies and practices that have contributed to the district's current housing inequities and ensure both equitable access to all district neighborhoods and wealth building opportunities via expanded home ownership for residents of color. Through our capital budget, DEMPED will continue to make progress on our transformative uh, new, uh, excuse me, transformative large scale economic development projects. Uh, which are a critical way to create new tax revenue, retail, recreational amenities for our communities, as well as affordable housing. DEMPED's capital budget includes $52.9 million over the capital improvement plan for the ongoing uh, development of the St. Elizabeth's East Campus in Ward 8. The, these funds will ensure that all of uh, the project continues to, um, to progress uh, while that we support campus operations. Also included in the CIP is $55.7 million for the much anticipated McMillan Reservoir development and $24 million for the redevelopment of the Frank D. Reeves Center, which will bring exciting new amenities to the U Street Corridor. Uh, additionally, we've included $29.25 million for the ongoing redevelopment of Hill East. Collectively, these investments will help us to produce hundreds of units of affordable housing, new retail and community spaces across the district. Our capital budget also includes investment in our new communities initiative uh, projects. This includes $14.8 uh, million uh, for Park Morton redevelopment, $21 million for Barry Farm, um, and $20 million uh, for Northwest Swan. These investments will ensure we continue to make progress on these important projects in the coming years. 
We know that COVID-19 has had a lasting impact on our entire city, with residents of color having been disproportionately impacted. In addition, we know many of our businesses um, particularly uh, those in retail and hospitality sectors have been hit hard in the past year. For these reasons, DEMPED's operating budget of over $115 million will support an equitable recovery from the pandemic and includes investments to support the immediate and long-term recovery and sustainability of the district's business community. Equitable food access has long been a priority for Mayor Bowser, and this Fair Shop budget doubles down on that commitment. The new Food Access Fund a collaboration between DEMPED and the Office of Planning includes $58 million investment over the financial plan. This new food-focused expansion of the Neighborhood Prosperity Fund will provide investments to accelerate small, medium, and large grocery stores in Wards 7 and 8, including $2 million uh, in FY22 to expand upon the Nourish DC Fund to support small, fresh food retailers through grants, loans, and technical assistance. Further, uh, DEMPED's proposed amendments to the supermarket tax incentive program will encourage development and incentive in the areas of the city that need it most in terms of food access. I'd also like to take a moment now to highlight some of the work that we've done and the investments we've made to support the long-term sustainability of our business community. Our budget includes $8 million for a new uh, small and medium business growth fund uh, to support the growth of DC businesses, similar to how the Great Streets program has done this in a targeted in targeted commercial corridors. The SMB fund will support uh, grant opportunities such as um, commercial uh, property acquisition and uh, expansion to new uh, locations. Commercial ownership can be a key wealth builder for our local businesses, and we're excited to support these opportunities. We'll continue to uh, use uh, proven programs, including Great Streets, Neighborhood Prosperity, and the DC Anchors Program uh, with $7.1 million uh, in this budget. Uh, further, uh, there's $8 million uh, in a bridge fund investment uh, to support arts venues across the district as they continue uh, to navigate reopening, as well as invest $2 million uh, in inclusive uh, innovation equity impact fund to provide access to capital to those businesses that have traditionally prevented uh, or been prevented from accessing such resources. Chairman, I could go on, or um, I know we've submitted a longer uh, statement for the record. Uh, it's, it's totally up to you. I mean, if you want to get anything in particular on the record, otherwise we can jump right into the question and answer. Uh, the only other thing I'd mention is that uh, this actually also, uh, this budget proposal also um, uh, has a new uh, fund uh, called the Economic uh, or excuse me, the Employment Center Vitality and Local Job Creation Fund, uh, or we call for short, uh, the Vitality Fund. It'll allow us to uh, address uh, the job vac or excuse me, the office vacancy uh, rate, which has been climbing uh, pre-pandemic and was really exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, so it allow us to uh, attract and retain high growth companies uh, that commit to local hiring and purchasing uh, that will create pathways to high paying jobs for residents and new opportunities for a local business community. Uh, and this will also allow us to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion criteria into hiring and purchasing requirements. And this attraction program will deliver concrete new opportunities for residents of color. Um, so I'll skip ahead, uh, Chairman, to close, uh, to just really thank you for uh, the work and the coordination over the last uh, year. Um, and I know there are a couple other items that we'll highlight uh, as we go through the questions. Okay, uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I do have some questions before I jump into my round. I'm going to note that we've been joined by Ward 4 Council Member uh, Janice Lewis George, uh, and we'll, we'll turn it over to you in a bit uh, for, uh, for some questions or, or, or a statement. Uh, we also still have uh, Council Member Pinto, I know, who, who has an interest in, in making sure that she. Uh, speaks with you too during this oversight hearing. I'm gonna jump in and, and ask as I have, and I know you're aware, uh, a question around racial equity and ask you, are there specific initiatives or allocations in your office's FY22 budget uh, that are specifically designed to address racial or economic inequities faced by different re district residents? And if you could just describe them with as much detail as possible, uh, how they are addressing inequities. 
Uh, great. So I'll just go through a few, although equity is really the uh, guiding principle uh, for the work that we do in DEMPED. Um, and so uh, the first I'd highlight is the Food Access Fund. Uh, this is a brand new uh, fund that we would have. Uh, and really what we wanted to do was to ensure that more residents of Ward 7 and 8 had access to uh, fresh food option. Uh, right now, about 42% of residents in Ward 7 and 8 are within a mile of grocery store. Uh, with this fund and with the investments that we would make with it, uh, we could actually uh, make that grow to 95% of residents of Ward 7 and 8 being within a mile of that uh, fresh food option. Uh, we think that's important um, because we know uh, that 90 percent of the population in Ward 7 and 8 is Black. And so we want to make sure that uh, we create those food access points, uh, but we also uh, create those uh, affiliated jobs uh, that the, these investments would make. Obviously, uh, the mayor announced a really big investment in uh, something that's not necessarily in the DEMPED budget, but something that we work on with our partner agencies uh, in the Housing Production Trust Fund. Uh, so that $400 million is something that we're proud to work with uh, DHCD on in order to make sure that we're delivering more affordable housing, but also addressing the problem of housing affordability uh, by increasing the number of units uh, in the district. Uh, and then also uh, home ownership is another thing that we're focused on in DEMPED uh, and making sure that we have uh, more uh, resources. Uh, but as we go through the questioning today, uh, we'll be able to highlight uh, really a, a, a plethora of different programs to support um, our uh, local businesses, including those businesses owned by people of color. Okay, uh, I, I look forward to doing that. And I've got more questions uh, that I'm sure we'll touch on some of the things that you have in mind. Uh, I do, before, before we transition to, to some of the specific operating budget uh, questions, want to ask another racial equity related question in terms of uh, involvement of external stakeholders. How, how have you gone about involving external stakeholders in, in your department's budget development process and, and making sure that that people and communities of color uh uh their their voices and, and priorities are reflected in, in some of the things that you all have proposed in your budget so what we did uh in this budget process was before the mayor sent the budget we had uh what we traditionally have the budget engagement forums uh, but we also actually uh, worked to uh, have specific conversations about our recovery and what an equi equitable recovery looks like uh, with uh, stakeholders. Uh, that stakeholder engagement was actually facilitated conversations uh, that we had um, uh, in the months leading up to the mayor's budget submission. Um, and so we worked with the mayor's office of community affairs uh, to make sure that they were, uh, those conversations were representative uh, of the district as a whole. Um, and that we also had um, important conversations and deep discussions about how we can make specific investments in order to advance equity. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, and let me shift a little bit to uh, talk about your operating budget. Um, and it represents in FY22, um, it's $115.8 million. And that, that represents approximately 250% increase over uh, the FY22 approved uh, budget of $33 million. Um, I, I, I want to give you an opportunity to speak to uh, the large increase uh, and the sources of the funds that represent uh, some of the increases broadly, and then we'll probably have some, uh, some follow-up questions about some of the details. Okay. And some of those uh, large drivers, and I've got Curtis Lewis with us as well, uh, are these new funds uh, that we <coughs> put in place really to fuel our recovery. Uh, so with that, I'll turn to Curtis uh, to kind of walk through what those new funds are um, in order to help us uh, fuel the recovery. Okay. So I'm Curtis Lewis, uh, I'm the AC Fiscal Officer for, for GetPaired. Uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we have, the large portion of this is, is all, it's all federal related funding, right? So we have 57.9 million in revenue replacement funds. Uh, and then we have 24.9 million in, um, in the ARPA federal payments. So that, that represents the large portion of that. You know, I can go into detail on, you know, the line items that, that make that up um, if you'd like. 
No, I mean, I wanted, I wanted the broad strokes of, of, of where, what was represented in the larger increases. And so I think for now it covers it. I might have some more specific questions about it. So thank you for that, Ms. Lewis. All right, thank you. Uh, how, how many FTEs uh, do you, does your office have? Yeah. Uh, we have we have 91 now, uh, and the, well, we have 90 in the FY21 uh, with the an enhancement for the BRIA. We're going to have 91. Okay. And how many vacancies do you, do you currently have? So we currently have uh, five vacancies, hmm. and they're all in the process of being uh, advertised in order to be filled. Okay. Uh, and what amount, if any, do you have in vacancy vacancy savings? So for 21, we have 338,000 in vacancy savings, and that's going to be included as a part of the FY21 supplemental. Okay. Uh, can you give me that number again, Mr. Lewis? I'm sorry. $338,000. Got it. Okay. Um, the, the proposed budget includes 900000 in dedicated tax revenue. Um, what's the source? Uh, where, where is this derived from? And, and is this from the, the previously proposed administrative fee on, on developers? Who no, on property? no, this isn't, but this is related to the Walter Reed Redevelopment Fund. And initially that fund was a special coverage revenue fund. Um, it was later determined by OCFO that this was uh, more appropriately deemed a dedicated tax, uh, just by virtue of the way the funds are um, collected and then redistributed. So it's the change from special purpose revenue to a dedicated tax. So you're seeing that 900000 as a new fund in FY22. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I want to just ask, that, like, I have my screen shows three members who are on uh, with us right now, and I want to make sure I call you in order that you arrive if you're if you're prepared to have a round. Just checking with Councilmember Pinto to see if you. Thank you so much, Chairman. I'm going to wait till next round because I have Got to okay. handle something. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember uh, Janice Lewis George uh, was here, and we we also just been rejoined by Councilmember. Uh, Christina Henderson. So I'm going to turn to Councilmember George, uh, followed by Councilmember Henderson. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie, and thank you to our witnesses for making time to speak with us today. Um, I know this is a big day with the Senate hearing on statehood happening as well, so it's great to have everyone here to talk about this important portion of our budget. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, uh, I think the budget before us raises uh, DEMPED's annual operating budget by over $80 million, primarily from federal funds to be given out as grants. Um, my goal today is to dig more into this um, and to help evaluate whether we're allocating these funds in the most equitable and fair way um, to promote women and minority owned local businesses and workers. Um, and so I, I wanna start with the uh, business grants. Um, Director, can you say more about the 10 million closing fund? What does this do? So with the closing fund, what we look to do is to attract high growth, uh, jobs or industry, excuse me, employers uh, of industries uh, that we traditionally don't have um, a strong um, presence of to our downtown, to our central business district, because we know uh, that we've seen vacancy rates rise to about 17%. Uh, the central business district uh, is the economic engine uh, of the District of Columbia. And so we need to make sure that we invest in it. What we know is that from previous budgets uh, that the council wants more uh, transparency as we make those investments. Uh, and so what we would do is we would uh, have uh, uh, employers uh, apply. They would have to make sure that they do a number of things. Uh, one, commit to be in the central business district for 10 years, uh, that they hire uh, district residents by creating uh, workforce development in their specific industry. Uh, that they also do contracting with DC businesses um, and that 50% of their workforce be present in an office in the central business district. Uh, those are all components to ensure that uh, district residents, and district businesses benefit from those investments uh, and also bring back vitality uh, to the central business district. Okay, so does that mean, so give me an example of like a high growth employer. In the industry, so, we would be attracting. 
Yeah. So, um, like a technology company. So, okay. um, so we just, um, had an attraction, um, of a company called, uh, Moto, uh, refi. They're a company that, um, helps people, uh, with obviously refinancing, uh, their car loans. They're actually moving into the district, uh, because they want, uh, to be able to attract, uh, more talent. Um, and they think that the setting of being in the district allows them to do it. It's a growth industry uh, for them. They think that they'll grow between two and three times uh, over the next uh, um, few years. So that's an example of a technology company uh, that would be coming to the district. We also are looking at how we create an innovation district uh, in the Golden Triangle uh, with a focus on uh, digital uh, and telemedicine, uh, which we know is a new field or not just a new field, but it's a field that we really relied on during the pandemic. So those would be examples of growth industries, uh, technology, okay. medicine, um, and the like. Okay, and so the, the 10 million, so the funding would go towards the, 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 close, the closing costs, like what, how, how does the funding, how funding go to getting those? Are, is, is this employees um, doing recruitment? How does, how does it, how does that function? Yeah, so the, the uses of the funds would actually be for um, that employer to, uh, as an example, build out their space, right? So they want to do okay. um, a new office. Uh, they find uh, where they want to locate. They want to build out that space to build out their presence. That could be one of the uses that they have uh, for uh, the, the grant that they would get from Dempit. By taking okay. that grant, though, they then commit to creating that workforce development, to being in the downtown for 10 years, to making sure their workers are on site, and to also okay. contracting uh, with DC businesses. Okay. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Um, can you say more about the $14 million for the DC Bid Tourism Recovery Fund? I think elsewhere in the budget, this is described as placemaking and vibrancy investments. What all does this in include? How will these investments be divided like amongst bids? Yes, so there's uh, three bids that we focused in on uh, in order to help with placemaking. I just uh, mentioned one, which is the innovation district uh, in the Golden Triangle bid. Uh, that will allow us to attract uh, a real focus on uh, telemedicine and digital medicine. Uh, Southwest bid, uh, where tourism is so important, we actually have uh, an initiative that they um, are trying to implement where they'll actually have a shuttle, uh, an autonomous shuttle. Uh, from the National Mall down to the wharf uh, and along LaFont Plaza uh, to bring uh, tourists uh, to some of the attractions uh, between the mall and the wharf and on LaFont Plaza. So that's the second one. And then the third one and our largest investment is $6 million for the Anacostia bid to really highlight the arts and cultural assets uh, in the Anacostia bid. Uh, so we know about the Anacostia Art Center. We know about the Anacostia Playhouse the Smithsonian at the Anacostia, the Frederick Douglass um, home. Uh, we also know that there's new amenities coming uh, like Sandlot Anacostia. And so what the bid will do is actually tie them all together uh, with the $6 million of funding to create a real destination uh, in historic Anacostia, uh, really, really a marketing uh, effort to show that it is uh, uh, a very much vibrant and cultural uh, scene for people to come visit uh, and support the businesses in that bid. Okay, how is that related to the, the 50 million we pay for the bid transfer fund? Um, so this is a new appropriation uh, that would be specifically for the three bids that I outlined. Okay. Okay, well, um, Okay, so that this is a new it's a new appropriation. Okay, um, well, are, are there other plans for how these funds will be used uh, to require the, the creation of? Uh, I mean, well, not other plans, but are there plans to I guess support I don't know unhoused residents of of these areas? Um, this allocation is not, uh, or this appropriation is not specifically for that purpose. What this is uh, to do is to support the businesses within those areas so that they continue to make it through the pandemic uh, and attract new visitors. Okay. Um, can you say more about the 3 million to support the cost of hosting events in the district? 
Yes. So uh, each year uh, there are a plethora of events uh, that go before the mayor's uh, special events uh, task group. Uh, and with those come uh, uh, usually a bill uh, for city services. What this would do would allow for those events to happen, uh, but the district to absorb the cost of those city services uh, so that we don't put the burden on, um, on the event organizers. Event organizers really do rely on having the event each year in order to generate the revenue they need to carry out that, that year's event, but also generate interest in the next year's event. And because the pandemic really created a gap in that continual uh, programming, we know that they'll be playing catch up. So we wanted to get them ready for 2022, uh, for the 2022 that starts for us on October 1st, and make sure they didn't have the burden of having to pay for city services, uh, but would it be able to um, really focus on uh, the content uh, of their event. Okay, uh, my time is up. Um, so I'll follow up on that later. I'm, I'm thinking you mean events like like H Street Day or something like that. Is what you exactly? Yeah, like the H Street Festival right. is a good example. Um, I know Anwar is watching, and now uh, we'll call you to say please support that, so I don't have the city services bill uh, yep. to face. Thank you, Council Member Lewis George. We're going to turn next to Council Member Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chairperson McDuffie. Uh, good afternoon, Deputy Mayor. Um, I actually want to pick up a little bit of uh, where Council Member Lewis George was in terms of the closing fund. Um, so I, I sort of noticed within your budget, um, we're only kind of hit addressing sort of one issue that has been facing downtown, right? So we know in lots of the conversations that we've had with the downtown bid, it's not just about business vacancies, but also just like they lack in terms of foot traffic because so much of um, their square footage downtown is office space. Um, and I know that earlier on in the year, there was some contemplation around funds to help support some of these commercial real estate bu um, buildings that might wanna convert from commercial to residential, but I don't see that anywhere in the budget. Can you talk a little bit about um, what's the thinking here? Yeah, so we are still um, exploring that uh, with a various array of stakeholders uh, in downtown. What we've seen those thus far is that there isn't a real sound investment that the district should make um, that would actually yield the type of affordable housing uh, that we would want to see uh, with any sort of conversion. So um, the easiest way I say it to folks is at this point, uh, it doesn't pencil out because we would spend the most in those areas to get the least. Um, and the property values are so high for that use as office that it's hard to create an opportunity for housing. Um, there's also some issues that are inherent um, in the uh, properties themselves like the superstructures just wouldn't support um, a conversion from office uh, to residential. So right now, those property values, while they are um, really um, you know, in question right now, uh, they haven't fallen so drastically uh, that it would make uh, the economic sense to convert from office to housing. So what I've said to the uh, community at large is if you see a uh, uh, property that you think you can make a conversion um, and that the district should invest in, come to us uh, and we want to work with you on it. Uh, in the few cases that we have had uh, property owners come to us, uh, what they've asked for uh, is not in line with what we uh, do to support um, affordable housing. In fact, it's been uh, way out of line in terms of uh, what it would take to convert and then what we would yield in terms of uh, affordable housing. Okay, okay. Um, let's switch to talking a little bit about grocery store and food access. <clears throat> um, you all are proposing a two track approach to promote grocery store development east of the river, um, both tax incentives and then also capital grants as well. Um, how much of the 27 million in the food access allocation for FY22 um, was specifically intended for the redevelopment of the Skyland Town Center? Um, of Skyland Town Center, uh, there's not a specific, so let me just actually more broadly, not just to that specific, there's no specific allocations that we have for any particular project just yet. Okay. The way that we've uh, operated uh, previously and the way that we intend to operate with the Food Access Fund is to actually put out a solicitation to see what proposals come to us okay. for uh, whether it's small, medium, large format grocer 
or uh, restaurants, um, or even we've had folks talk to us about uh, kind of like uh, commercial kitchens or restaurant incubator space. Mm -hmm. So we want to see what ideas come to us uh, with a focus, though, on making sure that there's grocery so that there's more fresh food options uh, in Ward 7 8. But right now, we don't have any specific allocation to any specific project. We'll okay, do that so, through a competitive bid process. So I guess with that in mind, <clears throat> you don't have a maximum grant amount per project type deal. Do you know what it, does that mean? Like Correct. Yeah, no, there, okay. there wouldn't be. Okay. So what's the current balance of the Neighborhood Prosperity Fund? Um, let me check. I think we, yeah, I think we've allocated all of it at this point. Just looking through the team. Okay, all of it encumbered. Okay. So, um, all right. The FIS on the BSA subtitle for the supermarket tax incentive changes notes that there is unlikely to be any program uptake in FY22, which is why there is no uh, fiscal impact. Are there any projects that you all have in the pipeline that is likely to claim these tax credits in future years? Uh, potentially. There's um, a number of different sites that we've talked about uh, creating grocery stores um, in Ward 7 and 8. Um, however, uh, that pipeline is something that's always a little bit in flux. Okay. Uh, and when they would actually deliver, what you've got on, you know, remember, even if we said that we had a commitment to a specific site today, uh, it would likely take at least 18 months uh, for us to deliver on, especially like a large format grocer. We were just out at uh, Skyland yesterday, as an example, um, and they've already done the site prep uh, for the new Lidl, 30,000 square foot store, um, and they think it'll take at least a year for them to deliver. Uh, so that's why you see that lag in when we would actually need the tax incentive. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't need the grant funding, though, up front, because they would need that in order to close. And then the commitment on the tax incentive is later uh, in the sort of that financial plan of each project. Okay. In terms of dollars, like what's the potential value of the tax incentive annually? Like, um, are we foregoing all property taxes? Is there a cap in terms of the value here? <clears throat> um, let me get, let me just take a look at this to make sure. So what we think that um, we know actually from past performance uh, that it equals uh, in FY 2020, there were about eight supermarkets uh, that received uh, real property tax abatements equaling uh, $2.5 million. Um, what we also do with this uh, BSA um, language is we uh, change and make it more clear that which census tracts are eligible for it um, and make sure that they're more focused on areas that um, have uh, food inequities. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm definitely in favor of that. I, I talked a lot last year about the student market tax incentive and how in 20 years, you know, we've had this out there, um, but it hasn't really yielded what we have anticipated, particularly in wards five, seven, and eight, and perhaps that we need to sort of focus in our attention. <clears throat> I'm just really interested here in terms of like, are we offering the right grouping of incentives to really get a developer to um, want to invest because the cost of building a grocery store in the district, as you know, is not the same as if we were going to do it on, you know, 16 acres of land where you can just build up and you don't have to build down um, in order to capture. And so I just want to make sure that um, this is actually worthwhile, but that also we are doing the proper expectation setting for those communities around that there's still some work to be done. Um, but my time is up on this particular round. Well, and if I may, Chairman, too, I, I would say that um, the incentives um, are a signal to the market. The food access fund are a signal to the market. Um, even the Washington, D.C., uh, excuse me, reopen Washington, D.C. Alcohol Amendment Act, uh, which I know sits in this committee, um, that is a signal to the market, too, uh, all of, because it offers another incentive to supermarkets. So all of those together signal to the market that the district is being aggressive about attracting uh, grocers. And so we think having that toolbox, uh, having that toolkit uh, all as one will be what uh, allows us to make a real impact. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. 
Uh, Debbie, man, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, $5.3 million in local funds to support the district's real estate development and project investments. Can you uh, talk about what that is and whether there, there are specific investments and specific projects that you've identified uh, for this? I'm sorry, Chairman, which one is that? Uh, it's it's $5.3 million to support the district's real estate development and project investments. Uh, this is under the mayor's, uh, I don't have a specific page. Chris, do you see that? No. The, um, Mr. Chairman, what, what exactly are you looking at? This was actually in the summary that is provided. I'm gonna skip that for, for the time being. I don't wanna waste too much time. We got okay. to move to... Um, Chairman, what page of that summary are you on? Do you know? Let me see if I can get it for you quickly. Okay. It's B85. Within the narrative? Yeah, uh, within the narrative. I see that mid page. Let me, can we come back to that, Chairman? Okay. And then right. your budget includes, and you referenced in, in your earlier testimony, but I want to talk a little bit more about um, this uh, in the capital budget $44 million in 22 for St. Elizabeth. Uh, what types of activities is this going to support? And Chairman, I've got Sarosh Okabwa on with us too. Okay. So I'm going to ask him to just kind of go through what the St. Elizabeth capital uh, investment will support. Thank you. Yeah, Chairman, you can't hear me. We can't hear it. Uh, Chairman uh, Sarosh is coming to the virtual table. Okay. And Sarosh, we're answering the uh, <coughs> capital budget for St. Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. Um, so for St. Elizabeth, the capital budget is primarily going to be covering the infrastructure related to uh, the hospital. And Still having a little, a little trouble hearing you. Stabilization. I don't know if it's just maybe you're away from the mic. I got my earbuds on. Sorry about that. Oh, that's better. Much better. Uh, the, um, the infrastructure related to the hospital, as well as uh, stabilization um, of some of the historic properties and uh, infrastructure related to the um, continued infrastructure related to the what we're calling the southern part of the campus, which includes uh, phase one, as well as uh, parts of phase two, that's going to be parcel 15 um, and parcel 13. Okay. What about uh, uh, while you're here, um, uh, the district towns at St. Elizabeth, you have a sense of when the, uh, I think there are 88 new townhomes, uh, when, when are those set to deliver? So those are actually gonna deliver uh, by, by stick. So they're gonna deliver in, in batches. The first delivery should actually be by the end of this year. Um, they've already, uh, they have a housing uh, a club, a, a home ownership club. So that's being run by MANA and that's gonna help local uh, neighborhood residents uh, access the housing and understand the, the home ownership process. We really are targeting new home ownership, first time home, home buyers. Um, and uh, once it starts delivering by the end of this year, the remainder will just continue on a cycle, um, probably fully done by the end of, uh, or, or to the middle of next year. Okay, well, what about uh, the Reeves Center? There, there's um, I think $24 million in the capital uh, budget for fiscal years 22 and 
Uh, I think it's five million and nineteen million respectively for twenty two and twenty three. Right. So the Reef Center. Oh, I apologize. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to really interested in the FY twenty two. What, what, what kinds of things is that? Going to be so, yeah, primarily in the Reef Center, there's there's three major uh, infrastructure assets. Uh, one with Octo and one with DDOT and then, well, two, but they're connected with uh, basically uh, heavy electricity. I don't know how else to describe it. And so primarily that funding is going to be for the engineering design and um, analysis of what to do with that infrastructure, with those assets, and then determining um, how, to how to move them, whether to move them either on site or to another site. And so given the... Um, uh, you know, given the uh, the reliability and the criticality of those elements, um, it's just going to take a little bit more um, engineering and design on the front end that, than we would normally see in our projects. Let's see how you all are thinking about this. A, a number of witnesses testified at the committee's uh, public witnesses hearing on June 3rd. Uh, in support for uh, an LGBTQ community center, which, which as you all know, is currently in the Reeves Center. Uh, I noticed that $1 million is allocated in your uh, FY22 proposed budget to support the build out of a new office uh, for the LGBTQ center. Can you say more about this project and specifically has a location been identified? Um, are there any steps that you can, you can share with us today? Sure, um, I'll uh, start us off and then Saroj can jump in uh, if needed. The, um, you know, DEMPED, when we do a solicitation and there's uh, an active lease uh, within that uh, site, we always honor that lease. We either have uh, the uh, team that wins uh, needs to either bring um, uh, that uh, use back to the site or needs to find a, a accommodation uh, for that user. Um, and so in this particular case, what we wanted to signal uh, to uh, this particular user uh, was that we wanted to signal a commitment uh, of a million dollars so that they could uh, start planning, uh, because I know that they were interested in having kind of their own uh, standalone space. Um, and so what we um, have done is uh, put in $1 million. Uh, we know that their request uh, is larger. What we do also expect is that uh, in the errata letter, uh, that we would also make it clear that this should be um, uh, available as a grant uh, to the specific user um, in order for them to begin their planning process um, and so that they can use it potentially even to purchase uh, or make a down payment on the purchase of uh, a new site if that's the um, um, kind of the approach they want to take. Okay, let me check in with uh, Councilman. Pinto again, I don't see any. I'm gonna turn. I'm here, Chairman. Okay, I'm gonna turn to you if you're ready for your round. Sure. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna start with a discussion around great streets. Um, initially in the mayor's budget presentation to the council prior to the formal hearing, it looked like Great Streets was increased about $8 million because it was looped in with the arts venues. But then in looking at the line items, it looks like the Great Streets initiative was reduced by $265,000. Um, in fiscal year 2020, over $9 million was allocated to the program. Uh, and was reduced to about seven and a half million in fiscal year 2021, and now is reduced to 7.1 million in 2022. So can you shed some light on this reduction and why the reduction is warranted, um, considering the substantial need of so many small businesses this year? Wait, I'm sorry. Um, Councilmember, could you hear Samangwe Cook? I cannot. Okay. Okay, she's trying to. How about that? A little bit. Is 
I heard you say, how about that? <laughs> so, so while Simang Lei tries to uh, join the virtual uh, witness table as well, uh, it's not a uh, reduction. We actually have uh, 200K uh, that was added to another line uh, of the budget. Uh, so it's flat uh, for green streets. Okay. And what line of the budget was that? So th this is the anchor partnership that was a component of the um, of Great Streets and FY21 is now in the real estate development line item. It's 200, that's $200,000 there. Um, if you're seeing Great Streets at being um, 7.3, there was also 100,000 in the New York Avenue retail that was one time. So between those two reductions, um, you're, you're flat for FY21, FY22. Great streets. I see. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That is um, good to hear. Although part of the um, budget seems to expand eligible businesses to include businesses that are on a parcel lot or square abutting several existing retail priority areas. And I uh, am in agreement that we need to expand eligibility. We introduced a bill to expand eligibility for Great Streets to Ward 2 corridors, which is the only ward in the city that is not currently eligible. Um, but if we're expanding eligibility, shouldn't we be also increasing funding so as not to dilute the other areas? Um, so Spongley's having a little bit of trouble uh, joining. She's right here. Um, so, but she is close by. So she's trying to get to the virtual table. Um, I would say that um, what we've done uh, with uh, this language is we're making really kind of like a technical adjustment. Uh, these are properties that literally kind of just fall um, on like the opposite side of the street. Um, so it's not like greatly expanding the geography uh, that much. Uh, it, it's actually doing it in a way that just sort of incorporates that like one side of a retail corridor isn't in a great street and the other side is not. And so that's what this attempts to address. And so that's why the uh, funding is, uh, you know, remains the same uh, because it's really just kind of a technical adjustment. Okay, thank you so much. That makes sense. Um, so there's a $556,000 line item for business retention, expansion, and attraction. Is this distinct from the $30 million investment to bring back downtown? And how are you thinking about breaking down that funding um, specifically to attract new businesses. I know you spoke to Councilmember Henderson um, and Lois George about some of the uh, application requirements for those businesses, but how is DEMPED going to be affirmatively attracting those businesses? Yes. So now can you hear me? Yes. We lost you again. All right, council member. I'm gonna jump back in. Okay, so, uh, sorry, the so funds you're, it's okay. It's, we've gotten this far in the pandemic. We'll, uh, we'll get through this budget hearing as well. Um, right. So the funds you're talking about is uh, the business uh, retention um, uh, and uh, attraction uh, funding that we have. What that funding actually addresses is uh, really the infrastructure. Uh, so both the staffing um, as well as uh, some different like marketing tools for us to actually do that outreach. So it kind of goes hand in hand with the Vitality Fund to make sure that when we have that uh, funding available through the Vitality Fund uh, to really support uh, the uh, retention and attraction of new businesses uh, to uh, the Central Business District that we actually have the staffing to go out and find those opportunities. Um, and so that's what that additional $2 million over the course of the plan uh, is for. Okay. And, you know, for the, you know, I've heard different numbers, somewhere between 300 and 400 businesses that have closed uh, throughout the city. Are there opportunities for those businesses to get reopened or to access some of these grant opportunities in a similar fashion to 
new businesses that hadn't previously been operating in the District of Columbia? Yes. So there are um, a couple ways to do that. One, uh, a new approach that we have is the Small Business uh, Technical Assistance Hub. Uh, so we're excited that we'd actually be able to make sure that our businesses know how to kind of navigate uh, both loans and other uh, grants that might be available uh, to them. Um, so that's the technical assistance hub, which is really important uh, for us to, to fund this year. Um, we also have um, another uh, uh, allocation from the federal government uh, that is the state small business uh, credit initiative. So Sabangle has joined us. So I'm gonna ask her to kind of walk through uh, what that means for our businesses. All right, now can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Welcome. Welcome, I'm here. Okay, so as the deputy mayor mentioned, one is the technical assistance hub. I think um, I think you guys have heard a, a lot about what that hub is. Just to kind of repeat again, that's a coordinating uh, a coordination of technical uh, and coaching assistance for existing TA providers to offer some of the most general to the most a highly specialized kinds of assistance for businesses. Uh, and this is with our existing TA providers while also understanding what we're missing and incorporating even new TAs. And so that's a hub and spoke model uh, that will be managed by kind of like a quarterback as we talk about the kinds of assistance that small businesses need, regardless of boundaries, wherever you live, it doesn't matter, or wherever that business is, right? And so, and that also uh, allows us to plus up or uh, support our TA providers in making sure that they have the capacity to, to meet the demand and the need of not only those existing businesses that are tech savvy, but those that are not, um, our disability community, our aging population, all of those, those that are low tech as well. And so that TA hub is, is a really exciting element that, we're, that, that we really want to continue to advance uh, to ensure that a lot of the businesses that we recognize we're not able to apply for some of these dollars um, uh, over the last 15 months, that they are ready, that they're relief ready, they're grant ready, they're ready for any grant, whether it's from the district or from the federal or anywhere else. And so that's really the goal that we wanna keep in mind is thinking about how we coordinate those services and uh, demonstrate our impact and also uh, helping those businesses with exactly what they need. Um, the other element that the deputy mayor mentioned was uh, for short, the SSBCI, uh, credit initiative through the Department of Insurance, uh, Securities and Banking. And there are a variety of uh, assistance for those businesses, whether it's collateral, uh, collateral support or loan assistance, uh, operational uh, uh, reserves and cash uh, to help those businesses as well. In addition to um, also the small and medium business uh, fund that is also here in the budget. That's kind of like our um, how do I say it? It's like our great streets adjacent, if you will. So these are, this is specifically, as everyone is, is fully aware, great streets is a suite of different funds that's specific to, uh, you know, corridors and boundaries for retail, for uh, neighborhood prosperity fund. It's specifically designed to support uh, our commercial corridors where private dollars are slow to invest. So we, the, the city becomes a catalytic investment to spur more private dollars in those areas. This is the companion to that. So the SMB fund is specific to that, if that makes sense. And so that is supposed to help us not only support capital improvement, but rent relief, uh, even uh, you know tech improvements. But the most exciting part of that SMB growth program is the commercial acquisition element as well. And so as we talk about, you know, how we want to reduce the racial uh, wealth gap, this is a building wealth tool, right, that is in the suite of the small, medium uh, business growth program. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for that additional sure. context. I am, um, my apologies, Chairman, for, for being over time, and I will see you all next round. Thank you, Councilmember Pinto. And I'm going to turn, uh, just before I turn, so the next councilman, I want to note that we've been joined by Ward 1, Councilmember Brian Nadeau. Uh, we've got a lineup, uh, Councilmember Nadeau. So it's going to be, just for your reference, it'll be Councilmember Lewis George, followed by Councilmember uh, Christina Henderson, and then uh, we'll go to you. Councilmember Lewis George. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> want to follow up, uh, start where, where I was, uh, where before. Um, there are millions in this budget for uh, business development um, from federal relief funds. 
Um, can you say uh, more about each of the following? How many small women and minority owned businesses will benefit from these um, investments and who will decide who gets support? Okay, so uh, in the fund, as you're, you're looking at the line items, when we talk about um, assistance from the, the coaching and tech hub, we're looking at anywhere from 500 to 1200 uh, types of businesses. Specifically, you know, as we want to work with those uh, employers, the TAs, uh, the technical assistance providers working in those communities um, that are underserved. Um, and so that does include women owned uh, minority owned equity impact, uh, you know, enterprises as well, uh, as we uh, again identify how we uh, increase the capacity of those TA providers to to do, um, you know, some more grassroots outreach and engagement to those kinds of uh, those kinds of businesses. And so, uh, larger looking at roughly anywhere from five to twelve hundred kinds of businesses that we look that we seek to impact uh, yearly. The Inclusive Innovation Fund. Um, that is specific to equity, um, equity enterprise, equity impact enterprise businesses, uh, and that seeks to advance anywhere from 20 to 40 uh, businesses uh, in early, you know, pre-seed uh, funding for small businesses, um, including technical assistance as well. So um, that's upward of 20 to 40. If you notice in the budget, that's a two million dollar a line item for fiscal year 22. Um, this fund was just closed, just closed uh, last week actually. Uh, and so right now we're under review. Uh, currently the budget is 1.25 um, and we're looking to increase that by an additional 2 million in fiscal year, to, um, fiscal year 22 um, by 2 million. Um, the, let's see, the SMB fund that we're looking at, and that's a small and medium growth mm -hmm. program. Uh, obviously, we're estimating that that will um, certainly create, you know, an additional 300 jobs. But as we des design the parameters around that, we would, you know, uh, definitely begin to think about, you know, the equity impact enterprises, SMBs, minority uh, and women owned businesses as well. So okay. that would fall into the design of what we would do specifically for uh, capital improvement, the rent relief, uh, and even the uh, commercial acquisition the ownership element. And in that same line, um, can you say more about the disparity study for contracting pra practices with small minority women owned businesses? I see this as a funded grant um, in, in your budget, but can you explain more about the scope of the grant? I think this disparity study is something we've heard from um, uh, business owners about, black minority business owners. Um, I've heard heavily about um, and many people are concerned, not only we're happy to see the money there, but we want to make sure the execution is done in a way that's actually going to be meaningful um, and really start to address some of the issues um, we've seen with disparity studies in the, in, um, in the past. Could you speak to that? I'm going to pass it back to the deputy mayor or our chief of staff. Okay. Yes. So uh, we um, initiated the process to get a team in place in order to actually carry out the disparity study. Uh, as you might know, we have tried uh, to carry out a disparity study in recent years. Um, that did not um, uh, come to completion because we didn't have the data sets um, available in order to uh, complete the study. So we've worked uh, with our partners uh, in government to make sure that we start to get those data sets together. Uh, and this next attempt at it will allow us to actually uh, get this disparity uh, study to completion. Uh, and we hope that that uh, completion happens uh, within um, uh, the uh, next uh, FY. Okay. So yeah, in the in, I think because it's happened before and it hasn't been successful, people are very weary that this isn't going to be done the right way this time. What, what, um, what is, what's different from this time than has been done previously um, regarding their disparity study? Well, I think the, the biggest thing is that um, what we're doing is building on the first attempt, uh, the foundation that we um, really set by understanding uh, in the first attempt what data sets we would need to actually uh, pull together in order to complete a disparity study. That process is um, already completed. Uh, so now DEMPED, along with the uh, Department of Small Local Business Development, along with OCP, with along with uh, really a number of uh, 
uh, agency partners, uh, we're able to execute upon the actual uh, focus on carrying out the disparity study. Uh, so really this is, uh, it's a huge uh, data project. Um, if you really want so to are we? To yeah, so is it that we're finding that we're going to agencies, we're asking them for data and they don't have it? Um, or they don't have the people in the position to give it to them. Like, is this a audit, when we're doing the auditing is incomplete? Um, like, what what's what's the breakdown that's happening? Because I'm worried if we use we start from the old we use the old data set that might not be helpful either, um, and we might be needing to start from square zero because of sort of some of the flaws in procedures before. No, so we've uh, learned from that first attempt uh, what data sets we need to really have together in order to do the analysis. Um, and so the issue really is just uh, uh, not having a centralized uh, place that we can go and just pull this from. Uh, so we have to do it sort of um, uh, agency by agency. Um, and so we do have confidence that this time uh, with the right funding and the right timeline in place uh, that we'll be able to execute uh, upon this and to make sure that we're successful um, not sure what the disparity study will yield in terms of its finding, but in terms of its execution, we are confident uh, that we will be able to execute uh, and bring uh, forth a disparity study uh, that we can use for uh, the purposes it's intended to be. Yeah. Um, and and what, did you, what did you say the timeline was going to be on completion of that? So we uh, had initially uh, been tasked with doing that this FY. Uh, we know that it'll carry into uh, the next uh, physical year, um, and we hope uh, that we will have uh, something uh, in the spring of 22, calendar year 22. Okay, and is there like a community input portion of it? Not like a community input, but like a Black business owner input portion of it um, within the study? Um, there was you know that uh, uh, your, your time has expired. So oh, I'm so sorry. Might, I didn't see that. Okay. Uh, uh, the deputy mayor respond to the last question. Uh, no, there is actually engagement on the front end too, uh, in uh, going from the first attempt to this uh, second attempt at the disparity study, um, and so we expect that that engagement will continue throughout the process. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis George. Uh, next, we've got Councilmember Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chairperson McDuffie. Um, Deputy Mayor, I, I just want to clarify in terms of a question that Councilmember McDuffie asked you earlier about the LGBTQ Center uh, capital funds. Did I hear you right that the one million is for the future development on the Reeves site, or is the one million something that could be used for a new site someplace else? Yeah. So what we envision it as, and um, although it's capital dollars now, what we hope to have in the errata letter, uh, which I know the Office of the City Administrator is uh, wrapping up and getting ready to send, is to actually make that a grant. Uh, and then the center would actually be able to uh, determine if uh, where it wants to be located. Uh, it also does have a right to return to the Reef Center uh, because any team that wins at the Reef Center uh, would have to um, incorporate them or to make some accommodation for them. Um, so what this does is actually allows them to advance the planning so they can kind of determine that before they even have to um, do that sort of engagement with the team that wins. Okay, so this isn't funding for them to essentially find a swing space in the interim while the Reef Center is being developed. Um, it, so the grant is actually going to be somewhat flexible. If that's okay. the, the only thing I would say, though, is that the team that uh, is awarded the Reef Center would have an uh, obligation to provide that swing space if they wanted to swing back into the Reef Center. Okay. Okay. No, this clarification yeah. clarif is good because I feel like out in the community, there's an assumption that the $1 million is to... Um, only be used for finding a new spot someplace else and not necessarily with the right to return to the Reef Center if that is something that the organization chooses to do. Correct. Okay. Yep. And, and I think that um, uh, when we put the language in the errata letter, we'll make it even more clear um, that the intention, that they still have that right to be back and be accommodated by uh, the team that's awarded the Reef Center. Okay, awesome. Y'all keep talking about this errata letters. I'm like 30 pages because I feel like I got a lot to clean up. No, I'm kidding. 
I just talked to the CA. No, I was going to say, if you jump over to that hearing. I did. I did. Don't worry. Um, So I noticed that you all are dedicating 8 million for a new bridge fund targeted at arts venues. Um, How soon do you think we'll be able to begin distributing those funds? Um, We would be ready to go at the beginning of um, October. Um, We generally will put out both the NOFA and the RFA as soon as we kind of have direction uh, that the council is going to fund what the mayor proposed. Okay. And you don't anticipate there being limitations of it. If you receive funding from a previous bridge fund allotment that you won't be able to apply for this funding? Um, No, we haven't had any discussions to that effect. Okay. And your definition of an arts venue, what do you include? (laughs) Yeah, we've been generally pretty broad in what we would say is um, an arts venue. I think throughout the bridge fund uh, experience and throughout the grant process, uh, we've been uh, pretty broad in what we would uh, accept in the different categories. Um, and so um, I wouldn't attempt to define it now, uh, but it would be uh, something where we, um, you know, work to define that through our, um, uh, our RFA and NOFA process. Okay. Is there any consideration that you might potentially possibly use some of these funds to reopen the bridge funds to other hospitality type businesses, restaurants, hotels, et cetera. Cause I just, you know, arts, I think our arts venues are in a very different state than our restaurants and hotels in that for a lot of them, they still aren't, you know, shows haven't really come back. Artists aren't really touring. So I feel like they need this. And so what I don't want us to do is to improve this bridge fund. And then come September, you all change the description. Um, that sort of dilutes the amount that arts venues can actually receive. Yeah, the intention here is that the arts community is the, probably the, those that are impacted the, the worst because like to what you were saying, it takes time for them to actually ramp up. Um, we've seen that even in other uh, aspects of the Bridge Fund, like, um, like nightclubs, they've been able to kind of open up again, but an arts venue, it actually takes some time. So um, what the mayor's approach has always been is that those that are impacted the longest uh, should have a uh, different access level to funds. So that is our intention to make this for uh, arts venues specifically. Okay. Um, I want to uh, follow up on something I was talking to Director Odell about in terms of the CARES DC program <clears throat> and the proposed $15 million, um, for an excluded worker fund. Um, as I kind of mentioned to him, Um, you know, Events DC seems to be doing a good job in terms of the distribution currently, but the 15 million isn't on their budget. Um, why is that? (laughs) Or, or, or are you not planning to use Events DC in the future? No, we plan to continue to use Events DC. Um, we have a great partnership with them. Uh, so we would plan to continue to use them for it. Okay. Um. So is that something that need, that wasn't a typo? That was just a, how you all planned it, to do it? Yeah, it, I mean, in a couple of cases, what we did was it's in the DEMPED budget in order to maximize the flexibility that we have in order to make sure that um, we don't know, you know, between now and where we are on October 1st uh, could be a different place. So there's also funding, uh, as you all have talked about before, uh, for Destination DC and Events DC mm-hmm. uh, for really kind of our marketing and our uh, attraction efforts uh, to try to get travelers back to the district. Uh, the reason it's in the DEMPED budget is to ensure that we're able to use that flexibility to direct to either Events DC or Destination DC. If we wanted to double down on marketing, um, that would be possible. If we wanted to do uh, show incentives, that's possible. If we wanted to um, really kind of uh, make an investment in getting a specific uh, show here, then we could do that as well. So that's why that funding is put into the DEMPED budget um, and then uh, gives us a little bit more flexibility on the execution. Okay, and in terms of the excluded worker fund, um, are we anticipating keeping the same parameters that we currently have? Um, Have you thought about expanding the incentive or even just expanding the number of individuals who could participate in the program? So um, really, I think over the um, course of the pandemic, we've had a team that's uh, really um, actually the mayor's office of talent appointment, just because in, um, in this 
time of COVID and emergency response, we all sort of pitched in in different ways. Uh, so Steve Walker worked with Greg O'Dell, worked with John Boardman and a number of others um, at Events DC and within uh, this community of community-based organizations to really make sure that the, um, that the funds were meeting the intended purpose. Um, so we've kind of given them the flexibility to execute uh, as they see fit. Uh, with this $15 million commitment by the mayor, we want to uh, make sure that carries on uh, beyond uh, this initial kind of uh, response to the pandemic and as we get into the recovery. Um, so we want to give them the flexibility to be able to execute uh, the way they need to. Um, and so um, that's really kind of up to the community-based organizations and that infrastructure that they set up with Events DC. Okay. Um, I'm out of time on this round. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. Uh, Councilmember Nadeau. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Deputy Mayor, the redevelopment plan for the Park Morton Apartments has been part of the new communities initiative for years, and it includes plans to construct a new building for the current residents. This year, without any consultation with me, the residents of the building, or any community groups, the mayor's proposed budget indicates that Park Morton is no longer a part of NCI and instead will be rehabbed under the rental assistance demonstration process. How was this decision made and what's the rationale for it? I don't, um, Councilmember, I don't know where you're looking that says that um, in the budget documents. I'm, I'm trying to flip to that. Oh, okay, Deputy Mayor. Um, I think you know what I'm talking about here. Um, yeah. The mayor has proposed, and you have said on the record at various briefings that we're now going to do RAD instead of new community. No, the, I'm sorry, council member, just to be absolutely clear, uh, what I said um, and have said um, to you is that um, there is, I'm trying to find this in the budget book, Park Morton is still part of the new communities initiative. There's no extraction of Park Morton from the new communities. Um, in fact, what we have in the budget is uh, $14.8 million, which would um, fund a RAD if that was the direction uh, that the uh, community wanted to go. We also know that um, this has been, like you said, a, a project that's been years in the making um, for a full redevelopment. So we're still supportive of that as an option as well. We would have to level up the funding um, in the out years in order to actually execute upon that. So there's no decision, there's no unilateral decision um, to go to RAD. What we do have in this budget is $14.8 million, which would cover uh, the gap that it would take to, cover, uh, to execute a RAD. Um, however, uh, if the redevelopment is the uh, path that the community wants to go, uh, then we're going to be committed to, to follow that out and to make sure the funding is right um, to get there. So uh, once again, this is not the first time that you've sort of backed off and said, no, we're just exploring RAD, even though in the capital budget, it clearly says um, this will be RAD and, um, you know, it'll have to be rebid. So why, I, I don't understand the back and forth here. Yeah, so I think the, I, I don't know that, in the budget, it doesn't say RAD. I'm looking at the budget sheet now. It does make uh, uh, an error in saying that it'll be awarded to a new team. Uh, that's just literally a, a language error uh, that's gonna be cleared up in the errata. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that in the errata letter, we're abundantly clear that we haven't, uh, uh, we don't intend to try to um, find a new development team. And we also uh, don't intend to uh, just move forward with the RAD. Uh, that we actually uh, want to take the time to get this right. Um, and so uh, we're committed uh, to find the funding uh, for a full redevelopment. That's going to be in the errata? Correct. Super. So while we're here together, um, I just want to reiterate that the timeline for the current NCI development would have vertical construction closing by March 2022. Um, compared to a rad conserve estimate estimate of conservative estimate of not even having construction beginning for another two years. Um, and you know, just because it sounds like you know you're still open to the idea of doing rad, I want to make this case very clearly that in consultation with the ANCs, with the with the resident council president, um, 
with the um, other supporters in the community. Um, we very much want to continue with the original development proposal. Um, Rad rehab would not resolve our issue with needing the right size housing. It would just restore the existing two bedrooms where many of our families need three or fours. Um, and I'm curious about the funding needed because you know there was $10 million in there that was considered for all the new communities project, but now we're hearing that the 14 million isn't sufficient just for Park Morton. So what's the discrepancy there? The, so. In prior sorry, budgets, the 10 million. The 10 million. In prior sorry, budgets, so. there was a $10 million placeholder that was supposed to be for all new communities. Was it just that we hadn't gotten around to funding them yet? Um, let me, I'm going to actually ask Sarosh to come uh, talk to us a little bit about this. Um, but really, actually, what we see in this budget is a commitment to new communities uh, that we haven't seen uh, previously. So I'm going to ask Sarosh to walk us through that, because in addition to Park Morton, uh, there's additional funding for uh, uh, Northwest One, Ferry Farm uh, as well. So Sarosh, I'll turn to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman, uh, to answer your question, um, in, in last year's budget, uh, new communities was consolidated into one line item. In prior year's budget, it had been broken out into the separate projects. And so in this year's budget, we rebroke it out into the separate projects. So yes, you're correct that in last year's budget, um, which I don't have with me, but I believe it was uh, $20 million and then um, another uh, allocation of $10 million the next year, that was for all of the new communities projects combined. And uh, that included Barry Farm and it included Northwest One. And so what we've done now for clarity is broken them back out. And so this year's budget, as you said, has 14.8 for Park Morton. It also has um, uh, money for uh, $20 million for Northwest One to move forward with the phase two and then additional funds for Barry Farm to move forward with uh, finishing the infrastructure there and then going vertical on the phase 1B. Uh, you're on mute. So last year, $10 million was enough, but this year, $14 million isn't? I'm sorry, enough for, for what? But we Councilor, that was stretched. Done. No, that was stretched across all the new communities projects. Right, so last year, $10 million was enough for all the projects, but now 14 million isn't enough just for Park Morton. Well, actually, so, so $10 million, I'm sorry, this $10 million last year, um, again, first of all, last year also was, was a particularly difficult budget. We actually, uh, we, we've submitted the budget, I think three times. And by the third time, we'd, we'd cut the numbers significantly for a lot of projects. So what was ideal was not necessarily what was in the budget, it was, it was really just, basically what we could get. Um, in Park Morton, uh, the, the actual overall amount um, was not enough. No, $10 million was not enough. Uh, that included just the ability to, to start the infrastructure. And so the overall bu budget, we would then have to have come back to get the remainder. So as I am now over time, can you, someone just tell me how much money do we need to do this so we can get it in there and move on? So in addition to the 14 million, um, we think that there's at least an additional 20 million uh, that would be needed to carry out the full uh, redevelopment at Park Warren. There's over how additional many years? Use, um, over probably at least, well, over at least 22, 23, and maybe into 24. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman Nadeau. Uh, where am I? Deputy Mayor, I'm going to shift. Uh, I've got some questions uh, about several of the capital projects, which includes some of the other new communities. But I'm going to I'm going to probably save that to the end. I'm not sure if Councilmember Renee Dota plans to do another round to wrap up her questions about Park Morton. But uh, for the moment, I want to take this opportunity to talk and ask about the. Uh, there is 3.29 million. Uh, for the Washington DC economic you know, partnership. What, what is that gonna to be to support? Yeah, 
see you. You're muted. Um, so I'm going to ask Sabangle to join me um, to talk a little bit about the uh, funding that's uh, listed out for the partnership. Okay. Um, so, Councilmember, you had uh, just asked about the funding uh, for the partnership and partnership. what that encompasses. And so, Sabangle, I'll turn to you. Okay. I'm back here again. Okay, so the, and you can hear me? Yes. Can hear me? Okay, fantastic. So for the three point, uh, the, the $3 million for the partnership, that includes um, not only our ongoing activations and activities that we have, um, uh, specifically highlighting attraction and retention um, uh, of our shop in the district, but the there it also includes an additional uh, at least three additional FTEs in there as well, and so that's what you're seeing in the uh, the partnerships budget right now. Okay, well, what do you know with the the three FTEs are designed to support? Is it some specific? Yes. Or? Yes, it is. Uh, that's specific to uh, attraction. So this is for our attraction and uh, incentives as we think about how we want to really. Uh, advance and increase our intensity specifically uh, as we talk about reducing the vacancy rate, uh, right. we know that we most certainly need to lay the proper foundation for us to continue to elevate that in a more strategic manner. So we know that it, having several engagements, uh, not only with the partnership, the board as well, um, that this we need that infrastructure um, in place for not only the partnership, uh, but as you're talking about the partnership, um, that is specific to uh, helping us advance that and kind of, uh, you know, push that, you know, pedal to the metal, if you will. Uh, so we can kind of, you know, really advance how we uh, approach attraction for um, businesses. Okay. Uh, what about the um, sort of along the same lines or similar lines, I should say, there's money mm -hmm. for the DC Chamber of Commerce, I believe it's $400,000. Yeah, so uh, still similar work. I know that they have been critical in uh, a lot of our work specific to international and also um, uh, even more importantly, our export uh, DC program. Uh, uh, also uh, continuing to do our ongoing engagement with small businesses that are members of the chamber, our state of uh, business report as well, uh, and a variety of uh, collaborations uh, around engagements that we have with the, with the community. Okay. Have you uh, had, uh, I know the deputy mayor, uh, perhaps I know, uh, has had, I imagine you two um, um, have had conversations with the Black Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I know uh, we've heard a lot from folks about the, the significant impact that the pandemic has had, obviously on everybody, but in particular on uh, people of color, Black-owned businesses. Uh, have you had conversations with the, with the Black Chamber of Commerce at all? Um, not recently, but I know that our engagement moving forward will 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 clearly be an increase in uptick. Um, as you see in the budget, like uh, as we're talking about the monies that are included in the partnership uh, budget, also the chamber in the partnership budget, there's also room for us to do ongoing engagement, not only with the Black Chamber of Commerce, but then also Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, as we talk about again, supporting our local businesses here. Uh, and how we uh, create opportunities, uh, more opportunities uh, for them uh, as we think about the suite of different investments that we have here that are outlined in the budget. So you, you anticipated my next question, but you have had or are thinking about how you engage the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you talked much earlier, and I think this might have been Deputy Mayor with uh, a lot of questions from Councilmember Pinto, I believe, if memory serves me, uh, about the bids and the $14 million that's in the budget uh, proposed for bids. Uh, I would like to get some insights into how you all identified uh, uh, which bids to uh, support with this funding. Uh, I know I've had some conversations with the various bids and there's uh, different needs uh, that exist. Uh, give me, Give me some some of your thoughts about how you all came up with this, these proposals for these three bids. Yeah, we really looked at how we can um, address some of the needs um, across a wide geography and kind of uh, diversity of kind of placemaking activity. Um, so we walked through it earlier, but Golden Triangle bid would be an innovation district really focusing on uh, 
digital and telemedicine, which we know uh, has uh, been something that people rely on more uh, and we think is a growth area coming out of the pandemic. So that innovation district, we hope, will be able to help us uh, address some of the vacancy in office that they're seeing uh, in the bid. We then go to the Southwest bid, uh, which, as you know, has a lot of our um, sort of tourists and hospitality um, um, or has a lot of uh, tourism and hospitality presence. Uh, so we wanted to invest to make sure uh, that there's something new about uh, the Southwest bid um, and something that they've taken a run at before, but weren't able to do it, which is this uh, shuttle, uh, autonomous shuttle that goes from uh, the National Mall uh, down LaFont Plaza, uh, really activates that a little bit more and then over to uh, the wharf as well so that there's um, uh, tourists circulating uh, through the Southwest bid. And then finally, uh, the Anacostia bid, we wanted to ensure uh, that they had a proposal before us in order to really um, kind of make it more um, of a placemaking opportunity uh, when it comes to arts and cultural uh, assets within the bid. Uh, so really looking at the Anacostia Art Center, the Anacostia Playhouse, the Frederick Douglass Home, uh, the Smithsonian, uh, and even uh, new amenities that are coming like uh, Sandlot, uh, Anacostia. Wanted to make sure those are all sort of tied together and that they can do the appropriate marketing to draw more visitors to support uh, the businesses uh, in the Anacostia bid. You just mentioned uh, Sandlot uh, Anacostia and I heard about it and I was uh, just this, this weekend I was at the uh, Georgetown Sandlot uh, and I've, I've previously been over to, um, I'm not sure what exactly the name of it is, but the, the Sandlot across from Nat Stadium. Uh, and I find it, you know, this is really a creative way to, to activate otherwise dormant uh, uh, sites. And I'm curious as to whether or not you all were drawn in on, on some of the early thinking around this, or was this just um, know, somebody who, who's an entrepreneur who approached the city and said, hey, you know, we've got an idea. But, but just specifically, does Dimpad support these, uh, these activations with funding, or, or, or how does that work? So really, I think the first opportunity would, to do that would be within um, this Anacostia bid. I know that um, uh, Sandlot has talked to the Anacostia bid in order to make sure um, that, um, you know, as they kind of uh, ramp up, I think they'll be ready in September or so, uh, that they are part of that uh, arts and cultural placemaking that happens. Uh, so what we've actually done is we have... Um, tried to uh, work with Sandlot to support them to figure out what other opportunities there might be, uh, potentially even on district land uh, to, to do that model again. Uh, and then there's other sites that are um, maybe not district land, but that we're in conversation with uh, development teams about what they're intending to do. Um, and knowing that sometimes the zoning or entitlement process may take some time. Uh, we've talked about concepts like Sandlot to make sure that it's activated. Uh, and not sitting idle, um, because that's uh, really what Sandlot is able to do, um, is to kind of create that um, little bit of vibrancy um, for whatever period of time uh, they're able to do it while, um, you know, that project continues to move forward. Okay, my, my time uh, has expired, so I'm going to turn now to Councilmember Pinto. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Deputy Mayor, I just want to finalize our conversation earlier around the expanded eligibility for great streets um, and completely hear you on it's kind of a technical piece for each side of the street. Um, do you have a sense of how many new businesses will become eligible with this technical expansion? Let me see if I can, if we can get you that number. I'm not sure off the top. Yeah, we'll have to okay. check. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so there's a $2.25 million reduction in economic development financing. Can you clarify uh, why that is and if that's going to be covered by ARPA funding? Um, yes, it is. I'm gonna ask Sharon to talk through that. Um, hello, Sharon Carney, Chief of Staff at Demped. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Wonderful. 
Um, so the 2.25 million reduction is the elimination of two um, one-time investments from last year. $1 million was for a grant to industrial bank and uh, 1.25 was uh, for the initial seed investment and the equity impact funds. Um, so we are intending to increase funding for the Inclusive Innovation Equity Impact Fund um, in fiscal year 22 um, to $2 million. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Deputy Mayor, can you speak a little bit more about the innovation district for the Golden Triangle bid and why you think this is going to be so important, not only for the neighborhood, but for our city's competitive edge in the region as well? Yeah, so um, we talked a little bit about it earlier. So uh, for DC, our um, proportion of uh, our sort of overall economy that is growth industry um, is really small. So only about 12% of our economy uh, is in growth industry. Um, you know, the rest, we obviously have a thriving uh, government sector and government support and um, uh, medical as well as education and hospitality. But in terms of like technology, um, it's a really small uh, portion of our overall economy. So the innovation district actually um, is a little bit of placemaking um, and allows us to actually um, uh, really find that uh, uh, west end of downtown, um, identify it as a place for uh, technology companies to come. What's really uh, critical is this is something that the Golden Triangle bid had put together in order to ensure uh, that they could work with one of their uh, anchor institutions, yeah. which is uh, GW, to really focus in on one particular part of technology, which is um, telemedicine, telehealth. That will sort of be one of the ways that we kind of differentiate this innovation district from other innovation districts uh, around uh, the region. Um, and really create a sense of place for uh, that west part of downtown, which has been particularly hit hard um, by the um, office vacancy issue. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for championing that program um, and district, which we agree is gonna be really exciting. And it's wonderful to see this added focus of so many of our educational institutions for our young people to learn about and use their talents, not only for national and international uh, policy issues, but to focus them here on our local issues and needs, which I think is gonna benefit our, our city for years to come. Um, can you speak a little bit about the local jobs creation program? It's my understanding that some of the $56.4 million investment is going to be going towards local job creation and how DEMPED is formulating that investment and focus. Um, council member, which one is that? The this is the um, fifty six point four million dollar enhancement um, for local jobs creation. Um, I gotta see exactly where you're looking. I mean, the I knew I would highlight the Vitality Fund, which is uh, thirty million dollars in the financial plan. I'm trying to find where that specific number that you're referring to is. Um, cause that okay. sounds a little oh. bit closer to the food access fund. Um, okay. I will, um, try to find that and I'll circle back next round okay. on that. No problem. Okay. Um, so how many minutes do I have left this round? Um, can, let's talk about stay DC for the last couple of minutes this round. Can you clarify DHS's role versus DEMPED's role and what we're doing in the coming weeks to, address some of the administrability challenges that we continue to hear from tenants and landlords around people who've tried to apply to this funding and are uh, facing hurdles or, or delays. Yeah, um, and actually I do see where you're uh, talking about the enhancement, the $56 million enhancement. So I could go over that real quick. Um, and that is actually um, the first year of several of these investments that we've talked about. So it includes um, uh, $24 million for the food access fund, uh, the $14 million for the uh, bids uh, that we talked about, the three bids that we uh, discussed, uh, $10 million for the Vitality Fund, also listed as the uh, closing fund, uh, dollars for Destination and Events DC, uh, for Shop in the District, uh, for Business Retention, Expansion, and Attraction. 
um, as well as the um, creation of a tax commission. Um, and so that's kind of what makes up uh, that $56 million. So that's kind of a, uh, just, that's not a, a separate pot. That's actually the first year funding of those different initiatives that we highlighted. I see. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to hear about the inclusion of, in that sentence of the establishment of the tax commission. Um, is that the same as the tax reform commission that we passed last year? Um, yes. So this is, uh, something that, um, was passed last year, but also uh, something that the uh, district did a few years ago um, in order to think about how we sort of um, our taxes align with uh, the rest of the region as well as we think about sort of our competitiveness within the region. So excited to get that uh, up and running uh, with your support as well. Um, so on state DC, if you'd like me to- And Deputy Mayor, because we're about just about running out of time, okay. do we know the timeline um, that the Tax Reform Commission will start uh, meeting or be appointed? Yeah, so it would happen uh, really at the start of the next physical year. So in okay. October, uh, we would hopefully uh, get that started. Um, and really, we hope that there would be a short time frame uh, for that to actually uh, really have some recommendations in place um, as we begin our budget deliberation for the next budget uh, and as it is presented to the council. Okay, fantastic. We'll um, circle back on state DC next state. round. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Pinto. Councilmember Lewis George. Thank you. Um, I want to go to. Let me see. Sorry, give me one second. Just... Give me one second. I just dropped it. Um. I wanted to go um, to some of our Ward 4 uh, areas. Here we go. Um, um, and some of the investments that are happening over in Ward 4. Um, it looks like uh, in the Walter Reed campus, there is a grant. Um, there is a grant for, I think, $900,000. Um, and then there's also our Children's Hospital, which is getting $10 million for a parking lot. Could you sort of explain some of the investments that are being made um, with um, Walter Reed and uh, the and, and Children's Hospital. Yes, um, I'm going to ask Sarosh to help uh, walk us through this. Uh, the uh, grant, though, um, that was um, something that uh, Curtis had talked about earlier, uh, which was actually that the um, that used to be driven to our uh, that revenue used to be driven into our special account, um, and now is set aside as a specific uh, fund onto itself. Uh, but let me ask Sarosh to kind of cover that as well as talk about what's happening with children's. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor and Councilwoman. Um, yeah, so the, as, as Curtis mentioned, the $900,000 is a reinvestment, um, thank you, a reinvestment uh, fund that helps uh, fund some of the infrastructure and related costs uh, that are related to the master development that the uh, developer is currently uh, completing on the site. And um, as it relates to children's, uh, there is the um, uh, there were two $10 million tranches. Um, the second one is in 2023. And we are continuing to work with children's and finalizing the contract that will uh, allow us to um, provide the funding to them uh, as it relates to purchasing the uh, top two floors and the air rights uh, on the parking garage that is located on the campus. And so um, we're pretty close. I think we would like to ideally be able to close with them uh, by the end of the year, uh, okay. if not earlier, by the fall. And um, that will help them continue to make progress on their site. Okay, great. That's great to hear. Um, and, and I and I and I can follow up on anything else uh, for that particular area. Um, I want to go back to um, the Employment Vitality Center, uh, which showed up in the budget. How will this ten million dollars produce employment vitality? And what types of jobs, careers, and salaries is this? initiative intended to stimulate. Um, and, and I guess what I'm worried about is, is uh, how do we make sure we need the desired outcomes 
uh, how do we make sure we meet the desired outcomes and that we are not simply wasting money with um, ineffective incentives like like we did with the the QHTC. So, council member, the uh, vitality fund and the closing fund are actually the same uh, program. Uh, it's just listed in the budget as two different names, but it's literally wow. the same uh, program. Uh, oh wow! It's list yeah, it's listed uh, on because I know where you are on page yeah. uh, B eighty five. It's listed yeah. as a closing fund, uh, but then later it's listed as the vitality fund. Uh, okay. Those are the same program. So all the uh, all what requirements. You said okay. Yeah, all the requirements are the same. That's the same program. Got There's it. not two okay. different. Funds. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I see the inclusive innovation equity impact fund. What is this, and and what are these two million dollars uh, in grants geared toward? Um, so I'll start us off, Sabangle, if you want to jump in as well. Um, Sabangle is coming to the virtual table uh, too. Uh, but the, uh, this is actually um, something where we see that there is a gap um, in DC in terms of uh, the uh, capital investments uh, that um, our uh, businesses uh, uh, that are owned by people of color, uh, that are owned by women, uh, that they are um, uh, uh, really falling behind their counterparts in terms of their access to capital. So what this does is it actually allows the district uh, to make those investments. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Sabangle to jump in uh, and how this will uh, work. And it's already uh, underway. So yeah. I'll Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and for you, Councilwoman, so the, um, the Inclusive Innovation Equity Impact Fund is something that was included in our BSA council member. Uh, Chairman McDuffie uh, had included this in our BSA last fiscal year. It is designed to uh, provide access to capital to equity impact enterprises, which is a new designation, if you, if you may recall, uh, that is now at DSLBD. And so these are pre-seed dollars to help those kinds of businesses ramp up and get started. But then also there's a technical, uh, techno, technical assistance element to this as well. And so uh, the original uh, budget for that was 1.25 uh, million that, um, that NOFA and RSA has gone out to identify a funding um, you know, partner. Um, that will operate this particular fund. And so it just recently closed on June, uh, June 11th, if I remember correctly, or June 12th. And so right now, um, yeah, June 11th. And so right now we're currently, uh, I'm sorry, June 7th. <laughs> and so right now we're under, we're currently uh, in review and that is underway to identify an operator. And so that again is for those equity impact enterprises. That's a new designation that is, um, that is, uh, that is over at uh, DSLBD. And so again, this is definitely to support those kinds of businesses. We're anticipating that $2 million that you're talking about, this is $2 million that will add to that, to that uh, fund. And that we're looking for that to, to increase the number of businesses that we'll be able to assist between 20 to 40 more businesses that we'll be able to support um, with that additional $2 million uh, in fiscal year. Um, 22, anywhere from 50,000 to maybe even $100,000. But uh, the application, the, the fund, the equity impact fund is being managed by a fund manager. And so that's what just recently closed us to identify that fund manager that's going to help us um, invest in those kinds of uh, equity impact uh, enterprises, if that helps. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, we have more than 30 million set aside for the Commission on Arts and Humanities. Our, but are setting up an additional 8 million fund through DEMPED for stabilizing and reopening these arts and entertainment venues. Uh, 38 million is more than, than what we are spending on, you know, tenant housing vouchers or violence interrupted programs. Can you explain the need for these dual investments and what unique needs are each of the funds serving? So the um, $8 million in the bridge fund is similar to the uh, previous $100 million uh, bridge fund that we executed. And what that is, is uh, somewhat unrestricted uh, funding so that organizations can uh, continue their operations. Uh, so we know that arts organizations in particular are impacted the most. If you think about a, um, a, a community theater, um, once, we're, once we said, okay, it's, it's time to open, once June 11th came, 
uh, they're not able to uh, instantly pop up a show because they've got to obviously uh, prepare for that, have time to remote it, uh, sell those tickets. So their revenue is probably the last to come back. So Mayor Bowser's approach, and I know the council uh, had put forth uh, that there should be funding, uh, which created uh, helped us create the bridge fund. Um, what we have always been guided by is those uh, industries that are impacted the most uh, should have access to uh, that um, investment through the bridge fund. And so that's why we highlighted arts organizations, which will really be the last to open. Uh, all the other kind of industries have been able to uh, operate. And now it's a matter of bringing back demand for these arts organizations. Uh, we really feel like it, they haven't been able to actually uh, begin their operations, even though we're back to full capacity. Thank you, uh, Council Member Lewis George. I'm turning next to Council Member Henderson for a round. Thank you, Chairperson McDuffie. Um, w Mayor, I want to talk a little bit about State DC, uh, get a couple of questions in. Um, you know, it's funny, a, a couple of friends of mine, I'm sure you've seen the news about uh, California and uh, the governor there getting all of this national news for, um, you know, quote unquote, paying off rent. And then when you read the article, I'm like, wait. <laughs> They're basically doing what we're doing uh, by using the federal funding to pay off, um, you know, past due. Um, although, you know, the way that he's framing it is a little bit different. Um, what's your latest assessment as to whether we'll be able to include internet bills in the utility assistance offering? I know that at the hearing that we had on this uh, a while ago, you said this was something that you all were seeking clarity from, from the feds. And I'm just curious if we've gotten that. Yeah, we actually um, um, have had those discussions as recently as uh, the end of last week, I guess it was, uh, just to figure out how we would be able to implement that. I think we will be able to add it, but as you know, uh, any additional sort of add on in terms of um, uh, another option, another feature uh, yeah. takes time to implement uh, and takes time to roll out. Uh, so I think we um, will have both the resource and the ability to do it. Um, it's really just kind of mapping out how we execute that. Okay, so wait, if I'm already in the pipeline, like I've already submitted an application, yeah, that's what happens now. Or yeah. if you've already approved me, but you know, I got Verizon internet <laughs> that I still need to pay for. Are those individuals going to be allowed to like apply for a, uh, a booster, if you will? Yeah, so that's what we need to like process map in order okay. to make sure those who have already been approved, how do they like come back? Because what we do need is their specific amount in arrears uh, and like their account number. So we would need like more information. So we would have to literally process map it for everybody throughout the process. If you've already applied and already been awarded, if you apply and haven't been awarded, and then of course, if you haven't yet applied, but um, that's the kind of planning that's happening now to try to figure out how we can execute that. Okay. Are we contemplating making direct payments to utilities in the same way that the Maryland recently announced? Oh, that's how we have executed the program. So utilities always get uh, direct payment. Okay. I didn't think that was the case before, but okay. Yeah, so, um, so for us, utility always goes directly to the um, utility yeah. company uh, and uh, the housing provider gets the uh, rental assistance, except for the case where the um, resident applies and the housing provider never responds. That's the only time that that rental assistance goes directly to the to the resident. Yeah, and let's just talk about that for a second in the clarification piece, right? Because um, you know, Councilman Renado has been receiving these biweekly updates, which I think have been really helpful for those who are looking for it. It's on her website. It's a report that gives you pretty up to date information about how many people are in the pipeline, how much money has gone out, how much money has been requested. Um, what is the like lapse time that you all provide for landlords if they don't respond before saying, okay, now we're going to pay the tenant? Yeah. So, uh, at first, and this is actually based off the federal guidance at first, the housing provider had 10 days to respond. Uh, the federal guidance has adjusted and they have five days to respond. Uh, mm -hmm. so once the resident applies the housing provider, and we say that the application is complete, the housing provider has five days uh, to reply. If not, the um, application continues to advance uh, and the payment would go directly to uh, the renter or the resident. Okay, so what's the status of our efforts to set up in-person application assistance? 
um, is, is something that DHS or DHCD are kind of working on. I know that you all were putting out a solicitation to enlist some CBO partners in the outreach efforts and, and what's going on with that. Yep. So we actually, um, for anybody who does need assistance, uh, if they call uh, our 833 number uh, for State DC, uh, they're actually able to set up an in-person appointment. Mm. Um, so they're actually able to do that with a kind of a network of uh, community-based organizations that we have identified. Okay. Um, we also uh, would like to get to a point where we can offer some days where people can just drop in. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that we're still working on with our community-based organizations uh, and something that we hope to um, be able to execute. But the good news is that if people do want uh, to do an in-person uh, appointment, they can call the one 833 4 uh, and be able to get an appointment uh, with one of our community-based organizations. Okay, that's great. Although in some oh, I'm sorry. And that could be virtual too, virtual or in person. Sorry. Okay. Um, I think that's a good move. Although sometimes I, I, I hope that as your organizations, your community based organizations are setting up appointments with people, they are also providing them with a list of documents that are highly suggested that they bring. Um, Cause I can see a situation where this goes down like the DMV, right? I got my app, I got the appointment and then I show up and I find out that I'm missing half of the documentation that would allow me to get the full 18 months as opposed to just three. I'm with you on that. And that actually has been kind of one of the concerns too about just having pop-in hours yeah. is that most people probably won't know what to bring. Um, so we're trying to balance that. The good news, again, people can call the hotline. The hotline will tell them uh, what they need to bring and hopefully they're able to do that and then meet with the community-based organization. And the community-based organizations, as you know, they're great. So if somebody doesn't bring it, they'll make sure that they have another time to come right. meet with them again. Okay. Um, so as of your June 10th biweekly report, State DC has paid out about 13.6 million. Um, it does appear though that the total value of applications that have submit, been submitted thus far is approaching the 130, which is you know what we need to get to in terms of our goal. Um, how are we feeling about this pace of distribution that we're gonna hit that mark come September 30th? Um, because I, I'm not really clear on, is it, Funds committed by September 30, funds paid out by September 30, funds in process, you know, um, wh what's our what's our panacea here? So the requirement is obligated. Obligated. Um, correct. So um, as you know, uh, there's the back payment of up to 12 months, and then yep. there's the forward payment. All of that would be part of our calculation of what we've actually obligated. Okay. Okay. And, and we so are seeing, uh, to your point, sorry, Councilman. Yeah. I was just going to say, we are seeing that, um, um, you know, the payment process is uh, moving forward. As of yesterday's payment file, uh, we will be about uh, $25 million uh, paid out in benefits. So that, that pace is somewhat accelerating. Uh, and what we need to do is keep encouraging residents uh, to take the time to apply. Okay. Um, Councilmember McDuffie, can I just ask one last question on this and then? Sure. Um, my last question uh, on this particular state DC point is around the uh, processing time for applications. The 30 to 45 days, obviously, is, is a long time. And, um, you know, I don't see anything in your budget particular that is like increasing the capacity for us to be able to process that on a quicker clip, nor do we see it in sort of the FY21 supplemental um, like, how are we doing here? How are we reducing that time? 45 days is a long time. Yeah, so we've added additional capacity um, in the reviewers uh, for um, the application. So I think in total, uh, we've added about 22 additional reviewers. So we hope that that will help us uh, cut down that time uh, for review. Now, in our regular rental assistance programs, uh, on average, applications take about 30 days. Uh, right now, as you cited, uh, right now in state DC, it's on average 45 days. We wanna bring that at least closer to the 30 day on average that our other rental assistance programs pre-pandemic um, have experienced. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember McDuffie. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. Deputy Mayor, I wanna turn your attention back to something you touched on earlier, the, the small business, um, well, it's actually the small and medium business growth fund. 
Uh, I think there's $8 million in the, the proposed uh, budget for your agency. And I'd like you to, to talk a little bit more about uh, this fund. And, and if you could keep your answers kind of succinct, I, I'm specifically curious, maybe I'll start with the actual direct question around this. Is, is that is a portion of that fund or the entire fund uh, gonna support acquisition, property acquisition? And if so, talk about um, sort of the portion of the fund and, and, and what you all have in mind there. Uh, I actually, in my letter to the mayor, uh, outlined a request to do something similar. And so I'd love to get your insights on this. So uh, the concise answer is yes. Um, and I saw Sabangoy pop up on the screen because I know she's really excited uh, about the acquisition uh, component. So Sabangoy. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Chairman, it, it sounds like we, we uh, meaning Dempe, the administration, and you are, are also very interested in this commercial acquisition piece. I think uh, we think this is definitely a, a wealth building, uh, you know, tool uh, specifically for entrepreneurs and businesses that are looking to acquire their existing spaces. And so, and this is born out of, you know, just even some of the conversations that we've had with our internal agency partners, but then also businesses in the last 15 months as we've talked about, you know, how do we uh, help uh, help businesses even uh, with the relief and growth and recovery kinds of investments that we're making, what can truly support businesses? And we've heard from a lot of them um, that have said, hey, if, if we would be in a very different position if we owned uh, our space. You know, and so, um, you know, as we've had these conversations and experience in this over the last 15 months, um, I think, I don't think this is a new thing. I think this is something that not only businesses have th talked about, but I know internally we have, um, but now is, is an opportunity for us to really, um, you know, create uh, some sort of investment to definitely help uh, small businesses, specifically some of our minority uh, owned businesses as we talk about, you know, how do we reduce uh, the the wealth gap um, in, in creating uh, wealth building tools. And so with this commercial acquisition, as you were asking, like what portion of this? And so right now we're looking at, uh, you know, anywhere up to maybe 2.6 million that may go into this commercial acquisition out of this $8 million pot. Um, but, you know, as we think about the design, we're exploring, you know, what as we, you know, try to engage with all of our stakeholders, uh, what does that design uh, need to look like? We know that obviously we, we want it to, to be born out of uh, ensuring that there is, uh, you know, an equity uh, element uh, and a foundation um, and that we build upon that. Um, but we know we want to continue to, you know, have further conversations about the full design of what that might look like. Also included in there uh, is the capital improvement, which I know I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then uh, even, you know, an element of that can be re relief. Um, and then the maybe like 1.9 or, or roughly 2 million that would go towards tech, uh, technology uh, improvements. All of these, again, uh, definitely, you know, leaning into our resident business owned, uh, resident owned businesses, our economic impact enterprises, MBEs, LBEs, uh, when we're thinking about, you know, how we deploy some of the dollars for the small medium uh, growth uh, program that helps. You said about two point, what was the number you mentioned now specifically? Two point, roughly about 2.6. 2.6, 2. okay. That, mm -hmm. That's, uh, what's the source of the funds for this uh, for this uh, $8 million small to medium business growth fund? If I remember correctly, I think that's federal. Uh, I think that's from our- enhanced American Rescue Plan funds? funds? I think so. I could be if my team correct. correct me, but I believe it is. So, mm -hmm. so, so just to be clear, there, there is um, because I had I had this question early on and, and wanted to just see if you all had explored it, but whether uh, acquisition of, of property is allowable under our funds. Um, yes. Okay. Great. Um, I, I, I would I would wish there was more uh, in, in that pot for, for specifically to support some of the businesses that like to acquire uh, their, 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 their real estate. I think as we look at the city's growth, even you know, despite the pandemic, um, th there are concerns about the rising costs that, that businesses bear, those that have been able to sustain themselves throughout the pandemic. Uh, I wanna make sure that as they come out of the pandemic and, and the city recovers, 
that they're able to stay. And I think there are some areas uh, in, in qualified census tracts around the city that we should be uh, uh, targeting to support some of these businesses. In other words, uh, proactively looking uh, to find minority-owned, women-owned businesses that we might be able to work with to, to support them in acquiring their real estate. Uh, and so this is something that I definitely want to follow up with, with you all about, um, because I think uh, while uh, the 2.6 is, is, is important to, to, to note that it is included in the budget, uh, I think there probably should, should be significantly more uh, uh, dedicated for this purpose. And so, so this is something that the committee would like to follow up with you on. And uh, Chairman, I did want to also mention that in, in thinking about the commercial acquisition, this 2.6 million, you know, a, a part of that approach is thinking about uh, an applicant who's looking to acquire the building and how we can support them in putting down, um, you know, that, that down payment, if you will, right? So if your total cost is, you know, $10 million or, or I don't know, $5 million, uh, that percentage is going to help you uh, put down that, you know, 20% um, as you continue to, you know, seek additional uh, resources uh, to acquire a space. And so it's not necessarily to say that this is going to fund um, your, the entire cost of acquiring a building, but potentially the percentage that, would, that, uh, that it would take to at least put down a significant amount uh, to begin those conversations, if that helps. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I, I was thinking, uh, uh, and, and I think that that's an obvious aspect of what, what this could be used for, but I, I was thinking a little bit more broadly, uh, inclusive of that, but also uh, where you look to acquire properties uh, in certain neighborhoods uh, where, you know, to, to be able to keep businesses there. I think there's some instances where uh, there might be some developers looking to acquire our properties that and might not keep some of these existing businesses because they're transitional neighborhoods. And I wanna avoid having, you know, minority uh, women-owned businesses be displaced coming out of this pandemic. And I think there could be a, a, a use for these uh, American Rescue Plan funds to, to actually acquire uh, properties, uh, either through working with some of the businesses or the city, I think, thinking about uh, acquiring properties in certain neighborhoods and, and not to keep permanently, but to, to work with those local communities uh, and, and perhaps some local investors uh, with the goal uh, not to hold the land as a, as a government, but, but uh, to, to help build some uh, uh, local minority wow. leadership assets in communities that uh, could be on the verge of, of, of transitioning in a way that, that displaces some of our existing uh, small businesses. And so, uh, yeah, again, I, that's something else that I'd like to sort of expand the scope of, of how you all are thinking about this and, and get your uh, thoughts at a later date about whether that's something that that is, is possible with, with these types of federal funds, given this is a, you know, probably a once in a generation opportunity to do something like this. Yeah, looking forward to exploring with you. Okay. Um, my time is expired for this round. I'm gonna turn to Councilmember Pinto. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so Deputy Mayor, we had kind of started a conversation last round about Stay DC. I'm hoping to get both a little bit more clarity as to the dividing line of jurisdiction between DHS and the Deloitte software versus DEMPED's involvement over the program. Um, I continue to hear from both tenants and landlords about administrability challenges around hurdles um, to filling out all of the proper paperwork around hurdles in receiving the funds. Um, and so hope, hopeful to get a better sense of uh, what's gonna happen in the next couple of weeks to speed up some of those processes to ensure that the money can get out the door by September. So, um... Councilmember, uh, one of the things that I know that uh, is happening internally is that we're uh, able to add more people to actually do the application review and processing. Uh, so I think we've added about 22 more people. So in a uh, pre-pandemic rental assistance program, uh, this process usually takes on average about 30 days. Um, and so in this program, we've seen that the on average is about 45 days. So those additional 22 people is to try to attack uh, that turnaround to make sure that our 45 days 
well, it's closer to the 30 days. Uh, in terms of the documentation, uh, really the importance of this is, is twofold. One, uh, we wanna make sure that people qualify uh, for the maximum benefit that they're eligible for. So I know there's been a lot of talk about uh, why can't residents you know, just uh, attest uh, to uh, their qualification. If they do that, it limits the uh, benefit that they receive. So literally uh, having that documentation allows residents to, uh, to receive more benefit uh, that really they're uh, qualified for. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're doing that. The other thing that we've added uh, recently is the ability for residents to get uh, in-person uh, application assistance. So if they call the hotline, uh, the 1-833-4-STAY-DC, they're able to actually uh, get an appointment uh, with some of our community-based organizations. Uh, the other aspect that we'll uh, roll out soon uh, is uh, uh, community engagement that will go door to door, that will be in high traffic areas to make sure residents know about the program. Um, and then the other thing, and this is something that I know that uh, we've heard from uh, other council members as well, is we'd like to get to a point uh, where working with community-based organizations that we just have sort of like office hours uh, in case people want to pop in. The one concern we would have about that is that um, people may not bring all the documentation uh, that they need. Um, and uh, so that's kind of first and foremost. Um, we also um, are looking at, um, uh, or we have actually made live a new uh, housing provider portal, uh, which will allow the housing providers to more easily uh, upload uh, all of their different um, units. Um, so that portal is actually something that we just added uh, we also are making it more clear uh, on the how, on the resident side uh, just what they have to include for the utilities. Uh, we previously had said that they needed to tell us each month what they owed in arrears. Now they could just tell us uh, the total amount. So those small tweaks will make the application more uh, you know efficient uh, for those who are trying to fill it out, uh, but it also will help us kind of move through the applications uh, quicker. We're also surveying our users to know uh, what their experience was so that we get some of that real-time feedback from the people who are actually using uh, the website itself and then making adjustments based on that. Okay, and when are those changes suspect, expected to be implemented by? Yeah, so uh, the new uh, landlord portal um, is actually something that we've already have live uh, now. Um, we're processing and we hope that by really, I would say next week, um, that we'll be able to simplify that utility um, request so that when somebody applies, they can just say what the total amount is that they have due. Um, and that will help us um, uh, really uh, just be able to get through the, allow the resident to get through the application more efficiently. And then of course, the surveying of uh, users of the website, that's actually underway now. Okay, um, and can we just drill down a little bit on your earlier statement around the attestation? And I think you said we we want to make sure people are getting all of that they're qualified to get. Can you elaborate a little bit on what why the attestation language uh, would change what somebody was able to receive? Sure. So it's the federal requirement. So if someone were to attest about their income. Um, or to attest uh, about another component of the application, uh, then we can only um, give them three months of benefit. Uh, if they're able to uh, actually provide documentation, then we can do that up to 12 months past due rent, as well as three months forward rent, and the potential of another additional three months. So really having the documentation is so important. I actually said twofold before and say the second one, so that fo folks get the maximum benefit and two, so that we have everything in order uh, for if the federal government were to kind of audit um, our operations. Okay, thank you so much. And then can you clarify um, the first question around the distinction in roles between DHS and MPED on the administration of state DC? Yeah, so DHS is um, the lead agency in the actual execution uh, of state DC. So they are the ones who 
um, along with the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, which is another partner. They really are um, interacting with the residents and also uh, interacting with how we um, update the website. Uh, what DEMPED and DHCD are doing are making sure that our community-based organizations and stakeholders have visibility into what we're doing and also can give feedback. Uh, we'll also uh, be, uh, like I said, ramping up the uh, engagement to make sure that we have people going door to door, that we have people in high traffic areas. Uh, and that's something that falls on the DHCD uh, DEMPED side of it. So uh, really the execution of the program, DMHHS and uh, DHS, and then the engagement, uh, the outreach, that's all on the DEMPED and uh, DHCD side. I see. Okay. Thank you so much for that clarification. That's very helpful. Um, I am out of time. I will hopefully see you for another round, but if not, thank you for everything you're doing and your partnership. And I'm hopeful we'll all keep recovering uh, successfully. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Pinto. Uh, next is Councilmember Lewis George. Thank you. Um, I want to um, follow up on the uh, questions that I, I was asking about the arts uh, venue grants. Um, I, I, I uh, the, the thirty-eight million dollars, I guess, the thirty million set aside, and then the additional eight million fund. Uh, I heard earlier from earlier today from a union member who works in theater and events industry, and they're asking for two things of this art funding: one, uh, for COVID nine COVID safety measures to remain in place for staff and patrons, such as distancing and masks, et cetera. Um, and that should be required of venues receiving district funds so that we're protecting, I guess, all the people indoor, uh, indoor entertainment venues. And two, that COVID safety protocols be covered reimbursable expenses for the grant funds. Um, they estimate PPE and other safety costs to run about $3 per seat per event. And those should be able to be a part of the fund received. Can you um, speak to those uh, requests? Is that feasible? Mm-hmm. Um, so the, uh, definitely on the second part, um, in terms of, uh, the purchase of PPE, um, or any other sort of, uh, safety measures mm -hmm. that would definitely be an allowable use. It was okay. during the first round of bridge fund. Mm -hmm. So it would be for this one, uh, okay. in terms of the, uh, um, COVID protocols, uh, at this point, uh, starting on June 11, uh, those requirements have, uh, have, you know, been suspended. Um, so I don't know that there's um, uh, going to be language that would require um, uh, grantees to do something that uh, those who are not grantees um, aren't uh, required to do. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and I, I think from a union member standpoint, I think they just wanted to make sure that they would be safe. But um, I think that's what they that that's what they were getting at. Um, but I will follow up with with those answers. Um, I still don't think I, I'm understanding. The just on that comes member, again, just an opportunity to say that, you know, really the way to keep everyone safe at this point is to uh, really get everyone vaccinated. Yeah. Um, so that's really uh, sure. the thing that we'll emphasize. And uh, sure. that might actually be an interesting one for us to figure out, you know, what we ask of grantees in terms of making sure that they're doing outreach about vaccination. For sure. Um, I still don't think I'm, I'm understanding the distinctions between bridge funds and arts and humanities funds and why I think 38 million is in supporting grants are necessary. Um, can you guess go to this again? How did we come to 8 million for arts venues and, and why is this the right amount? Yeah, so this again is because um, these arts venues are going to be the last to open uh, because uh, of the ramp up times it takes for them uh, after uh, we actually suspended the health uh, protocols. Um, and so, um, you know, all the other uh, bridge fund um, uh, industries uh, that were covered in the bridge fund uh, are able to operate uh, at full capacity now. Uh, we have a lot in this budget also to bring back demand uh, for those different industries. Uh, for arts uh, in particular, uh, we see that they take longer to actually get back to operations and get into a revenue generating mode. Uh, so the reason why this uh, fund was set up was to actually, or this uh, investment is being made is to actually make sure uh, that they can sustain until they get back to that revenue generating mode. Okay. Um, 
I, I, I'm, I will go on. Um, um, I, I realized I was not a member of the council last year to vote against the creation of a of another tax revision commission. Um, uh, but I, I do, you know, sort of oppose going down this path when we largely already know the options available to us to generate tax revenue and fill the, you know, the, any longstanding gaps in our budget. The FIS for the tax revision commission estimated a total cost of 800000 for this one year commission. Why is the fiscal year 22 budget proposing a contract of 989,000? Yeah, so this is um, really because we want to make sure that we take into account um, all the changing dynamics that have occurred over the um, course of the, um, the pandemic. Um, and so we actually think that this funding level uh, is actually consistent with what uh, the 2013 uh, commission, because there was a tax revision commission in yep. 2013. Uh, we think that uh, based on, you know, where we are in terms of what that same effort would cost today, uh, that that's where we find alignment. Okay. So what are the type of assumptions you are making for commission members? And, and I guess how many hours are we estimating a commissioner may need to dictate, dedicate to this project? Um, each month, and will any of the commissioners be DC residents currently experience homelessness or housing instability? Um, that's all uh, something we take into consideration in terms of um, we've, we're flexible on kind of the composition of it. We want to make sure that we uh, take all stakeholders into account. Um, and so um, we want to make sure that it does take into account a broad range of perspectives. So we're open to uh, input on that. Okay. So you're, how much are you thinking like commission, I guess members, commission members are making, and then, you know, what is the, I guess the salary a stipend assumption for the commissioner director as well? So there's not uh, necessarily a contemplation that the commissioners themselves would um, uh, be paid. Uh, this would actually, the majority of the money is for uh, contracted support to actually do the research uh, for what the impact would be of different uh, tax changes. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so it's not, most of the money is not actually for the types for commissioners, nor is it for the director. It's going to, um, it's going to, I guess, research researchers who to research that we already kind of have as a, as a city, but. Uh, I would argue that we don't have it. That's why we need the commission. Um, but uh, the staff support would be uh, staff that's already um, on board. Um, and the uh, majority of the funding uh, would be simply to uh, execute the research um, in order to analyze uh, our, uh, our taxes and our tax competitiveness. Okay, um, but there will be like a director at least of, 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 of the commission. There, yes, there would be a director and a research director. Okay, okay, my, my time is up, thank, thank you. I'm gonna turn next to Council Member Henderson for a while. Uh, thank you, Chairperson McDuffie. Um, <clears throat> uh, Deputy Mayor, I wanted to just sort of clarify something on State DC and perhaps I got my question wrong. Um, my understanding is that Currently, the way that our state DC program is set up, landlords can apply, but utilities cannot apply directly. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Is there any contemplation of changing that position to allow utilities to just apply directly for the funding? So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if they would have the... Because um, they know how much people owe. I mean, it's a... They know how much people owe. They don't know though of those people, how much uh, have the income qualification. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, okay. Well, and, and this is, this is although you're onto something here because we also, we've been working with like DOE to, yeah. to understand like for those who've applied for like LIHEAP, how we do some like matching with yeah. files that the utilities would have. So that is something that um, we've explored too, because I see what you're, you're getting at there. The utility companies though, don't necessarily have, um, you know, a visibility into that 
income um, in real time that we would need for them to be able to apply. I see. I understand. Okay. Um, but let's keep noodling on that because I feel like um, if we could figure out that linchpin, that could help solve a lot of issues. Well, not solve a lot of issues, but you know what I'm saying in terms of getting money out the door because Pepco, Washington Gas, DC Water, they know exactly who owes money, how much they owe, and I think could probably uh, systematize how they submit that information to you all to sort of process um, more easily. Um, I wanted I'm to with ask you on that. Yes, okay. I'm with you on that. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask another question. So when we went back, it feels like months ago, but it was only like a couple of weeks ago for uh, the briefing in terms of the budget and the narrative that was put out um, there, you know, the mayor said that we were setting aside money for the purchase of hotels and other venues that could be converted for the use of housing. Where is that in your budget? It actually, um, it sits in DHCD's budget. Uh, okay. And so it's uh, $50 million, uh, 19 million local dollars, uh, 31 million in uh, federal home dollars. Okay. I'm sorry, I have that reverse. 19 million in federal dollar, home dollars, and then 31 million in local. Or actually, I, it could actually be American <laughs> Rescue Plan. What I'm trying to say is, it's a split between home dollars and uh, other dollars to supplement that. Okay, um, then I guess I won't go further on this because I think uh, the um, Director Donaldson, her hearing starts at three. So um, I'll just wait and ask her questions in another committee, but that's all the questions I had. Thank you, Councilmember Duffy. Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. Okay, let me uh, turn back to where I was. And uh, jumping around today, since uh, my colleagues are, are, are tackling a number of the the uh, questions I had planned to ask, um, I, I do want to follow up on, on some of the things that you've already. Uh, well, I'll follow up on this particular uh, program, uh, but try not to rehash things that you've already answered. With respect to the Great Streets uh, grants. Um, I don't know if you've shared this yet, but what's the overall number that is included in the FY22 proposed budget for Great Streets? Are you talking about uh, for the retail program or total? Uh, what? The Historically number for the total, total first and then retail specifically. Yeah, so um, actually let me go into, let me pull that up so I can make sure I'm giving you the right number for uh, Great Streets. Um, for Great Streets is 7.1 million. And so that includes, that, that what comes out of that is the retail, uh, Great Streets Retail Program, Neighborhood Prosperity Fund, uh, also the uh, light manufacturing, which is in essence, the entire DC LEAF program, which is a suite of those uh, programs. Historically, what we've done for um, with those dollars as we've done for retail, it's typically 50 businesses that we award on the retail side. Uh, and so that's usually, that's usually like $2.5 million is what we've been allocating historically. So as we move forward, it will likely be close to that, or we may even, you know, consider increasing that. But right now, um, what we've done in the past has always been about $2.5 million. So roughly about 50 businesses. For the retail portion specifically. Correct. Correct. What's the, I know that over the years, the amount that businesses are eligible for has fluctuated. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's the amount that people are getting this year and what, what do you intend to uh, propose as the amount for, for next year? Right. So the last, uh, I would say maybe five, uh, five or six years now, it's been 50,000. Prior to that, before in my previous life, when I was a director, it was 85. Uh, and so, and I think that was in like 2014 or 2013. Since then, it's been $50,000 um, since, since that time. Uh, and even last year, it was 50,000. Okay. And, and are you all planning to do another round uh, for the retail? Uh, Great Absolutely. This, Absolutely. This, this year? 
Mm -hmm. okay. As you know, we always do it uh, in the fourth quarter of the previous fiscal year. So for fiscal year 22, Gray Street's retail, uh, we typically plan that to, to roll out in um, you know, uh, July or August. And so it usually is in line when once the BSA has been submitted and been approved, and then we, we go ahead and roll out the NOFAN RSA in the previous year. Okay, uh, really quickly while, while we we're on the, 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 uh, the funding for Gray Streets, over, overall mm -hmm. the total is, I think you mentioned 7.1, 2.5 for retail. What, what is the amount for Neighborhood Prosperity and, and LEAF? Historically for uh, MPS, it's been 3 million. Last year, uh, it was 3.1. Uh, million for neighborhood prosperity fund, and then for light manufacturing, it was one million. Okay. And okay, that, the light manufacturing is the DC Leaf. That's part of DC Leaf, correct? That was three and one, if you recall. So yep. it was DC Leaf. Uh, I'm sorry, light manufacturing, um, neighborhood prosperity fund, and then it also included North DC. Okay. Um, let me ask about, I want to sort of follow up. I had a, a question that I don't need to ask because you, you answered a part of it about the uh, equity impact fund mm -hmm. that was established uh, by the council in last year's budget. Uh, it was good to hear that you all uh, had put out the, the RFA on this and, and I believe you may have testified that that is already closed. Yeah. Um, I, I'd gotten, uh, I thought, some feedback that there were some concerns uh, from potential applicants about the structure of the RFA. Um, did, did you get responses to it? And, and, and had you heard any concerns about the structure of the RFA? Uh, RFA? We, did get, uh, we did get some submissions. I think the biggest concern that we have heard uh, is around the equity uh, enterprise, the equity impact enterprise designation, okay. because we literally took uh, took line by line from the BSA and structured the RSA. So we didn't uh, deter from that at all. Okay. But the, the challenge that we are now hearing is, you know, not necessarily from the fund manager, but in, um, in identifying uh, equity uh, impact enterprises uh, we're saying the BSA outlined that you had to be one and not necessarily an equity impact uh, enterprise eligible. And so that's going to be the term because it is such uh, a new designation uh, that we yeah. may not have a lot of businesses that qualify that that are already an equity impact enterprise. Uh, and so that was one challenge that we had heard. Um, but we literally just took directly from the BSA and that just went right into the RSA. But that is one concern okay. that we have internally for the fund manager is, you know, um, the number of businesses that we're seeking to serve may be low simply because they're not enough. Okay. Because right. it's such a new designation, we may not have as many. Um, let me, let me yeah. ask, um, has it closed and have you already awarded it or is it still something that's open? It's under review. It just closed on the 7th, June 7th. Right. So right it's, now it's under review. That's a that's a, a really important concern. I'm glad to hear you raise it, and, and I would love to be able to have the committee work with you. Okay. See if anything needs to be tweaked uh, mm -hmm. with that, uh, depending on the, the level of interest that you all receive. Uh, sure. If you've got little interest, then I, I would I would love to try to do something before you awarded it, just because I don't know. I, I feel like if if there are concerns potentially we could make adjustments and have greater interest rather than uh, you know, issue something uh, where perhaps the language that we included was not mm -hmm. sufficient to generate the type of interest that, that could be out there. In, in Absolutely. The I'd be excited to have that conversation. I think that will definitely yield more businesses that will work with the fund manager that we identify once we forget about who that, who that manager will be. Um, we may see a significant uptick in the businesses that would um, apply and, you know, that we can assist 
Um, and we've also been doing some additional engagement with other stakeholders uh, around how we can stack, create some stackable opportunities and experiences specific to the businesses that would be a part of this uh, particular program uh, and working with the fund managers. So we've been talking about how can we uh, also support them beyond what's here. Uh, and if this is passed and approved the additional 2 million that goes into this, you know, what other supports and services can we provide? So that also leans into what's happening with the technical assistance hub. You know, as you know, we have a lot of mainstream financial institutions and CDFIs that are getting lots of infusions of cash. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, trying to make sure that we complement what's also happening outside of this space. In addition to what the, the district is proposing, the administration is proposing, what we what is also the landscape of, of cash that's coming from our mainstream financial institutions that are being deployed and given to our CDFIs as well. And so how we can continue to complement the space specifically to this fund and all of the other funds that we've talked about, even the small, medium business growth fund as well. Yeah, let's do that sooner rather than later. Okay, um, sure. I actually, um, my, my time's expired. Uh, these rounds are going really fast. Okay. And maybe it's just that we have, this, we have a lot of interest uh, in, in DEMPED uh, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, let me check with my colleagues to see I don't see anybody's videos on right now, but I know we have Councilmember Pinto and, and Louis George are, are still with us. Jump in. I'm going to keep asking questions unless I see uh, either of you jump in. Uh, okay, I see Councilmember Louis George is here, so I'm going to turn to you for a round. Thank you. Um, and, and I have to hop off in like 10 seconds. So um, my uh, last questions uh, really were um, just around. Um, some of the um, the small business, uh, but I think you I think you answer most of these, so I won't go to um, go. I think Councilman Duffy covered most of these um, because I have to hop. I'm feeling like all the pressure. So what I'll do is just say the disparity study is really important. I really need you to get this right this time. The contracting for Black businesses in this in this city for a long time has been a sore spot for, for the Black business community, how per, um, contract procurement has gone. So I really ask um, for a, a full, robust uh, disparity study and contract to be happen. Um, and, and I uh, look forward to partnering with you on that. And thanks again for everything that you do. I'm going to hop off. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Council Member. And as you, you. as you hop off, I would just say that that definitely is something uh, that is very important. We also have in place the equity RFP. Uh, okay. to make sure that our real estate solicitations uh, follow the model that I think will uh, hopefully yield after we see uh, the disparity study as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chairman McDuffie. I appreciate you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis George, and thank you for your interest uh, in those issues. Those are, are some of the things that you're touching on, our, our, our priorities of the committee and, and things that we uh, uh, supported in last year's budget through the council. And so I know we've had conversations about the disparity study, the equity impact fund, and, and some of the other initiatives. And I'm glad to hear uh, Deputy Mayor Farchikio almost made you a council member. You hear that, John? I almost made you a, a council member there. <laughs> um, uh, Deputy Mayor Farchikio uh, just referenced the uh, equity RFP uh, uh, initiative that, that also uh, was a priority of, of this committee. Talk a little bit more about that. How's it going generally? Uh, Deputy Mayor Franchicchio, uh, I know there have been some uh, awards already made under the uh, equity RFP framework uh, that you just referenced that, that, that uh, we talked about last year. Uh, and I think there's some existing RFPs that are, that are still open. So I could uh, get us started and uh, Sroch is heading up to the um, computer as well. Uh, but the equity RFP uh, was something that Mayor Bowser uh, issued uh, as sort of a directive to DEMPED uh, to make sure that we were uh, looking first um, at um, disadvantaged uh, uh, individuals um, so that they actually are the leaders on teams. Uh, previously, uh, they were part of teams, uh, but what we uh, are doing with the equity RFP is putting uh, you know, kind of turning that on its head, not just to be part of teams, but to actually lead the team. Um, and so we have had uh, one solicitation that we've already actually executed on uh, and made an award. Uh, and then we have several uh, that are um, uh, currently out. Uh, so I'll ask Sarosh to jump in and kind of walk through uh, the specifics on each of those. Yeah, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so as, uh, as the deputy mayor mentioned, 
We uh, issued uh, four equity RFPs last year, um, Langston Slater, uh, Malcolm X, um, Reeves, and um, I sure don't call the fourth, but we, and we did award, uh, as Deb Jimmer mentioned, Langston Slater. And Malcolm, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the fourth one was Hilly. Um, and uh, we did award Langston Slater and uh, Malcolm X, and we had really resounding responses. We had nine teams go after Langston Slater. We had uh, four teams go after Malcolm X. We've gotten uh, on both projects a uh, primarily minority teams, 100% um, minority teams, uh, actually 100% African-American teams on Malcolm X. And on Langston Slater, the lead is African-American. Uh, they did include a large uh, national nonprofit known as Volunteers of America that does affordable housing. So that was acceptable. Um, and then on the Hill East project, we actually, we went out to the industry. We talked to the African-American Real Estate Professionals Association, some other folks. Um, and they actually said that in addition to 100% minority teams, they also liked what's known as the component model which uh, means that um, you know the African American teams can can take a leadership role, but they fit within a larger construct. So that some of the costs that um, you know you have to do, particularly the pre-development costs, they can they can uh, benefit from the economy of scale. And so at Hill East, because it's a parcel project, we actually looked at the component model, and that's what we requested. Um, and so that's actually what we received back. So we're, we've received five responses to that, um, two for the first parcel, three for the second parcel. So that, that went really well. We were pretty excited about that. And then actually on Reeves, we received two responses. Um, but again, just a lot of interest and uh, Hill East and Reeves are still in the selection phase right now. And we, we hope to award those shortly. But overall, um, you know, a really strong response from the industry on the equity RFP. And, you know, we look forward to issuing um, additional ones. Uh, we, we did announce uh, additional RFPs in March, but we haven't issued them yet. Okay. Yeah, and when I, I appreciate the, the update, when I, when I originally called a meeting with uh, a number of black developers in the District of Columbia to discuss uh, this initiative, uh, it, I was prompted to do so because of some of the things I had heard uh, as chair of this committee about um, the way that some of the deals had developed in the, the equity, the law requiring the 20% uh, equity. And so uh, there were some concerns not expressed at that meeting by, by uh, minority developers, but concerns broadly uh, in the industry that um, you know, black developers, you know, brown, black and brown developers, women owned firms did not have the capacity to kind of undertake these deals. And it sounds like uh, on certain deals of certain sizes, that's not the case. And, and, and you all have been able to figure out this component method that has, has brought together minority developers and perhaps majority developers where minority developers are the lead. So, so that's good news. Uh, so I'm encouraged by, by what you share and how things are going. When do you all expect to share and provide uh, uh, any of the uh, surplus and disposition resolutions to the council? So uh, for, the, uh, <clears throat> for the two that we've awarded, we would ideally uh, present them in the fall. Um, and uh, we do have one with council right now, two Patterson uh, with your committee right now. And we have been working with your team to uh, schedule a hearing in September. And then the other two we would expect to bring in the fall. And then uh, the remaining two that I mentioned, Reeves and Hill East, uh, probably next spring. Okay, thank you for that. Skip that, it's already been asked and answered. Also, oh, let's get this. It's been asked already. Um, let, me, let me talk about one of the things you have uh, proposed, BSA. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Capital Crossing pilot subtitle would extend uh, the current pilot payment in lieu of taxes by 11 years 
to the tax year 2037. Is that correct? And it will allow up to $100 million in, in, um, uh, in the pilot? Yes, that is correct. It would provide up to uh, 10 years uh, ending in, on that year. And if it starts later, then they would get less than 10 years. The, that end date is set. So talk about why, and, and, and the, the developers have had some in, uh, communication with, with my office and the committee specifically. Um, why do y'all believe it, it's needed? And, and is this something that the district perhaps could, could wait until next year to extend the pilot? Does it have to happen now? Well, in terms of why it's needed, uh, it's primarily because uh, overall, this deal is quite an old deal. It was initially uh, contemplated in the two, early 2000s and then effectuated in, uh, I believe, around two, 2011 or 2013. Um, and after that, uh, the way the contract was written, they had to complete the deck uh, regardless of any issues, cost overruns, things like that. And what ended up happening is there were, there were a variety of uh, requirements that really were outside of their control, including uh, uh, you know, district requirements, DDOT requirements, but also federal requirements related to uh, bomb proofing and hardening of the structure related to what happened in September 11th. And so they actually implemented all of those various um, uh, improvements and, um, you know, really uh, their, their cost structure ballooned well out of control. Um, and then they, they ended up uh, completing um, three of the, or they ended up completing three of the office buildings but they they don't have a tight milestone schedule for the completing of the for to complete I apologize the remaining buildings and so what we basically did with this is we talked to them about how could we ensure that the project would be completed in a timely manner and this uh, extension allows us to do that because we set milestones in the new pilot agreement and basically uh, the new pilot will not start the extension of the pilot will not start until the residential on the site is completed. And that previously they had talked about actually not even doing the residential. Um, and so this allows us to sort of catalyze getting that residential done. That's very important to us. Um, and then it will also um, ensure that the other two projects also complete on a, on a milestone schedule because uh, if they don't meet <clears throat> the milestones that we've laid out, the pilot, they'll be in default and the pilot terminates immediately. So that we've, we've written it in a very deliberate way so that we, we are ensured uh, that we can get the project completed and that they're very motivated to hit these milestones that we've included. And the first one, the primary one that we were focused on was the residential. Um, we also included other elements. We, we asked them to sign on to the uh, CNHED um, D, CCAP, Sabangle, DCAP, DCAP. Um, and uh, the memo. And so they worked with Stephen Guade and they did that. Um, and then we also have requirements for them to provide uh, subsidized rents for uh, retail uh, tenants, disadvantaged business enterprise retail tenants um, in the location. So we, 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 took, we took an old structure and we adapted it to these new initiatives that we're focused on right now. But we did feel like overall, after we finished our underwriting, it was a valid request. Okay, just just to, uh, maybe uh, to clarify though, the the pilot wouldn't go into effect until which fiscal year? Twenty. Uh, the pilot twenty uh, seven, I believe. Uh, they they have to complete the residential by twenty seven, and then that would trigger the pilot. So uh, probably fiscal year twenty eight. Okay, I, I was under a different impression that it was uh, it was FY twenty three. Um, no, but I will confirm with you. Uh, okay, I will confirm that but, with you. But but it would you all need council action this year though? Yes, that's our request. Why is that? Just just again for clarity, what you need council action this year for something that that is down the road. Well, I mean primarily because. What, what triggers the pilot extension is them completing the residential building. So we need them to get started and get to work on that. Um, and they're not, gonna, they're not gonna do that unless they have certainty that this is you know, going to occur. And it's, it's 2021 and so it does seem like a long way away, but in terms of planning and doing these kinds of projects, you know, we, we believe that it'll, 
bring us into better alignment with them if they know that this is going to occur. Yeah, no, I wanted to get it on the record. I think I think it's important for people to understand, you know, both the members of the committee and, and others in the public, um, why uh, there will be a request for this subtitle, uh, which doesn't really take effect until down the road. But 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 how this factors into what the developers are 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 doing at that site and what the city would like to see happen sooner rather than later. And so just a sequence of events I thought was important to to, to ask a question about. Correct. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, oh, oh. I almost had a technical difficulty. Um, Let me go back up to uh, add some questions earlier, but I want to talk about some of the uh, capital projects in your capital budget. So the uh, FY22 capital budget is $146.7 million, which is uh, pretty significant increase over the uh, this year's uh, budget of 76.5. And I know uh, that a lot of folks are excited about some of the things that are in there. And the first thing I wanna to touch on uh, is uh, the future of Cromwell School, uh, because I think there's been a shift from some of the nervous anxiety to uh, a level of hopeful enthusiasm as a result of uh, the $20 million being included in the mayor's proposed budget. And, and for those who may not be as up to date, uh, can you share a little bit more, Deputy Mayor, about the future of this site and, and whether there are any funds identified in the mayor's budget uh, specifically for an Ivy City small area plan. I know there's some funds generally for our small area plans, but is Ivy City contemplated in that? So uh, that would actually be in the Office of Planning budget. And what we have is um, um, a New York Avenue uh, visioning exercise, uh, which incorporate um, all of New York Avenue uh, from Florida Avenue um, out to the district line. Um, and so that's how we contemplate um, uh, doing the planning uh, for uh, the neighborhoods along the New York Avenue corridor. Um, and so Director Trueblood, um, when we talked to him about, um, you know, going that route or um, small area plan and kind of the trade-offs on that, um, he really thought that uh, really New York Avenue is sort of the uh, backbone uh, of those uh, neighborhoods or the connective tissue of those uh, neighborhoods, whichever analogy uh, you'd like to use. And so that uh, New York Avenue visioning uh, is what um, the approach that we've decided to take uh, in this proposal. Okay. touched on some of these other projects, but let me, let me ask about, I talked about Reeves and already, Hillis, we, we talked a little bit about that earlier as one of the uh, equity RFPs that you all issue. Um, there is approximately $11 million in capital funding uh, proposed for FY22, 18.4 million proposed for FY23, 
Uh, talk about some of the activities that, that this is funding is going to support. And Certainly. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the primary activities that this is going to support is the infrastructure uh, related to the site. Um, the site currently is um, is, has not been parcelized, so there's not any road infrastructure because it's a former hospital site. So all of the wet and dry utilities, all of the road work needs to be done. Um, there's also a very large uh, brick sewer tunnel that runs under the site. It's an old sewer tunnel. And so there's a contemplation that that might need to be moved as well um, in order for the buildings to be built on top of it. It, it, it can't, you can't carry a load basically. So this money is intended to uh, fund uh, as much infrastructure as possible uh, so that we can maximize the amount of affordable housing um, that we can get out of land value. And that's we, we can ensure that the deals are also, again, going back to the concept of equity, uh, the equity RP, we wanna make sure that the deals still have entrepreneurial value to the teams that are going after them. So um, primarily infrastructure, and again, uh, primarily to ensure that the land value can be spent on um, affordable housing. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, I noticed on that same project though, there's a, Dimpit recently issued a, a BAFO um, for respondents that identified, uh, I think it was like a third, a third and a third in terms of housing affordability mix. Um, talk a little bit about that, which, what the office's, uh, the mayor's vision is for, for redevelopment of that site. Certainly. Um, so basically, the the concept is uh, it's a, it's a larger concept. Part of the concept has to do with the the legacy of Robert F. Kennedy. That this is a site uh, closely related to him. Obviously related to the the his his campus just north of the site. And we really wanted to push the envelope in terms of how much we could get in terms of affordable housing. It's the it's a relatively valuable site. It's one of the last large district campus sites. It's on the water. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of energy around the site. And so we really wanted to push the teams to think about how they could, um, uh, you know, how, how they could support the mayor's vision for the 36,000 goal by 2025, which includes 12,000 of affordable, 12,000 of middle income and 12,000 of market. And so we were looking for a similar structure, which is a third uh, deeply affordable, a third middle income and a third market rate for this site. So it was a, just an alignment of, of a variety of initiatives that we've been talking about. Okay. Let me uh, sort of uh, go back to talk a little bit about some of the uh, new communities projects that um, that haven't been covered as much. I know uh, Councilmember Nado I think covered pretty extensively Park, Park Morton in her questions to the Deputy Mayor. Uh, and I know it also came up, Barry Farm was touched on earlier, uh, but talk about the status of uh, Lincoln Heights Richardson dwellings. And, and uh, I think it was referenced earlier in Northwest One, but I'd love to hear more about where, where things are with Northwest One as well. Yeah, and um, Soros, if you wanna, jump in here. I think the, the uh, approach on this too was to make sure um, for those sites, the new community sites where we could really advance um, new housing, uh, that we made investments in those sites. Uh, so I'll have Sarosh if you could walk through them. Um, but really, Northwest One is one where we have uh, the property now is, is, um, is really just sitting idle. Uh, and so this investment will allow us to uh, start, actually, it's not totally sitting idle because phase one has started uh, for onsite. And then uh, the phase two, uh, we'll be able to start with this investment. Um, and then at Barry Farm, you know how much you've heard it uh, from residents, you've heard it from stakeholders uh, that we need to get that project uh, moving faster. Uh, and so this uh, investment in this budget allows us to advance uh, that construction. But maybe, uh, Sarosh, if you want to start with, um, Lincoln Heights, Richardson Dwelling, and then come back to the other two. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So yeah, for Lincoln Heights, Richardson Dwellings, uh, we have primarily been focused on developing the offsite, the build first uh, housing that would be, uh, that would allow uh, tenants to uh, move into this housing within the neighborhood 
that Lincoln Heights and Richardson Dwellings is in, and um, that would allow us to then start that development uh, cycle. So we, uh, we've completed a number of properties, including uh, most recently the uh, 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 5201 uh, Hayes, which was called the Residence of Hayes. That was 150 units. That was 50 replacement units, 50 build first units, 100 uh, additional affordable units. We have two more that are finishing this year. Uh, Providence Place, which is um, 93 units. That's going to be 35 build first units and 50 ad additional affordable units. And then, of course, the Strand Residences, which is abuts uh, the Strand Theater, which is going to be 86 total units, units, 28 replacement units, and 58 additional affordable units. So those allow us to start the process, we have to have the build first in order to start the first phases of the new communities projects. Um, and uh, after, um, after these have been completed, after they've started to tenant up, we'll start to look at uh, the actual on-site uh, properties to figure out what, what, what kind of phasing is necessary to do those with minimal displacement. Uh, that's the overall goal. Um, as the deputy mayor mentioned, uh, with Northwest One, we're, we're moving expeditiously on the first phase. Um, that is going to include approximately 250 overall units. That's going to include 65 replacement units. Um, and then the remainder are going to be middle income uh, affordable units as well as market units. The second phase, uh, which was, is what's funded in the budget, um, we are pushing them to uh, to do that by right so that we could actually get it uh, a lot faster than we would have to do it if we went through a PUD process. And that's going to be 20, 223 uh, units. That's, um, uh, I don't have the breakdown, I apologize, but a, a, approximately 70 of those units will be uh, build first units. I'm sorry, not build first, but replacement units. And then the third phase will be 170 units overall. So that's going to bring the total number to over 700 new units of housing. And ideally, we bring that to market as soon as possible to get residents back into the units as well as uh, provide the additional uh, housing that the new communities uh, program provides. Um, and then finally, on uh, uh, what well, we discussed Barry Farm mm -hmm. earlier and Barry Farm, the uh, what we're working on right now is the infrastructure, the horizontal infrastructure. And then uh, we still do need a zoning decision. And with the zoning decision, we'll be able to start on the first vertical phase, which is uh, called uh, phase 1B. And that's going to be 108 units, all affordable um, senior apartments. And 77 of those units are going to be replacement units. OK. Um, what about a couple other projects that are not new communities, but um, um, the, the, the Northeast Heights uh, project, what's the status of that? I know you all, uh, the TIF there. Yeah, correct. So the Northeast Heights project, uh, the status of that is that we are completing the term sheet with the developer, and then we're preparing the legislation uh, that we would need to bring to council to um, effectuate the TIF. And uh, about updates on MLK Gateway. Um, anything? Yes. And there, I know there was a, I think a recent award in one of your the uh, Great Streets initiatives uh, that included that project as well. How are things going on that project? So that project is going really well, actually. So MLK Gateway is two phases. Uh, the first phase is where Enlightened is going to be um, across the street from DHCV's building. And uh, that's going really well. That should complete by the end of this year. Um, and then we can get Enlightened moved in. Uh, that's going to be 150 people. That's obviously the, uh, the technology firm that's going to be moving from uh, downtown. So we're very excited about that. They've done a great job of tenanting uh, the retail spaces. And then the award you mentioned is actually going to be on the second phase, um, and that's um, that's going to be the new home for DHCD. Um, and I, you know, they're they're getting started on that this year, um, and uh, that one I, I, you know, no impediments, no impediments, and I think it's going well. Okay. All right.
So let me shift a little bit, talk about uh, affordable housing, Deputy Mayor. We've uh, touched on it uh, throughout the course of this hearing, I think, in various ways, and you obviously testified to it in your opening. Um, where are we with with with, uh, with meeting the goal of producing 12,000 affordable housing units by 2025? This is the latest uh, that we have. So the overall goal of 36,000 units by 2025, uh, we've actually produced 16,271. Uh, um, and for the goal, uh, the sub goal of uh, affordable housing, so that's 12,000 units by 2025, uh, we've currently produced uh, 2,558. Uh, and those are uh, our numbers as of April. Okay. Uh, and uh, what's the status of the uh, proposed changes to inclusionary zoning uh, on PDR designated land? Um, um, this is, um, I'm trying to think of this as um, within the um, IZ plus. Let me come back to you on that one. Okay. Okay. And whoever might be uh, assisting with this one, Deputy Mayor, this is the, uh, it does involve the IZ plus. This FYI, but we can uh, come back when you have an answer. Okay. And just bear with me because I'm 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 trying to. I had uh, about fifty questions for you, but a number of them were were already asked and answered based on my colleagues' questions. So, make sure I have exhausted my questions. You know what, I think you're gonna come back to me on, I asked an earlier question about the $5.3 million in local funds. I don't know if you got any additional clarity around that. This is the one where it was uh, uh, in the... Yes, okay. uh, Curtis is gonna join us just okay. to walk through that. Chairman, so you're asking about the 5.3 million? Yes. That was listed in the mayor's increase, correct? Yes. Okay, so what that is, is, you know, if you, if you look at the table five, if you just turn to the table five, what you see is, um, you know, the, we, what we do is we take out the one-time um, pieces that are in the FY22, in the FY21 budget, and then there are some one-time items that were added back. Can you hand me my laptop? And I can tell you which items were added back that make up that 5.3. Okay, can you tell me? Yes, certainly. If you just bear with me. Okay. Okay, so it's, uh, okay, so the 5.3 was made up of the 598, which was um, meant for COSM, um, creative and open spaces, 
that was a, a one time in FY21, uh, 1.4 million for the Washington Economic Partnership. There was uh, $685,000 that was added back for Davis Bacon and related activities. Uh, and then uh, the new communities social contracts or social services contracts are 2.9. Okay, and that, so that, that uh, I wasn't doing the math, but that adds up to that 5.3? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have additional clarity on the prior question that I had asked Deputy Mayor about the um, IZ Plus. The I, um, could you repeat the question? I don't know, that one's, that one's for me. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, can I, can I pause you real quick? Yeah. yeah I actually wanna, cause I, I, I had another question that I think I asked part of it earlier, but I wanted a little bit more clarity um, to, to get it. So let me, let me ask this on, on the next page of the agency's budget. On table six notes that the office has $900,000 in dedicated tax revenue. Yeah. What, what's that, uh, the tax and, and where's the revenue? Derived. So Curtis can, can actually, this is the Walter it. Reed. This is the Walter Reed one. Okay, okay. Right, so this is the Walter Reed redevelopment fund. And what happens is, is that the developer pays the possessory interest tax on the, on the, on the ground, right? Um, and then the arrangement is that then those, those funds are kind of dedicated to be reused on the campus, right? And so that's why the classification was meant to be more appropriately as a dedicated tax as opposed to uh, just special purpose revenue. Okay. Did you want to go back to the IZ one? Completely? Yeah, I think I think uh, we can we can wrap it up there. If you could share some insights. So, uh, can you can you uh, reiterate the question? Sure, give me a second. Let me figure out where sure. it was because I'm kind of down here. So um, it has to do with the comp plan. Well, actually, let me just so the, the status of the proposed changes to inclusionary zoning uh, on PDR on uh, designated land. So that would fall under um, IZ plus. Okay. Um, part of my kind of hesitation earlier was that the, just to be clear though, the PDR, if it's only um, PDR on the future land use map, it can't convert to residential. It'd have to be striped or in a special zone um, like, um, like we saw at Union Market. So, um, so straight PDR wouldn't be able to be converted to residential. Um, if it were striped, then it would fall under the requirements uh, of IZ plus. Okay. And so that PDR to residential um, would, um, would trigger a 20% uh, IZ requirement under IZ plus. Okay, we'll trigger a 20%? Correct. Uh, okay. But again, just to be clear, if it's not striped, if it's just straight PDR, it wouldn't be able to be converted to residential. Got it. We had, because this is where, um, go back to Ivy City, where that one particular area where we wanted to put in the stripe, mm -hmm. that was so that it could be converted from PDR to residential. Okay, so so if if there are if there is uh, a site that is zoned PDR under IZ plus, it would it would trigger the twenty percent requirements. Of what you're saying? No. So if it's solely PDR, it wouldn't 
be able to be converted to residential. Gotcha. Okay. It right. would have to have a, a stripe. at least a stripe. Okay. So what is, what's the status of, of, uh, of this, the, the approval process for that? IZ plus. Um, IZ plus was uh, approved. I'm trying to think when I think at the, sorry, it kind of runs together either at the end of 2020, I think maybe, but IZ plus was uh, approved. Okay. All right. I think I have exhausted the questions that I have. Uh, and you already answered the questions about State DC. Um, you know, I did want to follow up, and I don't know if I need to do it here, but um, Councilmember Henderson had a lot of questions about um, uh, State DC and the utility portion. And I think uh, she, she, she circled back on a subsequent round after the initial question to say that um, uh, the understanding is that in Maryland, uh, utilities uh, may be permitted to actually apply directly. And I think you mentioned in response uh, that they, they wouldn't have, they being the utilities wouldn't have uh, real times so insights into income qualifications. I wanted to just get you to flesh that out a little bit to make sure I understood what, what you were what you were saying might be an issue there. Sorry, um, I do want to check out the Maryland approach on okay. it because. Um, uh, so what our issue was was we, um, like I mentioned, we were working with like DOE uh, that administers the LAHI program to see how we could just. Um, right. kind of advance payments and move people through. Um, and we weren't able to find that out. So that's why I'm kind of interested ah, to see okay. uh, or figure that out. Um, that's why I'm interested to see what the Maryland approach was to see if we might be able to utilize that approach. The other thing that has happened is, um, you know, since we launched the program, there have been, I think, at least two federal guidances uh, that have updated what um, is allowable. And so we could check to see if there's something okay. there. Right. Well, let's, I mean, uh, for, for us, if we can wipe clear those um, past due bills, that would be the easiest thing for all of us. Um, but at the time that we set up the program, that wasn't a viable option. But I do want to take a look and see uh, what Maryland. Um, okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, make sure we, we, uh, we follow up in, in, uh, on that particular issue. All right. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I, I don't have anything else uh, right now. I know there's some follow-up that, that you all will do with the committee. And, and if we have any additional questions, we'll be sure to follow up. Is there anything else you would like to add uh, to the record before we close out? Um, the only other thing, I think we went through um, a lot of the different uh, programs. One thing I would say is um, that we do have that $5 million fund uh, in FY21 uh, in order to work with events DC and destination DC kind of touched on it in some of the answers. Um, really our focus is on bring back demand. Um, and so what we want to do is use that, uh, have some flexibility and hope the committee will see it this way too. have the flexibility to have that in dem pits so that we can work with both destination DC. If we wanted to do a marketing effort to continue the $3 million that events DC put forth this year, um, to continue that into 22, uh, or if we wanted to do uh, show attraction or uh, supporting like uh, some new special events with partners like events DC and destination DC, whatever we think it'll take to kind of ramp up uh, more demand, uh, because really that's what's going to be most important uh, to help these businesses. Well, uh, yeah, no, get I, through. I think that that is obviously a laudable goal and, and something that I think most people would share as a, as a priority. I guess my question back to you would be, is $5 million enough? And should a portion be specifically allocated for marketing through Destination DC? Um, but also, right, maybe it's $5 million to still do what you're talking about. I mean, is, is $5 million enough to do these things? Because I think bringing back demand is an immediate priority that I think the city needs, right? I think, again, that might be a shared goal across uh, the board with the, the executive and the council, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I think most people would say they want to bring back demand because bringing back demand brings back revenue uh, and helps to uh, our local economy recover. Yeah. 
Well, as an example, when um, the uh, All-Star game, Major League All-Star game, mm -hmm. uh, moved out of Atlanta this year, um, if we had this funding available, we would have been able to make a run at that. Of course, the health conditions didn't allow it, and that was uh, a little bit more complicated. But I think sort of uh, that sense of sort of buying events is something we should have the flexibility on. Uh, is it enough? Well, you know, it, you could argue that for the housing reduction trust fund. You could argue it for the food access fund. Is it enough, right? But I think that what it does is signal a commitment uh, that we're going to make sure that we emphasize marketing, that we're going to emphasize show attraction, and even buy events if we need to. Um, and I use that example of the All Star Game to say it took city funding to bring the All Star Game here last time, uh, and to bring events like that back. We can make that commitment with this money um, and help us uh, to bring back that demand. Well, you know, I, I would love to. This is another thing I think we need to follow up on specifically because you know um, I don't know if if the, if the amount is 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 what was testified to by by Mr. Ferguson earlier uh, when he said yeah you know, he gave an example of New York uh, dedicating thirty million for marketing specifically. Yep. Um, and, and, and at that point, um, I had already asked Mr. Odell and I was with Mr. Ferguson and, and I still wasn't clear about how much of the 5 million was, was going to be going specifically to Destination DC for marketing. It sounds like it still isn't etched in stone as far as you're concerned yeah. with the $5 million. And so I, I love to get to a point where we know specifically how much is used for what so that yeah, because he said 20 million, right, for marketing. And this is based on some other previous study, which was pre-pandemic. But as, as I look at, and I don't watch TV often, but when I do, uh, I see these commercials for Baltimore Inner Harbor. I see commercials for Philadelphia. I see commercials for other places. And he talked about how much a budget for television would just get, you know, it, it would be very expensive. And I don't think that they even have near the resources to do something like that. And then five million to me still wasn't enough to do some of the things that he was talking about. And to know that five million is a portion of only of the five million would be used for marketing, not the entire, concerns me. Uh, but maybe those concerns could be allayed if you flesh out for me uh, in a follow up how you're thinking about using the five million and what portion of it would be dedicated specifically for marketing. Yeah, and I think. Um, um carrying through sort of the 3 million that's dedicated this year yeah. uh, that events DC pulled out of their reserves uh, for the marketing effort. I mean, that kind of seems reasonable to make sure that carries and then having some more flexibility on the additional, um, I think would kind of be a good approach. Um, that's kind of my, you know, off the cuff. Uh, well, response to that. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I, you know, and I think just, again, as we continue the budget process, you know, just I want to follow up with you and just yeah, just, uh, well, getting any clarity around some things. If anything is changing with how Events DC is thinking about stuff and destination, and you all with some of the resources that you already deployed, and, and you're hearing feedback from yep. the uh, the well, industries. And I'd like to end on a high note, but this is a little bit heart wrenching. Uh, Madison Square Garden has their opener. All right, they're like DC or excuse me, New York City is open, mm -hmm. uh, and the acts that they booked, and I don't know who paid for this, right, but if we wanted to have shows of this caliber, I mean, the acts that they booked to reopen Madison Square Garden are Dave Chappelle and the Food Fighters, like uh -huh. DC and Maryland opening yeah. up in New York. Like we should be working with Events DC and a Destination DC to figure out like, what's the DC version of that? What's the, and yeah. literally they have the DC version of it. It's just happening in New York. So that's why I would say, let's get like a little bit of flexibility just so if we want to do something audacious like that, yeah, no, no. I, and so I'm not trying to discourage the flexibility. I'm, I'm with yeah. you on that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm seeing it as not an either or, but a, but a both and, right? So maybe it's the 5 million and you have the flexibility to do some of the things you're talking about. I'd love to, right. you know, uh, for Dave Chappelle to be open up the Foo Fighters be, to, to be you know, one of our, either our stadium, uh, Audi, right. Capital One, uh, Nats or something, right? Black Lives open. Matter Plaza. Even. The, 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 even there, right? Uh, uh, but I also want to make sure that we can do the other thing too on the marketing yeah, side. So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And I think even for Elliot, because he needs the flexibility, like if some of these international markets open, we want to like rush in there first. Sure. And that may, you know, that sure. may change by October for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, well thank you. Uh, any Anything else you want to add before we close out? 
Um, no, I think that um, we covered everything. We're going to get some stuff back to you. I know that we also um, have a couple updates coming in the errata letter. Okay. Um, so be clear on that uh, for uh, Park Morton, uh, for the um, LGBT Center, um, and some others. I think uh, you'll see some items in the errata letter. So I'll make sure we follow up just so that we give the committee a heads up because uh, I think that a lot a lot of letters should be moving this week, but I want to make sure you guys know what's uh, what we see as uh, part of that before it's submitted. Sounds good. Uh, thanks to you and your team for your testimony here uh, this afternoon. Also, thanks to uh, the witnesses uh, who testified, both uh, Greg Odell and Elliot Ferguson for uh, Events DC and Destination DC, respectively. Uh, this marks the end of today's budget oversight hearing and the uh, end of the committee's hearings on the proposed FY22 budget. Uh, the committee will reconvene next Thursday, July 1st, 2021 at 11.30 a.m. to mark up uh, uh, and vote on uh, its portion of the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. The time is now 3.10 p.m. and this hearing is adjourned. Thanks to staff and Office of Cable Television and everyone else who supported this hearing and support the committee throughout this hearing process. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Chairman.